Thank you very much, Analyst Desk, and thank you, Sasha, for this awesome ironing bead logo. I'm Trevor Quickshot Henry, joined by the Prince of Wales himself, <laughs> James Stress and Leary, oh, no. as the teams are getting ready for picks and bands. Let's start with the lineups. It is the Copenhagen Wolves on the blue side. Lenny Shook, Soren Freeze, and Je suis Kass, as well as their coach Dentist. They are playing to avoid automatic relegation. Copenhagen Wolves need a 2-0 and a little more help for that to happen. They do. They also need a strong performance here, but the team looking to lock them into the automatic relegation spot today is Rocket with Steve in the top lane, the birthday boy Yankos in the jungle, Nuke Duck in the mid lane with Mr. Rales, Vanda in the bottom lane, and as always, Yamato Cannon will be joining them on stage as their coach. So let's start by talking about Copenhagen Wolves because they pulled what I consider the biggest upset of the summer split. They took down H2K last week. They're in this do or die situation where if they lose one more game, they are 10th, they will be automatically relegated. But yesterday, they just showed up as a team and individually, and especially Je Suis Kaz. Yeah, in the last game of last week, uh, Kaz really put the pressure on in the mid lane against Ryu. A couple of ganks went to the mid lane, Ryu was put under the pressure, and ultimately Kaz ended up 0-2 in 18. Great week for him last week, when you consider how young he is to the team, how young he even is to uh, the LCS stage. I mean, he's a player that didn't even play in the Challenger series previously in the last split, so he certainly came out of nowhere. Finally, we've seen him start to step up. Yeah, and the entire team, they just had this sort of solo queue style team composition, and they Honestly, Ruffle stomped H2K. Very aggressive, very in your face. It, it was positive play. It was. There was a, a lot of good layering of crowd control when it came to actually setting up the picks. And honestly, they, they just had a decent start to the game in general. In fact, uh, we took a look at their last 10 games. That was actually their first gold lead from that game against H2K in 10 games at 20 minutes. So that gives you an idea of at least how monumental that victory was for the Copenhagen Wolves. Well, they might get a little bit of a similar chance against Rocket, who are traditionally a little slow out the gates. Rocket at the moment are tied in the standings for that very last playoff position. So it is in fifth with a few other teams. They play Copenhagen Wolves today and Origin tomorrow. They have beat Origin before, but it, it's going to be a difficult task considering how close we are and considering Origin want to lock in that semi-final berth. So for Rocket, playoff hope is still very realistic and in their control. Certainly so. One thing that uh, you've got to keep in mind, though, is I feel like Origin will be preparing for the game of the week today quite a bit. That's more important, I would say, to try and lock second for them than to take down Rocket, who in theory they should beat. But remember, that's what happened last time, was uh, Origin were focused elsewhere and Rocket kind of snuck up on them. But a big factor for Rocket and their improvement has been Nuke Duck in that middle lane. He's been stepping up when it counts. And you look at the, the games that he played previously as Varus, we said, is it only the Varus? No, the Victor as well he brought into it. Last week, 9-1-12 and 12 against Giants, 100% <laughs> kill participation on the board for Nuke Duck. Certainly has kind of evolved into the player that we've heard about for so very, very long. That is a very impressive kill participation for a mid laner. And that's also something that Nuke Duck has somewhat struggled with getting involved with the rest of the team. His Varus was definitely a contested pick. His Victor showed up last week. As a team, they played okay versus Fnatic. I actually think that Nuketag looked better despite the fact that Fnatic ended up winning than maybe his team's results suggested. But 5-13, playoff spot on the line, picks and bans, and stress. Do you think we'll see a Draven ban? <laughs> well, I, it's it's against Freeze. I, I honestly <laughs> I honestly feel like it will be. Uh, there you go. Uh, interestingly enough, though, speaking of the victor, it. I don't know whether it'll be as contested as uh, maybe expected because we know Soren can play the Irelia into it. We saw that against H2K last week. So while it should be contested, we know the Copenhagen Wolves will feel comfortable giving it over. So Copenhagen Wolves, they tried that counter pick after getting beaten with it by SK. Fox rather than Irelia into Soren's victor. The rest of the band's Varus targeted to Nuke Duck. Jace has been one of the others that's been very contested and ironically, Copenhagen Wolves do not want to deal Victor, so they're not looking for that counter pick that has worked for them before. And remember, Copenhagen Wolves are fighting for their lives. If they lose this game, they place 10th and will be going to the Challenger Series next year. So, so far, no jungle bans, no AD carry bans either. Normally, you'd expect to at least maybe see a Callisto or a Sive sneak in here, but both roles are wide open here. So, whatever the Copenhagen Wolves pick up, Rakat, no, they're in no hurry to uh, secure both of those picks for now. But that is a Thresh being banned away from Cast. That's the champion we saw him last week. But uh, interestingly enough, we know Vanda plays a lot of Thresh as well. So they kind of concede that point and just take it away from Cast. And we have to highlight the AD carries, as you mentioned. Callista, first pick here for the Copenhagen Wolves. 
We know that Sivir's still up and available. Sivir is currently Mr. World's most played champion, three out of his 10 games. Actually been picked 29 out of the last 30, as we heard from Crepo and Deficio on the analyst desk. So Rocket now trying to decide where do they put their priority. All of the jungle is up, all of the top laners are up. If they don't want to reveal anything, you can pick that Sivir. It'll work with any team composition. Alistair's up as well. Other, yeah. There's just a lot still available in this game. A lot of it's because there's been bans here like Fizz. Uh, I mean, Steve has played one game of Fizz. Uh, he went 0-4-1 in that game. So, I mean, unless Copenhagen Wolves and Rockat have been kind of squaring off against each other previous weeks and it's caused them a lot of trouble, that may be the case. But Rockat finally figure out what it is, is exactly they want in the form of Rumble and the Alistair. So there's the Alistair we're expecting. Sitting on their AD carry, there's no rush to take it. And uh, likewise, both junglers up, but I kind of feel that uh, Copenhagen Wolves may have got the better side of this. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure so far. And, you know, Rocket put a lot of priority on this Rumble last week against Fnatic. They actually first picked it on blue side, um, partially to steal it from Huni and obviously just how powerful Rumble is in the current patch. But Steve is one and two on that champion. I'm not particularly blown away by it. But we'll see how they round out the rest of their composition. Nidalee locked in for Shook on the Copenhagen Wolves and that flex pick for Shen, Lenny has played it up top, and we have seen it in the support, despite the fact that Jisui Kass has not played it in summer, many other people have, so you've got that opportunity to move it where you want. Yeah, certainly still are a lot of options for the Copenhagen Wolves, but I think that Nidalee pick uh, may be, well, pretty detrimental to Rocket here if they start locking uh, an immobile mid laner. That's the kind of uh, mid laner that, that Nuke Duck has been playing more often, the low mobility mid laners that have poked. Varus not on the table. If he were to go for something uh, like a, a Jace, if he's looking for it, we've seen games from him before, that would be kind of difficult to play into this. Although Nuke Duck has been heavily focused here with the Varus, with the Victor. We have to see what his next tier is, and it looks like they're going to hide it till last. So I quite like that final counter pick option for Nuke Duck, but Azir is his most played champion next to Varus. Both of them have played four games, and actually, uh, Azir has been banned against Nuke Duck in nine out of their 16 games. So uh, it's their most targeted champion at uh, this stage in the summer split. So Rocket got, a, I think, a, a good combination of everything, except hard engage, um, outside of just throwing a Sivir ulti and running at you. I mean, they've got... Which is pretty hard engage, I'll admit. <laughs> However, <laughs> it's pretty it's hard. Lacking CC is the words I wanted to say. Also, I mean, they've got, now got the Gragas mixed in there as well. So you do have some engage tools, also the disengage coming in as well from the Gragas. So they do have a fairly well-rounded composition right now. Uh, and I actually like the play of just hiding their mid lane because it now forces uh, Soren's hand. And Soren goes to what has previously been somewhat of a counter pick for him against the Victor in this Aurelia into a blind matchup. This seems quite risky for me. I agree. <laughs> I mean, quite risky is putting it lightly. I don't feel like uh, free, uh, Soren is in a position where he can go, okay, Aurelia, this is it. It will win every matchup, unless he's become some kind of Aurelia god in the last three weeks. And unless Shook is going to camp that middle lane. For anybody that watches the NALCS, High played Nidalee last week against CLG and put on a great demonstration of how uh, much impact a jungler can have across the lanes, throwing those spears out, consistently being in your face. So if Soren gets some help from Shook, that is a terrifying 2v2 combo. And this is something that we were talking about in the office earlier this week, how the jungler plus your mid lane, jungler plus your top laner, how will they compare versus their opponents? And I really like Nidalee plus Shen against the likes of Rumble Gragas in the early stages. Get that taunt down. Some of the pounce damage from Cougar Foreman. Azir will be locked in here for Nuke Duck. So going to tried and tested for Rocket. Copenhagen Wolves going to be relying on Soren and Freeze to put a lot of the damage down. So it's interesting that the Azir was the lock in here because this is the exact lane that we first really saw the Aurelia come out with Faker playing it uh, against the Ku Tigers, I believe it was, where uh, Faker just goes Aurelia mid into Azir. It's going to be great. But Rockat now uh, with the Azir, this is more crowd control stacked on top of what they already had. So further disengage, uh, further engage if you want to Sharima shuffle your way into the fight. Whereas the Wolves may struggle when it comes to uh, looking to take down towers and sieging as a group because uh, the Aurelia melee range, Shen melee range wants to be in another lane anyway. It's all going to be now on the spears that are coming from Shook. Yeah, and of course, if they can get that early dive, early aggressive lanes working in their favor. Hugs all around. A lot on the line in this particular matchup.
And of course, for Copenhagen Wolves, can they avoid 10th? For Rocket, can they make it into the playoffs? They're currently in that position, but they do need to at least split one and one on their next two games. There's the team comps on your screen, ladies and gentlemen. If you think the Copenhagen Wolves will avoid 10th place or at least keep their hopes alive, hit us up on Twitter, hashtag CWWIN. If, however, you think Rocket can put their foot in the playoff door, tweet at us, hashtag ROCWIN. Loading up into the rift for game one in week nine. The European LCS. This could start the tide of tie breakers. Ladies and gentlemen, we didn't get any last split depressingly. Maybe we'll be lucky and get them the splits. <laughs> so, yeah. one thing we do want to talk as we load in, Soren tells us what he's playing like without fear. I actually think right now we're probably like really dangerous because we have nothing to lose basically and all we can do is just like go hard like there's nothing to lose so you're not you don't have to be afraid of of messing up or something you just play to to win so soren nothing to lose there is a spot in the lcs that is still technically on the line but i think it's the right attitude coming into the game and just had a brainwave. I actually remember there was a battle, and it was also for 10th place in spring. MYM and Giants at the 13th hour, all of a sudden. Yep. Giants pulled themselves back. Can Copenhagen Wolves do the same? As we see both teams with a very defensive start. Defensive starts overall, and uh, it, it's weird you talk about last split and similarities, because uh, as we see Copenhagen Wolves uh, looking for the lane swap, weirdly enough, week nine of the spring split, Copenhagen Wolves and Rockat faced up against each other then. And Copenhagen Wolves took the win in the first game of the first day of Week 9. So if Lightning can strike twice, it's not all over for Copenhagen Wolves. But they certainly are playing with uh, a composition that kind of says that they've got no fear here. Just blind picking the Aurelia into mid lane and then dealing with whatever Rocket throw. On the bright side for the Copenhagen Wolves, I think they've got a very clear win lane, win game. Or if not, it's going to be difficult. Something we always talk about is their comeback mechanics. And there's not a lot of wave clear for the Wolves. Yep. The last time these teams met was in week five. It was a Rocket victory. Very convincing, as you can tell by Kills, Towers, Dragons. And we see a lot of early trading here in this middle lane between the Soren and as well as the hand-holding for both teams' respective junglers. Yeah, this is something that uh, has started to kind of drift towards giving the top laners more experience, uh, especially when you watch some teams in LCK that actually give over the buff sometimes. I believe uh, Marin just kind of regularly gets it while he's on uh, Maokai. But the early game certainly has started to shift in uh, the metagame and how we've seen it. I wonder whether these teams are going to look for the, uh, the the bouncing the wave that Krepos talked about a lot and then kind of leaving three people there and your jungler just goes and uh, helps out the rest of the map. But we have seen the uh, upside down lanes for now, so that is not going to be the case at all. Not this time around. We're talking about those upside down lanes. Freeze, as well as Yesui cast up in that top lane with a small advantage, shoving in Mr. Riles and Vanda. Obviously having that melee support is going to make life a little difficult. And Kalist is still very, very highly contested. Freeze's stats versus the average. Well, exceptional to say the least. And that is on the current number 10 team, so that's also something to remember. Freeze's stats in general are just very good when you look at his laning phase uh, for the number 10 team. I mean, he regularly ends up up in CS against his uh, enemy AD carry, so we'll see exactly how uh, Freeze can do in this matchup. But I think the bot lane dynamic here is actually a very unique one because these are both teams that changed a player in their bot lane midway through the split. And now the question is, it's the first time they're meeting, who has had the uh, the better settling in period now for these bot lanes? I'm actually glad you bring that up because Kars has played now six games in the LCS. Mr. Rawls has played 10. And last week's uh, Friday was the first time that Kars really looked fantastic on that Thresh. Looking for those flash hooks, finding them a lot of the time. And we'll see how that works out. Steve and Rumble also. Uh, Steve has had some good games, and Steve has been heavily focused yeah. for some bad games. And Steve has been left to the dogs. Uh, I distinctly remember talking about how a team can, you know, prioritize some of that farm, prioritize some of the experience, and Steve sometimes is on the losing end of that discussion. 
certainly looks, though, by the way, that uh, Greg has positioned himself down in the bottom lane, giving him a ward. Certainly doesn't look to be the case for this one. Yankos is actually going to try and give the birthday present over to Lenny at this point. Does get the flash. It's a nice little gift for him. Yeah. Did not follow for the body slam flash, Yankos. So far, off to a decent enough start. Going to be helping out Steve on that rumble. I want to take a look up at the top lane for a little because Freeze has now extended that CS advantage to 16. Stress, you asked about who's settling in more. In this game, Freeze and Klaas have obviously the advantage, but it is the lane matchup playing in their favor. We're in a very unique situation with this lane matchup in that we don't see Kalista and Seve in the same game very often at all anymore. And haven't for a couple of patches. Uh, yes, Kalista did receive a couple of changes in the previous patch, but Freeze and a lot of the AD carries clearly still think Kalista is a top tier AD carry, regardless of the fact that she now only scales off that 90%. And you can see that Freeze is just laying down the law in this top lane. I mean, there's not a lot that Vanda can do in this situation. Being an Alistair has to sit back and respect the double range. Uh, and Cassie's just going to throw out the bindings, put down the, uh, the the pool just again and again, just harass them down and get them out of lane. <laughs> Well, get rooted, Rolls. Yeah, it was normalized to now, uh, I think it's 0.1 of a second at the end of a recall. So that'll tell you exactly how close to uh, to catching this Dorales that actually was. But the recall itself is actually going to be uh, a, a big factor here because now Copenhagen Wolves, do they sit in the 2v2 in the bottom lane uh, and bring Lenny top? Or do they stick with the 2v1s right now? Because honestly, in the 2v1, Mr. Rales and Vanda are getting eaten a lot. Yeah. Well, we'll find out what decision they decide to prioritize. As you mentioned, on the patch with the changes to Callista, scaling slightly less off that AD, uh, flat AD, we're seeing more and more common the Blade of the Rune turned into Hurricane build, and Cutlass already secured the freeze. Pickaxe for Mr. Riles, and the swap has been matched. So both Freeze and Cast have moved their cells down to find Riles and Vanda. Steve showed in the top lane actually quite quickly, so it was well informed. Low risk, and Shook stood right on top of a ward. We're six minutes in, and we've not seen Shook show his face at all. He's even on CS with Yankos. Yankos already had a successful gank, so that early game impact in Italy could have. Not showing through yet. Not yet, but it's also as uh, Yankos gets on to Cass. Well, he doesn't hit, but Cass is just going to be able to walk out of it. Should be able to. Barrel's going to at least put some damage down. And Cass loses 75% of his hit points. Yeah, that is... Uh Obviously, not what Cast was looking for. He was just trying to get that pink ward, but uh, too, uh, a little too greedy, a little overzealous down in that bottom side. Uh, but honestly, the, this Nidalee not having the impact yet uh, isn't the most detrimental thing right now for the Copenhagen Wolves, because once the Runeglaive is complete, once she can start throwing out the spears uh, and sit in front of turrets and kind of look to uh, have this more uh, split pressure that Copenhagen Wolves are looking for across the map with the Shen, uh, with the Aurelia, that's when Copenhagen Wolves need the Nidalee to start doing it. They need those spears to land when she's sitting there with Freeze and Cast, while Irelia and Shen are off in other lanes. Timing element involved for the Wolves. Let's see if they can find it. We did catch a quick glimpse of Soren jumping onto Nuketak in the middle. And whenever you've got that Irelia mid, you almost always want that exit strategy minion. Dash in, Equilibrium Strike, get a couple autos and dash out. I explained it beautifully last week, and unfortunately, Soren didn't have those Exit minions all the time. Gone for the Sheen first versus the makings of a Marilla Nomicon. So everybody's building up their power. Looks like Runeglaive already completed for Shook. So slow and steady as all of the lanes are farming themselves up into a powerful position. Yeah, slow and steady, but this bottom lane really, uh, again for the Copenhagen Wolves, seems to be as usual getting ahead. We talked about uh, how Freeze normally gets himself ahead, but this time it's, it's going to translate into a, a, a real mismatch of uh, actual item spikes here for Mr. Rallis. He's now going to have to sit back and wait for quite a while here uh, when it comes to actually having that second item complete Infinity Edge into uh, likely Static Shiv at this point. As uh, Rallis, he's just going to want to sit as far away from freeze and farm as possible in that lane that he can and just not really get forced off the wave. But he has managed to even up a little bit of the CS uh, with the time that freeze spent backing as well. But this has been a slow paced game. We'll see if Shook invading now opens this one up. No Gragas in uh, the top side jungle. He's all the way up in top lane itself. And Shook is well warded here so they can read him like a book. And of course, Yankos is the one that's picked up the successful ganks already. Forced the flash, which is you know, almost available for Lenny. 
showed his face to help out Mr. Rawls and Vanda. Because of the fact that Cast got chunked out, it has allowed Mr. Rawls to equalize that farm. Copenhagen Wolves, as well as Rockat, actually get standard lanes relatively often. Copenhagen Wolves in half of their games. For Rockat, a little over half of their games, they get these standard lanes. But for both of them, they're traditionally a little bit down in gold at 10 minutes. Today, they're very, very even. And I think you can feel the weight of this game, how much it means to everybody. And he's going to get caught by the body slam. Kask is actually going to knock him to safety. As Lenny well timed his dash. So, no summon a spell you What well, this is going to do, though, Shook is going to hop over that wall and look to uh, invade some of the jungle down on the bottom side. I would imagine, actually, it's going to start Dragon seeing Gragas in the top lane. And it's because of how pushed up Freeze and Just We Cast was. So, uh, it's a good read seeing the Gragas. However, they uh, aren't really going to be able to answer this from the side of Rockad. So, just the slight error from uh, Yankos of showing without really getting anything too much leads to the first dragon. Yeah, and for only the seventh time, this split. So the Copenhagen Wolves have now played 17 games. In seven of them, they've got the first dragon. They've at least started an additional win condition for their team. Five dragons into winning a team fight, because I really do not like the wave clear um, side of Wolves. So if they ever get into a position where they have to deal with Rumble Azir Siva under a tower, I think that's a scary position to be. However, if they can force Rocket to fight for a dragon, good way to look for other options. That's beyond scary, Kevin. That's like seeing us before we get makeup before the show. That's, <laughs> that's how much of a nightmare that one is. Uh, but, uh, Miss, Mr. Prince of Wales, maybe not I'm sure about you, but I'm lovely before and after. I was going to say, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, <laughs> Trev. But uh, at, at this point, that's a bit of a nightmare situation if it gets there. We are a long way off that one, though. Still no real... Uh, opening up of the game when it comes to uh, skirmishes and fights, mainly because no team has really had to right now. Copenhagen Wolves are fairly content to be holding uh, a little bit ahead in the bottom lane, but there is a binding that lands. Yeah, it's going to equate to a lot of damage for Vanda, but of course he's going to be able to sustain himself up with that triumphant roar. And I do think uh, Shook may have misread the situation. I think he thought he's locked in Evelyn. Because <laughs> we've not seen him do anything at the moment. Yes, he's farming well, so well, I'll they, give credit to that. They made the but there's so, so much power in Nidalee at lane. Right, right. Well, yeah, you're, you're not wrong, but he's also not doing anything intrinsically wrong himself when it comes to it. Uh, he's got the first dragon of the game for his team. Uh, he is going to become relevant the later into this game. But uh, honestly, there hasn't really been all that many situations for Shook to get himself into the emulators. Bot lane has been shoved in, Nuke Duck has been getting shoved in, and without a super risky gank, it's difficult. Uh, also, with just with the uh, the pressure that Yankos put in top lane, unless he was there to counter gank, which he kind of wouldn't get too much more uh, than just uh, an exchange of summoners, I actually feel like he's done fine just picking up the dragon. The only thing is, because of the limited options, Steve has a 12 and a half minute Leandri's Torment on Rumble. Right. He's getting very close to getting level two in that ultimate. Morella Nomicon's picked up a new gun. Finally, Shook is trying to play Whack-A-Mole, <laughs> but doesn't have the best aim at the moment. And Vanda, if you've gone for the headbutt Pulverize, you can't knock Freeze under your tower. So defensive play is Freeze and Kass have now built up that CS lead once more. Yeah, uh, uh, going back to that Leandri's torment is actually mid lane is where the action is. Soren is in so much trouble. The body slam connects, <laughs> and he just gets ping ponged under the tower. Happy birthday, says Jankos. Oh, the bounce house in the middle lane. I mean, that's the problem with Soren shoving up so much is that Shook isn't able to make those plays without uh, any kind of spear landing, and even then, it's dangerous. This time, however, Jankos, now that he has his ultimate available, easy path into the mid lane to pick himself up a kill. That is one of the problems that Zorin is going to have here, is if he wants to pressure Nuketuk, he has to overextend. Well played by Yankos once more. Three times we've seen Yankos, three times he's done something positive for Rockat. Seeing as though we like to talk about objectives. First blood for the former first blood king. Only the seventh time this split as well. Maybe now that it's his name day. Maybe it's his name day. There you go. He can Takes us back in time to when he was more successful at finding early kills. Rockat, however, they swap up now. They uh, lost their bottom towers. They're just going to give the farm over to Steve down on the bottom side. Uh, the problem is once Steve pushes it out, he uh, is not going to be able 
to uh, farm that wave without the uh, sight of the Copenhagen Wolves bottom lane up in the top side, which is where they're heading. And Rocket have uh, the attempted push on the tower, but Freeze is going to get there in time. And the thing is, Rocket, I, I feel like they're so scared of this 2v2. Oh, yes. It's the second time they've tried to swap away. They managed to shove Lenny out, and then are they going to swap again? I mean... Yes, they're down 20 CS. There's a BF sword finally for Raal, so he's going to be slow to I edge, but slightly quicker to I edge static shiv versus the Blade of the Rune King. The lead that Rumble has, though, is, is kind of offsetting that uh, because Rumble is just going to be very, very relevant in these team fights. Leandri's Torment, already competed, as we alluded to, is sitting on a little bit of gold. We'll have the source with boots uh, in about a minute or so. Should be just in time for Dragon, but Cast is blasted back. And Yankos is going to do it again. No, Fate's call! That's going to save Cast's life. Sorin's decided to engage on Steve. Steve starts to overheat. Here comes Nukta. He's actually going to knock Sorin onto the back. The Blade Search to Minions. One more order shall be given. Nuketak trades one for one. In the bottom lane, Soren figured he had it set up just one versus one, but Nuketak had already realized that he had to roam out, and uh, the appearance of Lenny in the middle lane meant that he knew he was ha having to head bottom lane as well. That's going to be a turret going down in favor of Rockad, which will put them ahead in the gold lead here. How do Copenhagen Wolves respond with this? Because Shook is deep in the enemy jungle, but he's about to get surrounded if the bottom lane can make it in time. So Rockad are going to try scramble to defend the mid tower. Dragon will be up in 30 seconds. Copenhagen Wolves took an uncontested Drake to secure the first of the game. Rocket will have the timer for that. They will have heard the noise. And Mr. Rawls and Vanda, they're setting themselves up top. Doubt we'll see a dive. But look at how many people topside Wolves have right now. Uh, they've got three people topside. They've got... The Aurelia down on the bottom side. Okay, Rocket aren't rushing for the dragon yet, but now you're able to track the wolves on their movements through. Uh, they did, however, secure good vision control on the top side, so they're looking probably at this point to trade for the tower. Inevitably, they'll get the tower regardless of whether the dragon is started by Rocket or not, with how low the tower is. And with Shook up here, actually, Rales and Vanda probably need to start backing themselves away here because that minion wave is going to push in. And now that that rune glaive is completed, oh! Nidalee, these spears are really starting to hurt Rocket. You're going to have to run unless the team can get there in time. So Teleport available. Headbutt pulverized went down from Vanda. Teleport's coming from behind. Here comes Steve. That's a good equalizer. Stand United will bring Lenny into the Lenny's gonna find the taunt, but it's a flash away from Steve to avoid it. Nuketak is gonna shuffle over the wall. Vanda's looking for a pulverize. He'll back away before he can find it. Everything in the kitchen sink is thrown in for naught. Oh, well, they got a lot of summoners from the Copenhagen Wolves at that point, but Soren is playing the split push game down in the bottom side of the map as well. Look at uh, top side. Again, Jankos is looking to continue. This still has his ultimate available. Jankos gets taunted. He gets rooted. Vander and Rolls are trying to get in. That explosive cast will be defensive for now. Tower was secured. You can see it on the bottom. Shook, he's jumped in. The Rune Glaive plus auto attacks will secure the second kill for the Wolves. They've jumped onto Vander, and his will is broken. Two for zero up top. The Copenhagen Wolves just taking objectives both sides of the map from this one. The top tower is likely to fall here as well. Soren did get the bottom tower. Meanwhile, while that engagement was going on, so the Wolves have kind of said to Rocket, we don't care that you had Dragon Control earlier. We don't care that it was a slow game because we want to play the objective game. We want to get into three lanes at the same time as this game continues. And with those two uh, side lane outer towers being down, only the middle lane tower stands between them and a 1-3-1. One, one. And with Dragon coming up shortly, Copenhagen Wolves, the Siege middle could go for Dragon. Options are plenty. 3,000 gold up for the second time in 11 games. They are looking likely to have a lead at 20 minutes. This mid lane Irelia and the movement around the map seems to be working out for the Wolves. It also helps that Mr. Riles has been kept a little down. Right. It's, for the most part, it has been good. I mean, Soren taking the 1v1 earlier, got the kill from it, allowed him to get the goal to now have a hex drink alongside his uh, Trinity Force for this one. So. While Soren's scoreline is 1, 2, and 0 right now, which is quite underwhelming when you look at it from a, an outside perspective, his actual impact on this game has been very large. Would, uh, you can't equate it, but the pressure right. that Soren is putting has now become a split push, Irelia. Very few, actually nobody on the Rockets, I can take him one-on-one. -on -one. 
um, at the moment. There's no armor to speak of. And Copenhagen Wolves, two dragons. Uncontested as well. I actually, looking further on into this game, I wonder who will be able to take him on one versus one. Nuked up with his onions, I don't think he's going to last through the damage. Flashes gets bound anyway. Oh, he's going to get connected, but the Emperor's will, the divide rather, will split off the jungle. So ultimate used and the summon spell. Copenhagen Wolves setting themselves up for the last remaining outer tower. It's three to three in tower. This will be the fourth of the game if the Wolves can take it. I like the tactic here by the Wolves, but they're going to need a little more than one minion wave like that. Here's where the Spears have to count. We saw it in the top lane. This is where Shook has to earn his money in this game. He's got to get the damage out. And this is also something you mentioned in Pix and Ban, Stress, the somewhat limited siege power of the Copenhagen Wolves. Azir and Sivir have got such great wave there. Unfortunately, as soon as Wolves got to the tower, Shin can't offer a whole lot, Aurelia can't offer a whole right. lot. Need to immediately back away. It's one of the very rare cases when in this situation, uh, the sum of all the parts does not do the job. It's individually across the map that the Copenhagen Wolves actually have to uh, pile the pressure on, and that's exactly what they're defaulting to now. It's what they have to do if they want to really keep the pressure on to Rocket Aurelia up in the top lane right now. Shen on the bottom side has his ultimate and the uh, teleport still available. So the Copenhagen Wolves know what they've got to do. Executing it now against the Rocket team, who is going to look to hard engage onto Freeze and Cast is going to be a tricky one. One thing the Wolves are also doing, I feel, maybe even overdoing. Every time they're applying pressure on an area of the map, they really put a lot of wards into it. You can see, you know, five minutes ago, they had, what, six, seven wards on the top half of the river. Now they've got four, five wards on the bottom half. It's allowing them to play with the pressure, but it's a lot of vision. For now, the problem is, though, their wards aren't conducive to playing risky. The wards aren't deep enough to be pushing up to inner towers. They have no real vision apart from the shallow entrances to the river. So it means Copenhagen Wolves can't look to extend further. And a lot of it's just to do with Middle Tower. Middle Tower still being up reduces the ability for the Wolves to actually just push into the jungle. They're doing it, but look at how risky this is. Cast takes a lot of damage. Rocket certainly putting the heat on. Very preemptive, defensive equalizer from Steve. He's still gonna see his advantage, but it's shrinking now that the Wolves have unlocked really their side lanes. Shook farming up a storm. Got Abyssal Scepter completed, Sork Shoes. There's that Rune Glaive as well. We saw how much damage the Spheres can do. We're still waiting for the Wolves to crack open the entirety of Rocket's jungle. And you can see Yankos also still farming his way up, donating red buff over while getting tanky out with Inspector's Cowl. Very early Void Star from Nuketuck. I think the count of the Spirit visage in the Abyssal Center. Yeah, and also a Hex Drinker onto the Aurelia as well. So I I'm interested to see where Nuketuck goes from here with the itemization. Has a blasting one here. Will he look uh, to pick up uh, either the, the route towards the Rabidon's death cap, which now is such an expensive item that we'll see it later into the game. I kind of expect him at some point to look to pick up the Zonyas later into the game if uh, the utility is what he's looking for. But right now, honestly, Nuketuck has a lot of options available. It depends on what lane he's going to position himself in. Because if he's sat in front of a Nidley, you don't want the armor. <laughs> you know, it's... It, well, yeah, you, you want the magic resistance. As it stands, Nuketuck is defending the last outer tower, the last bastion of control. Luckily for Rocket, they can always throw up an extra tower to slow down the Copenhagen Wolves' minions with that Azir passive. But we can still feel this trepidatious game. Slow and steady, and I, I think it's both good and bad, because Callista and Irelia is going to get scary, Shen's going to get tanky, but you're also letting Azir farm up. You're letting Sivir become relevant. You're letting Rumble get closer to his hourglass. For sure, but Rocket right now aren't chasing the, the fights when Copenhagen Wolves are kind of putting them out in front of them. They have a fair amount of hard engage here that we've already looked at. Uh, they're going to be forced into these fights around the uh, the neutral objectives coming up, like in 1 minute 30 when Dragon comes up. It, as long as they don't get picked off before, uh, and with Rocket's warding on the top side and just through some of the jungle on the lower side, there's no reason for Rocket to get picked up. But Steve hasn't really made a whole bunch of teleport plays with Equalizer because the situations haven't been present. Yeah. He's not actually had the opportunity to do it. And that's why Rocket don't really seem to be doing all that much with what they've got because right now they haven't been forced to. They've only really lost uh, just a couple of towers and 
Wolves haven't pushed them any further. It doesn't feel like a Wolves that are playing with nothing to lose. They're very controlled, which uh, I would have liked to have seen with this kind of performance earlier in this game. Yeah, that's for sure. Copenhagen Wolves playing aggressive last week, allowed them to beat H2K. Mixed up that strategy against Rocket. As you mentioned, stress, 45 seconds until Dragon spawns, vision control being established by the Wolves. Litter a whole lot of wards when they have something to fight for. A little bit of a defensive uh, sweep there from Vanda, seeing that Javelin toss coming in. Morales is spotted out, but Shook is going to back away to look for uh, the setup on the Dragon themselves. So, Copenhagen Wolves, they are setting up the vision around it. They have most of the vision control that they need. But look at Steve up in the top lane, pushing in to the Shen. So at this point, he wants to shove just Shen, uh, Lenny in just as much as he possibly can at this point, so that Lenny, when the dragon does arise, has to A, lose experience and lose the ability to really push that lane back out. Here's the dragon stuck. This is gone before Rocket can even respond to this. Well. Dragon number three. They go for mid tower instead though. Look at this. Nukeduck is pushing and has the sun disc up. So they want to trade this for a much better objective for themselves. So gold and lane control. Teleport comes out from Lenny. That will be enough to dissuade the pressure. Despite the Dark Bang connecting, Copenhagen Wolves opt not to follow in. The only real hard CC engage they have will be that flash taunt or taunt flash from Shen. Holding on to it for now. Rocket were not on the same page with that play. Uh, the Sun Disc goes up, Steve is already rotating, but uh, on the back line, right at the Sun Disc was Mr. Rales. Didn't get anywhere near the turret to look to push. And the teleport comes in early from Lenny to make sure they can't push the turret, but now Rocket just used a lot of the pressure on their map without getting anything for it. That's the third dragon now over the Copenhagen Wolves. It gives them the added mobility to now look to set up uh, the movements between lanes that they're looking for with a 1-3 run right now even faster. Wolves are in a great position to look to set themselves up across all three lanes. You see some items being purchased. So Copenhagen Wolves are going to use the gold lead that they have earned, turn it into an item lead. Sunfire K plus Spurred Visage for Lenny's split pushing Shen. You can see him taking control of the bottom lane. More of Melmortius was completed for Soren a little while ago. He's setting up Mantle in the top lane. And that 1-3-1, one, one, it, is, it is gaining Copenhagen Wolves some control. But they've not taken the mid outer turret. They've not pushed to the inner turret up top. For Copenhagen Wolves, that's how they need to gain some control. The other alternative, they, they've got a fantastically quick Baron, but the amount of damage Nidalee, Irelia, and Callista have, they could play the Baron bait as we're getting later and later into the game. It's going to be difficult for Rocket to even look to set up uh, some kind of steal, but Rocket shouldn't have to steal it at that point, because if Copenhagen Wolves put themselves all inside the pit, that's when Steve with his Rumble is going to open up. The Azir is going to open up the damage. So it is still dangerous for Copenhagen Wolves. If they try and just pull that trigger before it's, uh, before it's easily accessible for them, Rocket certainly will punish them. Great risk and great reward. Copenhagen Wolves, 10th place, three wins, 13 losses on a split. Sometimes great reward comes with great risk. That's why it's great risk, Trevor. You don't always get it, otherwise it wouldn't be a great risk. I mean, I wish that was a thing, otherwise, you know, I'd just buy lottery tickets or things. Hey, great risk, I got a great I reward. I argue semantics. I hate it when you're right. So, <laughs> Copenhagen Wolves. Shook, still farming up a storm. Got an hourglass completed. Going to be playing that sort of bruiser nidalee. If memory serves, it was a similar style of um, item build from Diamond Prox last week. And he was pouncing into the middle of team fights. Well, here's, uh, here's the Baron play that you were talking about. Ends up with Soren taking a bit it's of a damage. Little, it's a little awkward. I, I mean, it's not so much a Baron play as a just making sure you know we're here. Well, the problem is, like, they aggro it for themselves and then they're like, mm, they're kind of mid lane, probably don't want to push in on that. It, it's, it's not a play that I think Copenhagen Wolves, uh, even themselves, feel comfortable in making, so they shouldn't even look to make it. This is the problem. Krepo said the, uh, the sign of poor shot calling 
a bad Baron call. And okay, that wasn't a Baron call in the sense that they actually committed to it, but you can see that Wolves are teasing with the idea. Yeah, they are. Yankos is now teasing with death. He's going to use the explosive cask, but Black Shield was put onto Soren. Big chunk from a Javelin toss. That'll do it, though. That will be enough for the Wolves to actually commit to this, because, uh, I mean, Yankos putting himself that far out there, because of the warding from the Wolves, it was enough to uh, set that fight up. Here come the top laners into it, though. Stand United was being channeled on cast. Lenny should arrive. Equalizer's down. They've stopped the Baron, at least. Lenny forced to flash defensively, Ooh. and Kars gets out alive. Nuketuck looking for the kill. So, Stand United was used. Teleport from Steve. Rocket, with a little bit of pushing power, might get themselves a tower. Here they make the same play again. Put the Sun Disc up, push for the mid tower. You know Copenhagen Wolves can't really defend this. They were so heavily chunked. And look at the damage that Azir is already doing right now. And the teleport coming in behind from Lenny, though. So Lenny needs to get the taunt. He's also going to get through the Sun Disc. That's a two-man taunt. He gets headbutted away. Emperor's will will divide Lenny under the tower. The Flame Splitter is chunking down Soren. And that Sun Disc doing a lot of work. Copenhagen Wolves slightly underestimating damage and the disengage from Rocket. Yeah, there is so much disengage coming from Rocket that there's no real way of Copenhagen Wolves taking the fight when numbers are equal. There is really no chance for them to even look for that kind of fight. And you can see the Rocket, uh, they'll just sit fairly comfortable in this situation, knowing their ultimates are available to allow Copenhagen Wolves to make almost none, no decision. Almost no decision. They start the Baron and then it, it's, I mean, it's easy to tell for Rocket that they know it's a bad call. And what a difference when you look at that Baron call versus how Fnatic does 20 to 30 minute Barons. And even last week, uh, Gambit also had a fantastic early Baron call. They had good vision control. They knew how quickly they could take the objective and rushed it. I mean, I can't fault uh, Copenhagen Wolves for looking for it after you chunk the, the jungler, but one of the biggest problems is from earlier, Steve went unchecked on this run. He's very, very strong right now. And as long as he's got teleport and his equalizer and isn't in the fight, that's when Copenhagen Wolves can look to make a play like this. This is the fourth dragon now of the game, under contention. This time both teams are around here, and we've already spoken about how Wolves can't take the head-on fight. The ultimates are back available for Rocket. Shook needs to hit some spears here if they want to fight this. This could come to a 50-50 smite fight. Shook has it available, Yankos has it available. It's secured by Rocket. Dragon number one, and they do not want the fight. Aspect of the dragon been delayed. Yeah, another six minutes onto the clock, but finally, 32 minutes into this game, the mid outer tower falls and might not be over yet. That's a big spear onto Mr. Riley's. The wolves are not done yet. They are not, but they don't. They cannot deal with the wave clear. They can't. Copenhagen Wolves, this is the. This is another time where you've tried to push a tower. It's been a few Nuke times. Duck has just cleared it out. Nuke Duck did finish the death cap. That's his next item. So starting to rack up. A lot of ability power, 590 with his current build. Has the penetration from Void Stuff, has the very burst oriented Azir build. He might be going for that Hourglass next, which you can see Steve already has completed. So, again, that small gold lead that Rocket had has not alluded to a lot of control. There is uh, a moment coming up here where Copenhagen Wolves can look to at least get further vision on the top side. Once Rumble shows bottom side uh, and shows himself in the wave, if he stays there, Rocket don't have that teleport available, so they can push out, get some deep awards, look to pressure at least top and mid, and as soon as you draw them away, that's where you can set up further vision as well and look to get in other lanes. But Steve is backed away from the lane here, so uh, Wolves have to play this a lot more carefully because they can't actually commit to anything without being able to see ru uh, Rumble, and Steve's not the kind of player that's going to sit over there with no teleport and not look to move. Yeah. And you can see the weaknesses of Copenhagen Wolves' draft coming into play now. They had good lanes, they did well in lanes. They were playing the split push game, but Wolves are not fully committed to split pushing. They're not fully committed to the 1v1. Because, well, they're not consistently doing it. Though. <laughs> and, and, and like part of the reason is that they just haven't been aggressive enough in their deep warding. They haven't been going in as like a three-man unit, putting wards down deep and looking to rotate. Soren pushing up without the wards it has been caught. Stand United being channeled. Lenny is going to be looking for the taunt. This has now turned into a three-on-two. Look at the jungle. The wolves are moving through it. The uh, engage gets Stand United at the very least. So it'll be teleport v teleport for a little while, and Rocket will have timed 
Lenny's ultimate. Whoops, so back on the Baron. This is one of the biggest problems that uh, you see a lot of teams have, is just, I don't know what to do. Okay, let's go Baron. The thing is, if the Wolves get enough time, the Rend plus Smites should make it a 65-35 Baron, if they chunk it effectively. For sure. But Rockout are never going to give themselves that time because Rockout aren't under any other pressure. There is no external factor for Rockout to not be around the Baron or at least close enough to contest to the point where Wolves just go, oh, they're here, back away. There's nothing forcing Rockout's hand to take a step back away. And it's just this ping pong of, of wards and vision control. Just up to the enemy jungle and back away. And that's all that is happening right now until one of these teams finally either ma uh, catches a pick or manages to get themselves some pressure elsewhere on the map. Dragon will do it when it comes up, about three minutes away on that one. It will drag the teams down, but I feel like Rockout will make the same play again. It's on Soren at that point to set up the top side in time for the Dragon to at least take a tower and put more pressure onto Rockout. And you don't actually want to team fight Rockout. Right. With the Gragas, with the Rumble, I quite like Yanko's picking up the Frozen Heart, considering how auto-attack reliant both Irelia and Kalista are. That attack speed reduction even more effective against the team composition that the Wolf put together. But this may be a battle of Barons and Dragons, and again, Vision from Wolves is great around Baron, but it hasn't necessarily equated into 100% I mean, control. Vision itself is a two-step process. Getting the vision tends to be the easy bit. Using the vision is the thing that the Wolves haven't done with any of this. It's like they've had decent vision control, but they've never had it in places where Rockout have been able to be punished by moving forward. They, they managed to catch Yankos once. It, around the Baron Buff, but it didn't equate to anything further. However, if they've managed to set up wards deeper and have that happen again and again, you punish Rockat for even stepping forward in their jungle. You need to make the enemy jungle uh, dangerous territory for themselves before you start making any of these plays. Multiple blind face checks. Force that, and then you can make them eat a dark binding and kill them. <laughs> Carson Shook going to clear out the Baron Pit once more. We'll see if they can get themselves some deep vision down, throwing out those javelins for a little bit of scouting. And Soren down in that bottom lane. He has no teleport, so if the wolves are out of position elsewhere, Soren could get caught out. Although the last time Rocket tried to kill Soren, Lenny just stands united to it, hit it up and then yeah. uh, ended that attempt. <laughs> yeah. For sure. One of the biggest problems uh, for Copenhagen Wolves and their vision is because they're not running a, a, a jungle that wants to build Sightstone, Nidalee just kind of goes, nope, don't need that, just going to build AP. Uh, they have two upgraded ward trinkets, which isn't intrinsically a problem as long as you're uh, having the upgraded sweepers, you've got pink wards, and you're taking control of the enemy vision so that they just can't put their own wards down. Rocket on the other side, three sweepers, two Sightstones. They're sitting pretty when it comes to at least defending areas that they have to for now because they know that Rocket from this point are going to draw Copenhagen Wolves into two points or at least engage on the three remaining members that aren't split pushing. And then it's a case of how much do you stop in the side lanes. That's on Rocket's shoulders. Yeah, while you're talking about all the items, we're well into the late game. You've got a four item freeze. Pick themselves up a null magic mantle to go with the BT, Blade of the etc. Mr. Rawls, I had Shiv. Bloodthirster. So let's see which AD carry Ooh, is going to do more damage. Obviously, the utility that Rolls will bring, the rest of his team cannot be understated. Dragon is up and Rocket making it very clear they will not give up another dragon uncontested. They won't. Spears coming out from Shook. Haven't yet landed, but you can see how afraid Rocket are of actually stepping forward to the dragon pit without committing to it fully. But again, there's no real way of Copenhagen Wolves actually dealing with the wave clear that Rockat have right now. So they can always put this just nice buffer of distance where you can just sidestep a spear at this point. I mean, the only real person that they're worried about a spear uh, hitting is Nukta because there's a spell shield on Mr. Rales. The rest of the Rockat lineup are fairly tanky and they have a, a little bit of healing coming from Alice. So I actually like this play from Rockat to just kind of cut straight down the middle. Say, we don't care that you want to go for the dragon. We're forcing you to come and defend your base. Same play, third time in a row, this time for the inhibitor tower. It's going to be a more difficult one to sell. I agree. Punish the limited wave clear. Make freeze, go for those autos, and then try to bounce him back. It's an explosive cast. Let's see if Rocket can make it work. They're still down in gold. 
Dragon will be secured. Soon enough, we'll have more dragons killed than champions. <laughs> Stress. This is actually on track to be the, the, the most passive kill-based game we've had since Origin Copenhagen Wolves. That had 11 kills in 40 minutes. It doesn't surprise me at this point from the way that uh, the teams are playing passively. Rockat choose not to do wow. this fight. Well, wow. um, they go for the Baron instead. Can Wolves are being it. way too comfortable with this. Okay, Callista cancels your recall, but Cast Hood already back. Rocket have pretty good Baron clear themselves now with uh, this Azir with the damage that Rumble is going to have. So now Soren blasted in. Yankos knocks Soren closer. Baron Shook got it. stolen. Shook steals the Baron as well as Dragon number four. Oh, Dentist throws Ooh. his hands up in the air. Steve and the rest of Rocket say they don't care. Five on four. Right, teleport back from Steve to defend the inhibitor. The rest of Rocket, they're pushing. This will be a four on three. Lenny's pushing bottom well, lane at the same it. time. He cancelled it. All the That's towers be an inhibitor. So, there's so many minions here. Rocket onto the towers. It's five versus three. They might be trading inhib for inhib. Just as we were saying, our pass of the game is, it has been blown wide open. Who commits the hardest here? Rocket are backing off already. Lenny has not backed off. He's pushing a big barren stack of waves. Copenhagen Wolves can use the spears to prevent the backs here coming from Rocket. Not enough people can get back to stop Lenny at this it. point. Lenny. They've got one Nexus turret already. Lenny is pushing for his second. The Wolves, all they've got to do is stop the recall. Lenny is onto the next Nexus turret. Take a look at the Wolves. They're interrupting the recalls. Nuke Duck is trying to get back. He may be able to finish his cooldown. Lenny has got barren Empowered minions. The Copenhagen Wolves are on the brink of being eliminated from the LCS, and they may be picking up the win that keeps them alive. Lenny, Lenny, can you do it? He's still on the Nexus. He's hammering it away. Nuketak and Bandit have to it. run all the way back. The Sharima Shuffle. Copenhagen Wolves keep their hopes alive. For the first time in six weeks, we've heard the howl twice in a row. Copenhagen Wolves need to go 2-0 this week. They play Giants tomorrow. And if SK goes 0 2, we are on track for a tiebreaker for 9th and 10th place. My word, what an ending to that game. Such a passive game for 35 minutes, nobody making any decisions at all. <laughs> Rocket starter Baron, Shook comes in, steals it away. As you said, on the very brink of being out of the LCS. A loss here puts them in automatic relegation. And they keep their hopes alive. My word, the Copenhagen Wolves right now. Whew. I mean, they played without fear for the last five minutes of that one for sure. They uh, certainly went for it. And it was just a game of chase. Cut down Rocket and, and stop them from recalling. Rocket will be reviewing that decision to give up Dragon number four. Potentially into the into the postseason. Rocket are now seven and, and ten. With that loss. I mean, they need to win. Before we dive into the matchup, though, Stress, uh, they often say who has that caster magic when it comes to games. I mean, you just casted one hell of a game. Whew. I mean, I've, I've still not quite recovered after the end of that game. I, I was not ready for that explosive end. But anyway, there is a lot more action to get to, and I cannot wait for this next game. Yeah, it was a fantastic start to today. But now, though, Giants versus UOL, let's start by taking a look at those Giants with Whirlup, Frederick, Pepinero, Audrey, Godfred, and their coach, Lothark. Well, um, last week, they had a pretty rough week, and... Kind of an extreme exemplification of that is Audrey's game against H2K, picking the Jinx in a rather unlucky composition and not doing very well. In general, though, the Giants have had a couple of rough weeks, although this was an extreme cyanide. What have you thought of Giants' evolution in the last couple of weeks in the split? Mm, I really feel like uh, Frederick and Audrey are having some troubles right now. Like I feel like Frederick is <laughs> very good when it comes to stealing objectives and stuff, for example. But then again, if you actually manage to snowball the early game, then maybe you don't need to steal the stuff. 
that much and other just seems to be a lot like out of position and not having the impact as uh, the other AD carries. I think that the very fair points there as well. You actually just saw one uh, one team kind of hanging in on the LCS by stealing. So we know it's worked for Giants before, but honestly, uh, the key point there is talking about the early game and, and snowballing their lead. Uh, Giants have only held one gold lead at 20 minutes in their last 10 games, very similarly it's to uh, the Copenhagen Wolves actually. Their average gold deficit at 20 is 3.7 thousand gold down, which is actually higher than the Copenhagen Wolves, is, uh, I believe, or... Uh yeah, it, it's you know it, it's just they're never snowballing off the lead uh, that they have never got. Yeah, and we were praising them in the beginning when that was happening for their comeback mechanics and the steals and Pepinero scaling into late game, but obviously it's not going that well for them anymore. And now they're up against the unicorns of love who are on the red side and in that fight for fourth place: Vizuchachi, Jilius, Power of Evil, Vardax, Hillisong, and Sheepy. Kiki's recently said, I was the backbone for the team in the Unicorns of Love. Uh, last week was their very first week with Jilius. He had um, not the best lease in game I have ever seen, and they also first picked it for him, but maybe he was overcoming the jitters on stage. He had a better game as Jarvan in the next one, but how do you think he's going to do here in his next weeks? Uh, Julius is just one of these classic solo queue picks. Like He's a really mechanical jungle place like Lee Sin, Idol, the typical like s stuff that is very good in solo queue, but... Picking up players like that is pretty much like lottery. Sometimes you're going to have like a diamond procs and sometimes you're not and they're just going to be bad. But yeah, it just only time will tell and we'll see how he keeps performing. I, I think one of the biggest factors is Unicorns last week had a 50-50 week. Certainly when you look at not only Gilius, but uh, when it came down to Power of Evil as well, his second game of the week was way and uh, head and shoulders above everything else that we saw on day one. We've got a little bit of a, a montage of uh, Hi, his... Go several multi-kills that we had. So we had two double kills started from uh, Power of Evil with that Runeglaive Orianna as well. 15-3-3 three and three, and uh, a lot of it came from the back of uh, the Pentakill. Uh, Cyanide, Runeglaive, Nasher's Tooth, Orianna. Would you have called it the Pentakill before? Um, no, that's not something I really saw coming. <laughs> How about as surprising as the Shen backdoor, I'd say, on the same level? About as surprising, but Unicorns of Love, they make something uh, weird happen, or something weird and wonderful work for them once again. And when it comes to their chances in the rest of the season, if they make it to playoffs, they actually have a fair chance of making it to Worlds because they already have 70 championship points because they ended up second in the Spring Split. It would be a sight for sore eyes, the Unicorns of Love at Worlds. Yeah, it would wow. be second time Julius is going to Worlds, actually, and both times kind of undeserving, of course. Uh, Whoa! So well, you say if Unicorns of Love would make it to Worlds, <laughs> it would be undeserving? Uh, no, not in the team in okay. general, but I mean for Julius in a way, that first time he went to Subforce and Scarin, of course, and now he just like jumps in the wagon just at the last like miles. I, I think the key thing for Unicorns, though, is they have to earn their spot at Worlds if they want to do it yeah, through the exactly. points. They either have to go past H2K with enough of a gap that H2K don't take that spot, or they have to go through the regional qualifiers. So I feel like if they make it through one of those two ways, they should have earned it. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Things are about set on stage, so we're going to step into the studio and get into the game. Thank you very much, Shox. I'm Devin Pyre, Texas Young, swapping in and out of the desk with Mitch Krepo. Force pulls as we gear up for the Giants and Unicorns of Love. Big game, big, big, big playoff contention as well for these two teams, Mitch. Yeah, both in the, in the middle of the pack here, but honestly, they were watching last game, I'm sure, and they were happy oh, yeah. that Rocket dropped out, so that is one less straight competitor for that spot. But whoever wins out, belie I believe, comes out in fourth place. Mm -hmm. On their own, yeah. Whether, it's, whether if the Unicorns get tied by Giants, Giants will then have a... No, if Unicorns win, I believe... Unicorns are ahead. Okay, let's do this again. Currently one game If up. Giants win, they tie them, and then they have the favorable tiebreaker. If the Unicorns win, obviously they get farther ahead, and they also get fourth place. Standings are tricky. Luckily, League of Legends is not as tricky. Let's go into the ban phase. Pick and bans coming out. Orianna is gone immediately. And that's to be expected. Yeah, clearly they were watching that game last week and do not want to give a chance to the Runeglaive Orianna once again. So that's taken off the board. Rise is also removed by the Unicorns. It gives Giants the ban back to them. Well, they continue to focus their attention on the power, though. Yeah, Rise and Rumble are pretty staple bans we saw coming out. The value of Shen is going up these days as well because it can play played both in top lane and in support. Now, the Unicorns, they're targeting some of these poke champions in the middle lane. Honestly, Pepinera has been fantastic on those. Yeah, yeah, the, the Jace... He's been a very, very popular pick, but the Varus has as well for Peppy. Let's see if they decide to go for that one on top of it. I would say we've been seeing a little bit more uh, blind mid picks lately, although I feel like that may not necessarily be the trend. Yeah, last game was actually very interesting. Uh, Rocket was hovering 
Azir is like, okay guys, we're gonna take it away, you better take it. And they were looking to counter it. Wolves read that beautifully, but just blind picking the Aurelia mid. So teams are swapping it up a little bit. Also different regions have different priorities. If you go over to the LPL over in China, Azir is top pick ban insta lock and Victor is a close second. Not so much, definitely not in Europe and especially not in this game. Definitely not. And now with the Alistair and Morgana both banned away the purple supports. No AD carries taken off, so just like last game, we could be potentially in for a Callista Siver, Callista Siver matchup. If they decide to go for it, a lot is left open there as a couple of top picks, a couple of mid picks have been off the board. That's a good point you make right there, but neither AD carry to me screams Callista. I don't think Audrey is a fantastic Callista player. I've seen Vardex from Callista and it didn't really work out either, so I would like to see a Siver first rotation pick because you know the traditional counter quote-unquote, Kalista is not going to be played well by your counterpart, so I don't know why Giants are hesitating here. I'd just love to see that Siver. Yeah, looks like you will get your wish. That is locked in. That's one wish, Audrey. Tom. One! Just one. You got two more. Two more. I need to find another Let's see. genie. We, so we may still see the Kalista. But it doesn't have to be now. But it doesn't have to be very quickly. This is the, this is the key thing. I think it's really interesting that the, the supports, those two pretty large support pickups have been banned away. Godfrey, remember, pretty much the god for Morgana hadn't dropped a game on that one, but the only other champion who's had success on been a Janna. I don't know if they're going to want to pair that with a Sivir. Yeah, looking at Hillisang, always he has his Thresh left. It's very hard to play that into Sivir due to the nature of the spells of Thresh are very telegraphed, so a spell shield is very easy to cast. In addition to that, fights get very chaotic, so landing the hook is hard. However, Hillisang has shown some mastery of Braum over in the LPL. That is traditionally a pick into this chaos from Sivir because you can just zone control around objectives very well and go for those repetitive dragons. However, Hillisang is just so good on Thresh that it's almost a crime for him not to lock it in here. And then we're probably looking at the jungle for an early rotation pick. Yeah. We don't give away too much information. Likely we'll, we'll probably see maybe a Nidalee in response here from Giants Gaming. That would be the meta pick of choice. However, if Freddy feels more comfortable, on, more comfortable on Rek'Sai, he could also opt for that champion. Yeah, and he's definitely been able to pull off some pretty incredible moves there. Some of those big Baron steals that got him his nickname were on that champion. But we had something we didn't point out as much with the two junglers available. That's pretty obvious. However, for Unicorns, they already carry something a little bit different. Yeah, a little different here. Graves coming out into Silver. I honestly, not that big of a fan. I feel you can spell shield throughout trading potential. Unless they go for a support, I can also proc the spell shield. That, that will force uh, Silver to swap away because she obviously has one spell shield. She has to use that eventually. And then Buckshot and collateral damage from Graves can come out. However, it scales poorly. It should have been Kalista, in my opinion. It just shows that Vardex is not comfortable in that champion. So Giants, in a sense, making a, a good read on the pick and ban phase, not getting too worried about these champions being open. Not only that, you know, they got the Thresh takeaway as well on the Hillisang, so denying a little bit of that. And now with the Unicorns locking in the Annie and the Maokai, Graves' Annie lane that was powerful once upon a time. I don't know about now. Uh, I, I like it into this matchup in particular because of the reason we talked about earlier and because now he has threat from the Annie W which is instance which is hard to hard to read. You have the Annie Q obviously that can get spell shields but then Graves has follow up damage and in this lane Thresh is just very weak so we'll see a lane swap almost 100% guaranteed come out from Giants Gaming otherwise they're probably going to lose this lane. Remember back in spring the Unicorns of Love bot lane was known to get kills. They killed almost every single LCS duo in the first uh, nine games, I believe. So Hillisang and Vardex were incredibly good at playing these 2v2. So they still have those traits left. And the interesting part going back to Picks and Bass, why that trash come out is because Giants banned Alistair themselves. Unicorns shot themselves in the foot with the Morgana ban, but it's a bigger bullet into Giants' draft because Godfred has only really played that Morgana. Something we forgot about, we took it for granted almost every single game in both splits. The Jax ban did not happen, and Whirlip says, why not? It fits its style, honestly. Whether he does it on Shivana or Jax, he does it a little better on Jax. It's just that mm -hmm. split push pressure that allows Giants to scale into the mid game. However, the Unicorns don't leave it open without having a counter ready, so we could, or at least should assume that they have something ready uh, to deal with it, whether it's just a passive Maokai played and scale and go for these crazy team fights, or a better 2v2, find something that opens up. Rek'Sai Jax isn't the strongest 2v2. Nidalee Jax would have been brutal. That's something you always have to keep in mind when you look at these drafts. Not only team compositions, but also how do they work in fewer numbers. And that's something you always look at for top lane and jungle. If they have a stronger duel, then they can transition into vision control. Interesting to see what jungle pick, or what it's going to be here in the end for Power of Evil. We have Gragas Maokai if they find that Jax. Uh, comfort picks all around then. They could go for that. Power of Evil on Syndra. Mm -hmm. Not sure if this is back to the roots or just whether he got hit too hard in champion pool and he has nothing left. 
That's a bit of a debate, right? Does he think this champion is really good here? Or is he just the best out of worst options? Yeah, that's really always the question you got to ask when they pull out something that's, you know, this perceived comfort pick for the Unicorns. Because I would have loved to see Azir here. Yeah. I think Azir would have been the best pick, especially if you have a run at you comp, you have a Jax flanking, just use Emperor's Divide, he's out of there. Ruxite tunnels in, he's out of there. You're playing Control Mage against Control Mage. I like it more. I feel he runs the risk of getting Zerged on, and just especially with that Civ ulti. So his positioning will be key and paramount for the Unicorns to take this victory home. Now well, they definitely need to be able to secure this one if they want to guarantee themselves a spot in the playoffs. Remember, if they do win today, they would put themselves up head and shoulders above the middle of the pack to be able to secure that spot. The Giants are not keen on letting that happen as both Sheepy and Lothar shake their hands. Teams get ready to load up onto the Rift. There are some high stakes indeed. Now, why don't yep. you guys tell us who you think is going to walk away with this game? Will it be at Giants at LOL Esports, hashtag GIA win or hashtag UOL win. Why don't you guys hop online and let us know as we get ready to load up onto the rift between these two teams. Big, big, big playoff stuff on the line and we're about to load up onto the rift. We got those team guys for quite a while because we were getting ready to get the camera on you, Pyra. And you as well, Crepo. Now, here we go. We are into the game. It's game number two, week number nine. I always love it when we sell out the LCS studios. A lot of people here make a lot of noise. Especially when they're cheering for their favorite mythical creature. Don't really get to see them that often. No. Unicorns. But when they show up, they show up big. Only at LCS. Let's take a look oh, at these shiny. compositions, because we never really... <laughs> oh. They got their own uh, Christmases early. I suppose so. Anyways, compositions. Like, yeah, well, rightfully so, respected yeah. by a beautiful oh, yeah, man-made sign here. Compositions, so yeah, unicorns. If I see Graves, I, I feel like what I see is damage, that, a lot of damage in the early to mid that falls off later, unless you have continuous peel for him so he can dash in aggressively. However, that's gonna be hard against Giants' lineup. So Graves kind of falls off. Annie, if she doesn't get the insta-stun kill, doesn't really bring much more to the table later in these fights. So I feel Unicorns really need to hit their mid-game spike. Whereas Giants, Jack split push is gonna be interesting if he can outscale. Versus a Maokai. Maokai is traditionally good in late game at holding these pushes. Obviously, he doesn't push too well himself. But yeah, the man to watch is Whirlup. How does he transition, say, 25, 30 minutes? And then how well do Giants use that control with their control mage and Victor? But we'll get there eventually. Right now, they're posturing for early invade. And as I said before, I, I believe Giants will be looking for the lane swap because the 2v2 matchup should be brutal. And I think this is the reverse mind game. Mm -hmm. Giants is doing what teams do when they want to lane swap. They get medium deep wards. Then they go back and they go. They play their bot lane at the side where the deep wards are. That's the way lane swap plays out. But they kind of baited unicorns into calling their lane swap. That's why Hillisang and Vardex are on top right now. They are expecting to find Audrey and Godfred. But Audrey say, nope. You guys can match us in the top lane. We will just go to the bot lane. This is a favorable start for Giants game. You can faint by them as they go ahead and start off on the Krugs. Take a look at the last time these two teams did meet. It was week number five. Remember, Giants, they won that head-to-head. -head. They were able to come up with the victory. Yeah, now in this matchup in the mid lane, you have to remember that spells don't draw minion aggro. Auto attacks do. So these guys can walk up very close to the minions cost, you know, that Syndra ball on the Q or the Victor E to get that laser going. As long as you don't auto attack, you don't draw minion aggro. That's why very often you see them walk into the minions and you're like wondering why they're doing it. And maybe that's what goes wrong if you try this matchup at home. What matters now is who ends up winning the push war, and that should be Pepinero, first to level two. It's a little shield, and if you want to, if you end up in the lane swap, having push in mid lane is very advantageous for your jungle. It will certainly help out. Don't say going pretty deep here to find Whirlib and Frederick, trying to get a little bit of harass on very, very early on. It's gonna be quite dangerous. He does get the stun off, however, just delaying the wolf camp, trying to keep the jungler from getting the levels early. Yeah, Unicares are shifting over to their strong side. Giants started in their weak side jungle with the lane swap. That is kind of a mistake. They got the favor of the lanes, but then they started the weak side. Obviously, trying to catch up right now, but this is a little bad for them because they're running out of camps. More camps here for the Unicorns. As we see, Julius and Chachi are taking down his blue buff. Chachi taking full XP. So they're following farm and CS uh, and experience into their top laner because they know they will have to keep world up down. So good choice here uh, by Giants. Or uh, by Unicorns, rather. Yeah, Unicorns, they're, they're getting themselves off on the right foot with is 3v0 happening. Giants will join and make it 4 down to the bottom side, but uh, that jungle is going to be kept down just a little bit. Frederick, he might get 3 buffed here with Gilius going back to his red. Uh, he wants to get that Grump right now, 3v0 traditionally, but as, I, as we said before, Giants, 
Kind of ran out of the camps because they started at the wrong side of the map. Oh, Gillis is going to catch up that experience. He handed over to Chachi. Likely, we'll see this wave bounce backwards to visit Chachi as well. If you keep him ahead in levels of world, then later on when they match up, that split push that kind of gets pushed away, and then unicorns can force giants into more groups. And I feel that's where the, com the composition does shine to an extent for unicorns. Going to look for power of evil, although he dies. Out of the weak flashes. Oh! Ignites burning, and that's a quick first blood for Power of Evil. You don't gank Power of Evil when you're level two, and he's in the middle lane on Syndra. Fantastic play. I feel he's kind of surprised himself there. He's like, okay, you're tunneling, I can QE, and then he's like, oh wait, this guy is stuck on tower shots. One shot, two shot, well, I will just flash the hook. Ah, oh, beautiful play by PoE, and this, this stunts Giant's growth into the early to mid game. This is big, this is really big for this game. Yeah. Power playing without any fear now. Got himself up a nice little edge, Hillisang. Moving around the side, they're going to try to develop a little bit more vision here on the map. Keep pressing the little advantages they have. Turn and big. Look at this jungle support synergy that we talked yeah, about. Yeah, and this is, this is what I like. Julius is getting comfortable in this team. Hillisang moving in. Find Frederick here. He wants to get an extra camp. He immediately gets denied. Has to move again away from his jungle. This is putting pressure and deep vision. These wards matter so much. Frederick is forced to use his pink ward, you know, defensively. At, you don't want to put that pink ward there at this point in the game. You want to move it up to the next brushing line. Gilius and Hillisang putting good pressure here. Deep wards, I like. It's so much more valuable because you get your information so much sooner. Now they don't have to... Don't move. Don't move. Can't sense you if you don't move. In comes Frederick into the trap, but he gets the knockup anyways. However, I think he was quite surprised by that. Whirlip comes in, looks for Hillisang. Might be able to finish him off, but a flash from the Annie. Hiding in the brush. Godfrey's there. So is Chachi. Hilly's going to go down. They go too deep. There is an answering kill, however, onto Frederick. Now, Unicorn's continuing to try and skirmish through this jungle. Giants Gaming will back off. Fardex loses a bit of farm here, though. His wave on the bottom lane is pushing, so he's denying himself, but good follow-up. They clean up one for one. It almost looks scary. Obviously, if you do that invade, you have to be ready for what's coming. That was kind of comical where Frederick mm. types in. Nobody, none of these guys saw each other coming, so they were initially both surprised as to what was going on. Obviously, Whirl had to use his flash to get over that wall. Hook goes wide. So now the Unicorns are sieging the second tower. Because remember, at the top lane right now, Audrey is farming up. And there's no teleport in Chachi. So nobody can get to that top lane tower. So they kind of want to get a dive here. They want to get a 4v2 scenario. That's why they're pressuring this. Let's see how they juggle this aggro. Not very well, it seems. Can they dive? They have to dive almost. Whirlib's a little bit low, but Frederick is now here for the backup. And a 4v3, the hook is going to land on a minion, so Chachi will not be taken. Just a little bit of poke damage, staying just outside the range of the camp. Play it back. I feel they stopped if, it though. If this was China, Godfrey would have died there. Just straight up. Good for Godfrey, it isn't. Murdered. But Audrey, he's oh, reaping man. the benefits of this. As we see, level six on the top lane, they're trading these starts evenly. Yeah, Unicorn's going. Double stun. Oh, they are going to look for Whirlip. He did get the Counter Strike offer. He's going to. There he goes. Goes in. It looks like it's Gilius. Who's the going low? Chachi's taking the tower shots. Frederick, Gilius, and Whirlip both traded their lives there, and Chachi nearly went down as well. Good hold by Giants, but they couldn't tear through that Counter-Strike. Dodges every auto attack. They needed some more magic damage, but Hillisang had already used both his spells, so a poor target choice, honestly. You're going to get stunned by Jax anyways if you dive. Try and focus somebody else, perhaps. Chachi did do, did do a good job of tanking the tower range at max range, but Whirlup, he's now he's on matching up. Got the Counter-Strike. They got the Rek'Sai around the side, and that's a quick pickup for Godfrey now, securing that kill with one more auto attack. Hook gonna connect on Vardex after he already uses his escape. No flash available. He knows he's gone. Can he get the kill? No, he's going down to Whirlup. And look over in the top lane, we see the remains of what used to be Unicorn's tier one top tower. How do we took that down? He was farming on his own 66 CS right now. He gets that BF sword. The early game AD carry Vardax died on 48 CS. He's stuck on a pickaxe. So this again shifts the power. And Unicorns, they're playing for early mid game. They had to dive immediately. They, ha they had to have a zero hesitation dive there. Or they should have never been in that position. In the end, they set themselves up so telegraphed that Giants could like, formulate a counterplay. The longer it takes to get that dive to happen, to make that tower fall. Obviously, Giants are going to win out because they were getting experience on two lanes, where Unicorns, they were only getting experience on one lane. And that manifests itself in here, over here. Level 3 on Hillisang compared to level 4 on Godfred right now. Now the Unicorns, you mentioned this, telegraphing these plays that they're trying to make so obviously. And we've talked about how they've had some of these shot calling issues in the past. Maybe they're working together now, but you've got to have a little bit of stealth here. Oh. Chachi is going to be able to dodge this hook. Whirlib is pushed back by the Arcane Smash, but it looks like it may be a matter of time. Jillius coming to the rescue. In comes the Jax, gets the Leaf Strike off the barrel to zone. 
Got the slowdown. Whirlib still waiting for the time to leap strike in. Gilius will body slam him, but oh. Godfrey Kitts, <laughs> the Ignite, and the auto, and Frederick Bray seeks him out. And now Gilius, all by himself, will be taking down another kill over to Whirlib. Panic flash by Chachi. He was dead anyways. He was looking for targets to life leech on, but that was his creeps coming his way. And that was that was weird because that mistake that Godfrey made into missing that hook, oh. flash, flash. Whoa, whoa, whoa. All right, the mistake that Godfrey made by not landing that hook actually turned out in his favor in the end. So perhaps it was genius foresight. Don't think so. But uh, right now, let's take a look at the scoreboard. Jax initially was down 2-1-4 and four and at 28 CS. So I'd gladly sack 3 CS. Here we go, on the hunt. Looking for Hillisang. He has his stun. Vardex will throw down the smoke screen. Cover Annie's escape. Giants still not wanting to give up on this one. Still, they maintain themselves a decent little lead, a small amount of gold here as Frederick wave races his way back to the farm. Dragon really hasn't been looked at for both these teams. We're approaching that 10 minute mark. It's still a little bit of time before they typically would like to look that way, but it really has been all about fast pushing these towers, getting these dives off, and trying to out skirmish each other. And putting pressure, that's what it's all about right now. Pepe Nero picked up the blue buff, as we saw earlier. Right now, could put pressure in the middle. Unicorns are down 2,000 gold, so they would be the team that would be looking for that Baron, as you would talk, or the Dragon Water, as you were talking about just now, Pyra. But because they're so far behind, because they made these positional mistakes, they are now stuck in the dark. They're now looking for a pick in the mid lane, it seems. Hilosang will find that pink ward. Will not find that pink ward. Could have found that pink ward. <laughs> Hypothetically speaking, yes. So let's see. Frederick and World, they know where they are right now. Frederick? It's a little bold. Zooming right across the river. Whirlip just running straight into all the members of the Unicorn. It's going to get blown up before he can do a thing. Teleport comes in for Chachi. Big Barrel going to stun barrel. him against the wall for a second. And a collateral damage will take a bite out of Pepe's health bar. What were they thinking there? Yeah, Giants knew. They 100% knew that those people were in that brush. They tried to do the, the fame. Like, they were, they were trying to pull an Oscar. It's where you act as if you don't know and you. You know, conveniently walk next to the bush and you go, oh no, they're still in here, but I have Counter-Strike. What they didn't realize is that they would just get insta-get by the magic damage. They lose their tower in the mid lane. All the momentum, everything we were talking Giants up for, they just kind of threw away. Yeah, Unicorns starting to close that gold gap for themselves here. Get another kill, another couple of kills, and the tower in the middle. Giants going to try to answer this one. Whirlib is already on his way back to mid lane. He's well close to it, and they've got some side waves pushing in their favor, so they may just be able to pull this off. They're looking for a siege right here, and he's still level five, so they're desperately trying to find a tippers. They need power even for the wave clear, but he had to base. They will not get the tower on this wave, and next time, power wheel will be here. This is why you see Chachi moving to the top lane. Giants are greeting for this, however. They really want a tower. They're probably potentially setting up a dive, and they choose the better solution, which is to be a little careful. They really need to get Whirlwind back into the split pushing role. Otherwise, once Hillisang hits level 6, he still has his flash. He is ready with flash tippers. Yeah, it is a little curious that he decides to hug the rest of the team. Now, go. Frederick goes in. They get on the hunt. Whirlwind leap strikes, but he can't quite find the target he's looking for. Power of Evil, however, is going to be found. And Audrey will pick him up quickly. Hit and run operation, and they take a tower on the backside. And 5v4, that would have been rough. 5v3, that's easy done for Giants. So good decision making right there. Problem was, why did Vardex go so early? You can't have both your side lanes being pushed out and defend your middle lane tower. That is too much right now. Good side lane, we, side lane uh, minion wave control from Giants. They say they sent in the top wave to uh, force Chachi to deal with it, but then bot wave was coming in and Vardex wanted that farm. Uh, Giants, they wanted everything. They wanted to defend both side lanes, defend the middle lane tower, and this eventually leads to them getting Dove and Dragon. So the momentum shifts back to Giants. Yet again. Take a look at that, not just the gold grab, but everything in this game is going to probably bounce up and down for a little while here. So Giants in that gold lead a little bit more comfortably, about a thousand and a half as the 13 minute mark approaches on top of that dragon that they've secured for themselves. Unicorns, we've said it a couple of times, they just seem to have issues sticking together mentally. Yeah, they just didn't make the st best strategic calls, and which might indicate that Kikis was part of that conglomerate you know, shot calling operations. Unicorns don't have one shot caller. They have a team, a like a strategy council almost. He's like, guys, what do we do? Let's all vote one by one by one. Democracy. Okay, democracy. Yes, that's it's a pretty big thing where I'm from. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Hail freedom. It doesn't but always yeah. work, I'll admit. Yeah, yeah, it has shown, especially in League of Legends. <laughs> you may want to go towards a dictatorship, but that's a whole different discussion here. <laughs> 
Let's quit the uh, politics. I don't, I don't talk politics. In terms, like in terms of shot calling, it is better to have one shot caller. So unicorns don't have that, and that sometimes manifests in these very disjointed plays. Not really well together. Right now, Chachi and Julius are looking for some vision. So keeping their way into the jungle. Potential rotation down to bot lane Ooh. is possible. Value sapling. Get the spot out. Chachi trying to protect the wards that they've got inside of that. Well, they utilize Bardags on the bottom side with the split push. Yep. No answer just yet. Audrey's coming to intercept, though. Yeah, Audrey wants to wave clear this. The Unicorns did not manage to cut him off, so that wave will be gone swiftly. So no rotation here from the Unicorns. They're playing as if they're setting up for a Dragon right now, but that Dragon obviously went down around two minutes ago, so no real objective in mind. Tier 1 tower is down, is, is down in mid lane. Tier 2 tower is still alive, but you have to beat the wave clear uh, to get there. So they're kind of loitering around. The longer they wait, they pan over to the top lane. That's where Whirlwip is slow pushing out that top lane because he's been in that position for quite a while right now. He is not pressed as much. He could have pushed that out quicker, but he's getting more farm. He slowly wants to get ahead of Chachi while Chachi is doing these ward wars. Giants feel comfortable defending because in the mid lane they have Victor. In the bottom lane they have Audrey who has that spell shield. So with enough vision, they can hold on. Yes, they can. Giants gaming will be able to cover all the side waves around, try to establish even more pressure as those ward wars do continue. Some interesting build stuff too as well. The quick pick up of the Bloodthirster for Audrey, that's not something. I've seen on a Sivir first for a while. Defensive approach right there from Audrey. He says, okay, I don't want to get blown up. I don't want to get AoE Zerg down. And that's what the Unicorn's composition is all about. And if we pan over to Pepe Nero, he's doing the exact same thing. Abyssal first on Victor. Victor kind of outranges. I don't even believe if the Victor E the laser actually gets any use from that, uh, from that Abyssal Scepter. I feel that he will outrange the Abyssal Scepter almost in most Scenarios. He just wants to stay alive if he gets caught, and then he wants to go upgrade the Hexcore. That's why that blue buff that he just picked up that we saw earlier on the screen is so instrumental to him, because that provides him the mana region that he needs to keep clearing his waves. Unicorn's three man up top here. Yildasang, Vardax, and Chachi for the top lane push. This is the, the prelude to a top lane rotation. They want to move. They want to bring the push to Whirlup so he can't split push. Keep him under pressure. See if they can get that tower down. Giants, Once. however, though, are going to try to keep pushing this up the mid try to force the pressure back their way. Wave's pretty even in the bot side, so Unicorns will call the bluff and move back to defend. Once again, the tempo in Giant's favor. Yep, Giant's making the moves. Vardex a little scared in the top lane. Oh. There's a pink ward there, there too. he's got the second one. And pink ward's getting destroyed everywhere. This, this, were, this were the wards that Unicorns set up earlier here. As we see Giants clear them out. Giants have retaken control of the jungle, retaken control of the area around mid lane. Unicorns are hiding in bushes usually for picks. They really want to find that opening. Tibbers into Scatter the Weak and just a whole lot of destruction. But other than that, they're not putting enough pressure. And Giants can stay relatively safe. Mm -hmm. Unicorns still just continuing to try to find that wombo combo. If, if Giants know this, and they, they have to know this, they, they looked at this, at this pick ban phase. They have been moving around and just kind of slipping out of danger most of the time. It's given them the edge with the knowledge that they can just play around the sides. Another Dragon's up in another minute and a half. Giants, they're on the move. They're not going to wait around as they look for Chachi who flashes away. Frederick follows him. Yep, they force the flash on the Maokai, which is great because later on, as you said, that second Dragon that's coming up, that's it's going to be big. Maokai flash W, just rooting down a key target like Pepinero. That's what Unicorns want to do, want to look for that first Dragon. That went down to Giants' side, so that removes the win condition. That is five dragons from Unicorns of Love. Mm -hmm. Puts it farther out of reach, especially. If Giants can take this next one, it will make it even more difficult. However, Unicorns are trying to muscle their way in and around the infamous double ward. Double Spot ward. out of the pink. Oh, one's gone. Two's gone. Almost. Oh! They oh, knew. Stays alive. They knew they needed two wards to get that pink ward. They got it. But yeah, miscommunication there. And that's what you see a lot of these newer teams playing together. Just double warding here and there. Over warding the same area. Unicorns with those wards, though. They're setting up. A play around the dragon. That ward that you saw Hillsang put down in the mid lane is very key because it gives you a lot of early information as to where giants are placing around and allows you to do just what Power Evil did there. You know, hide around the corner, put QE, trying to find somebody even if you don't have minion vision. Giants are pushing back, they're pressuring. And we might see a fight for the second dragon. Both teleports are live. Let's see how these teams approach this fight. Mm -hmm. Warlip does have that flash versus Chachi not having it though. As they find each other up in the top side, Hillisang's got his Tibbers up and ready, primed for the fight if Giants should group up. And knowing this, they're playing a little bit back at the moment. 
Gilius is actually a little out of the action as well, but pings are flying around the backside of the Dragon Pit while Whirlip continues to push his small wave into the tower of Izachachi. Yeah, you can see how this matchup is going to play out already. Already, Chachi is de itemizing defensively, Catalyst into Tabi into Glacial Shroud. He wants to get armor and damage reduction on those auto attacks. So he's going to be the defensive one. Whirlip obviously going to be the aggressor, so he's going to put the pressure. He could even roam down right now. It looks like he's taking red buff on your minimap. Unicorns starting Dragon in return. Pulling it far out of the reach of Frederick and Godfrey should be able to secure this one. They do pop the blue trinket. In comes Frederick looking for the steal. Can El Bandito do it? Fan. He's going to get chunked, and he can't even make it out alive. See, I don't, I don't like that play. If you're going to go bit four people, of which two people are just standing around and watching the steal, then you're doing your shot calling wrong. Flash Divers. Oh, he's able to get three off of this one. On the hunt to escape from the follow-up damage and a box thrown down for good measure. Giants, now they're the ones looking like they're scrambling. Unicorns have come up big in the last 30 seconds. Couple of flashes burned, but there's no follow for the Unicorns. They got the Dragon, they tried to make the pick. So they're engaged down, so they're gonna, they're gonna do the smart thing. They're rotating to get Giants Whirlib off the top lane, and there's no counter pressure from Giants possible, so it all matters whether he escapes right here or not. Void Rush. Frederick, they're looking to try to make a fight out of this one. Godfrey slowed down just a little bit. There's the Counter-Strike. Jillius is the one who's tanking it. Good joke. Onto Tibbers, and a hop, skipping a jump back into the team. Giants have been able to save their top laner. And Baron makes his way to the Rift, but it's way too early for that one. Just want to go back to that Dragon fight. I think it's okay if you want to go for the Tunnel Over Smite Lantern Outplay. One, you don't do it this early, and two, you don't you don't need Siver and Victor watching that play. There's absolutely no reason to have them around. They could be put, putting pressure mid. Hell, they could be moving over to top, join up with Whirlaby and put pressure in the top lane. Obviously, you leave your mid lane exposed, but these are all options you can do, and Giants, they weren't quite sure how they were going to approach that dragon. If they were looking for a fight, they could have rotated Whirlaby down, went for, for good old skirmish. I think it's all right. Not fighting against Unicorns. Obviously, we're still in the mid-game. Very, very mid-game orient, oriented composition here by Unicorns of Love, so... It's good to be wary, but then mm -hmm. plan ahead. And they definitely need to keep themselves on the up and up. One thing we didn't as much mention was the way Giants' play game should play out. If this comp does make it, you know, we're talking 40 minutes in, this, this Victor becomes an insane threat. This Jax, he's already got his Trinity Force, but imagine him with the set more items, and we know what Whirlip can do on this champion. Not to mention, the rest of their team is not too shabby in the late game either. Yeah, definitely in the late game, a good 4-1, potential 1-3-1. Split push can, you can achieve with Frederick being one of the split pushers, and then the only counter to Victor really is hard engage if you catch him off guard because he's a really good control mage. However, Pepinero does have that cleanse. He has the lantern to get away, the added mobility from on the hunt. So if he plays re relatively careful, it will take a lot of hard engage from unicorns to catch him. And that's, that's one thing you'll have to watch later. How well World can split push and how well Pepinero can stay alive in the middle of all that. I think you hit it on the head though with, with how careful can they be because their item choices are definitely indicating that. Mention how defensive it all is. Other than the couple of Silly attempts, or the silly attempt on the dragon, you would say. They have been playing very, very back and not trying to give unicorns too much of an edge. Despite that, it has been fairly bloody, but, you know. Right, any game with soft. unicorns, any game with giants, I think you gotta kinda give that one. They had the right aggression at the right times, overstepped a couple of times, but that goes for both these teams here. How oh, evil, dancing around, looking for a flank of sorts. Hanging out for Frederick right now. Yeah, they found Frederick, they're going for Frederick. See, he's gonna get his tunnel over, however, and he will get away. No Mark tunnel vision on him. He sees them coming. Now they got Brimble. Unicorns making a move around the Baron, see if they can secure some vision up here. Still very, very early to try and look for this one, but it's never too early to start dancing. The problem, the problem is, hang on, Lantern, good juke again by Frederick. Mm -hmm. It's too early them. to get complete vision control over that Baron, and obviously the Giants know that nobody's going to start this Baron without Maokai tanking it. Gilius gets found by Willip. Comes off a little and bit you work. don't have your upgraded trinkets. That's a problem. You can't guarantee yourself complete visual vision denial, which usually means that you just pan it around, wait for a pick somewhere. You you legit wait for somebody to get bored. Like I I want some vision here. I'll take the risk, and then you walk into QE from Syndra. Then you can get snowball on. But Giants with that tremor sense too, they have all the means to play careful. They have so many security blankets to face check. Lantern on the hunt. They just wait, they buy their time because Whirlip's getting bigger and bigger. Oh, Tibbers, it's on to Godfrey. They've got a little damage, not as much as they might have liked. 
The box is down. Unicorns are actually oh, inside of the choke point. Frederick, he's going to get blown up, however, but Unicorns are a little bit battered and bruised at the moment. Chachi trying to front the line as Pepinero is forced back away from this. It is a one for none, but man, it looks like it could be more. Gilius, leap strike onto him. Whirlip will find the pickoff. It's a one for one. Jungler's down on both sides. All right, very interesting exchange here. All teleports come in from both top laners. Whirlip came in and cleaned that up. I feel like Giants could have disengaged as well. They could have made it out alive, but they decided to turn in. Fredic saw the four-man knockup highlight reel, got instigated. But then Whirlip came over and teleported in. Wanted to see in a replay possibly. Oh, oh here we power. Go. He's going a little low out of this one. Whirlip, he's scattered back away, and the tower takes another shot, but Chachi's the one who narrowly avoids being picked off as well. Close calls again. Let's stop looking in the past and see what's happening, what's going on. Whirlip goes for the diver. That could have been crucial. Just that one extra kill, snowballing himself ahead. What I was talking about earlier is I was wondering if Whirlip just sticked in a top lane, if he kept pushing and pushing and pushing. Let's see the teleports when they come in. Maokai lands, Whirlip could just cancel and say, guys, just peel back, sacrifice one. I have top tower at my disposal here. I think that would have been the correct call. Re-engaging is a little bold and it speaks to with the, the chaotic nature that Giants have in their play. Same with Unicorns, you buy into the chaos. That's what's happening here. Whirlip had an open street in top lane to take tier two tower. However, he does pick him up this kill on Gilly, so no harm really done, but a lot of uh, opportunity cost. You know, a lot more could have been achieved in this play. Certainly could have been worse, and, and you could see in that replay that it didn't look like they were all on the same page with Frederick. It took about a second before the rest of the yeah. team re-engaged on top of it. So you can see, you know, both these teams definitely suffering a little bit with still some lingering shot calling doubts. Yeah, but we are in the race for playoffs, and obviously it's very easy to say, hey guys, you gotta work as a team. Gotta do the same thing, but I've, like, we've all been in those games, whether it's yeah. on stage or not, we know how hard that is to work as a team. And Giants working better as a team so far. At least they're committing to these fights. It is better to teleport down and not gain as much uh, potential gain than it is to not teleport and make your team lose the fight 4v5. With that, Dragon's on, set half health. They've Go to the jungle. Gragas on the line. Won't be going for him. Warlib, however, is caught between a few unicorns right here. Tries to get the jump, but he's denied. And Vardax blows him down. Dragon, however, is secured by Giants. They trade their top laner for it. Sacrifice Whirlip. Really? Look at the damage. Yep. This is what we're talking about, Victor. There was no Epistol in range there, I believe, too. Still got the damage. Unicorns, they want to bait the Baron. They're going to find that Scuttle Crab that's right there, and then they realize, yeah, guys, this bait's not going to happen unless they go inside of the pit, but then... They can fake it, though. Look what Power Evil is going to do. He's going to uh, cast it. Get the, get the blue. Yep, that awkward scrying orb. It was good by Power Evil though, casting those uh, little balls left and right as if you're doing it on yeah. Baron, standing outside, acting again. Oh, both teams are definitely trying to get the Oscar for this game for sure. Pepinero takes a little bit of damage, but they will get a catch on Fitachi. Can he go in? He can burn the spell shield of Audrey. Boxes down on Godfrey as well. It's a little late. Health, they get a few cooldowns. That's the problem with Thresh. If you make one mistake on one of your abilities, all the rest will miss. If you put your box down and you expect him to be slow by box and then flay, obviously, if he walks out of your box, it's suddenly your flay when it's two, and then if you have a follow hook ready, then you uh, get to stand in the corner for shame. However, it doesn't really matter, not too much lost. The teams are setting up for this dance around the Baron right here. Vision denial, punish face check. He was saying he knows he has time. Giants are not going to start that Baron all too quickly. It's not like it's going to disappear in seconds, so they can take their time. Especially when you see that Victor E come over the wall, it's indicative that there's a bait going on. They're not actually doing the Baron, because otherwise they will be using their spells on the Baron too. A little bit of mind reading right there. Unicorn say, no, nope, we only need to face check that because we saw people with that one lone ward. Top left of your screen right there. And teams go back to farming their jungle. Mm -hmm. Debate over who takes the wolves. Rillip's back in his natural habitat, split pushing. However, he should probably start looking to go bottom lane as his teleport is about to come up. Be just a few more seconds on that one. So with all the crazy back and forth we had in the early game and a few into the mid, it has more or less evened out. There's there's still a gold lead in favor of Giants. They've still got that one extra dragon, but Unicorns have not backed down on this. And more importantly, they've not really given the Giants a lot of breathing room to make these mistakes. If they, if they do take one bad fight, it can turn on a dime. Yeah, bad fight can turn this entire game around, and that's what the Unicorns are hoping for. We see those Giants are hoping for not to happen. Giants are fine going even as the time progresses. Saber scales beautifully into the late game, both utility and damage-wise. Rillip, we've seen it before, he becomes a threat on that Jack split push. So right now, Unicorn's looking for an opening. Hilosang wants to get that Tibbers down. If he can find it too, we have seen a couple of big ones, but only a couple that haven't really been quite so valuable. 
Chachi has the attention of Warlib, or rather vice versa for the time being. Frederick will just barely not proc the Baron as teams continue to play around the big purple worm. And Chachi being cleared out. is not itemizing full defense. He gets that Righteous Glory because he realizes his main objective will be Harding Age in these fights. Healersang might be left behind by his team here. So he'll be a little weaker in a duel, but he'll be stronger in the team fights, and that's what Unicorns are looking for. These 5v5 team fights with Chachi flanking, connect Twisted Advance to Pepinero, and then as he cleanses, get a W. See Unicorns pushing him for deep vision because obviously Giants have one man down here. Who goes wide? You see this, this natural mid game pacing. Unicorns are progressing the vision into the jungle so eventually they can peel back and go for that Baron Bait. However, they will always have the risk that Whirlup can flank them because we're, that's why Whirlup's pu pushing in the top lane right now to keep that Baron presence. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to get that bot lane presence to get the tower. He just wants to make sure they can always move around the Baron area from both sides, making it impossible for the Unicorns to secure that objective. Again, stalling time. Not only that, their wards are doubly effective too. If people do decide to try to rush up and get a quick grab on Whirlib and give themselves a, a, a number advantage, those wards will not only help keep vision of the Baron, but it'll help him stay safe as well. Yep. So Giants definitely utilizing their vision best they can. Unicorn's trying to do the same thing, but they place quite a few more around that side, which means they won't have as many available on the other parts of the map. Dragon, remember, is only two minutes away now. So even though they've been traded a little bit back and forth, Unicorns will have to think about that soon. And the Unicorns are committing so heavy to this left side of the map that actually left their blue buff exposed for Giants to take one lantern down. So that's one fish check tool down. They spot somebody somewhere, which pumps the mid push. When you see teams do this, Unicorns immediately know that they walked over ward somewhere. His giants are no longer scared of the Baron bait, so they just push in mid lane. This again in turn forces Unicorns to walk and defend. Very step-by-step -step traditional progress. Again, Giants are happy with this. Giants will be able to do a little bit more damage on this tower and looks like finish it off well. The rest of Unicorns weren't able to get there in time. Audrey clearing the wave as well. Good spell shield by Audrey. Oh, Hilly! Hilly's saying found by Whirlip. Flash. He's gonna get a flash for a flash, and Whirlip Ooh, doesn't beat. care that there's damage there. And he's able to get his ward hop out. Oh, but Power goes over the wall after him and takes him down. The Lantern came a bit late. If Whirlip kept running, Lantern shield and Locket would have saved him. However, Hook and the Gilius, they're going to take a huge chunk out of him and knock him all the way down. Audrey, Peppy, post on up. Power of Evil doing the best he can to stave them off this tower attack. Judge is here. Enough flash from Audrey. Frederick able to get back. They've got the hook. They're burning through his health, however. All of a sudden, both teams decide now is the time to fight, and they're battered and bruised. Two for one, all said and done in that. Power of Evil is the reason Unicorn stayed even in his fight. He landed one, two, three, I believe, two-man stuns with that QE combo, and Giants overreach a little bit for that support kill. If the support already burns their flash, why chase over blind? So you have to get out. Whirlup a little greedy. Ends up costing him his life. Something a mistake a lot of players make is they, when they see a flash, they want to match it and get the kill, but in your head, if you analyze what do you just get, you just got something to flash for free, they're 20%, they have to base. You can put pressure in the top lane, you know. You can, you're still a, a fully functioning resource with a defensive summoner if you get caught. Why use that to go into the darkness to pick up a support kill? Yeah, and then he had another chance to get out, but didn't quite see the lantern at the exact same moment. Unicorns position themselves around the Baron. This time there are no Giants wards, and Giants are backing away. Frederick too low to really do much. He's got his ultimate up, but he may not get back in time. Giants are slowly Choke reacting right to here. Teleport up. Let's see if Godfrey can make it happen as Whirlib moves away, just gets Tibbers, and Chachi jumps on him immediately, trying to unleash the power. Frederick will get a massive knock up on the team, and Tibbers is the one who's hooked in. The barrel will knock Frederick back away, and the Baron is reset. Unicorns, I feel like they didn't necessarily need to peel off at the moment they did. Yeah, they were just so afraid of getting clumped up against that Jax coming in, especially when he came in. Tibbers instantly came down from Healer's Tank. Jax managed to jump out, and his jump animation was still stunned. And it was obviously pacing. He's gonna come out on top. However, Giants got to ba uh, Unicorns got to Baron because they out rotated Giants. But because they lose the Baron pressure, they now out rotate the Unicorns and get this tier one tower here or tier three tower. Nearly, almost get it down. So the game of rotations. But Julius is flanking. Maokai Teleport. is flanking. No home guards for the rest of the team. Julius is unable to get away from the hook. However, it's Frederick who gets blown away by Vardags, and Whirlip is a little stunned up for the moment as he tries to get involved in the fight. Pepinero continues to send out the lasers, but Unicorns have managed to find one for none. Godfred, look for more. Godfred stunned up, trying to run away. They pop the Righteous Glory. These fights just aren't ending. And this is why we talk about Victor is such a control mage and so is Power Evil on that on that uh, 
Champion Syndra is the word I'm looking for. I haven't seen it in a while. And this is why you see these teams pacing back and forth, back and forth, trying to catch out each other. Just no full on hard engage, you know, wombo combo. A lot of control. Gotta dodge those stuns, gotta dodge those hooks. Gotta dodge those lasers, because they hurt. Everybody two-stepping everything, and, and everything has been so close. That Baron nearly went down. The tower in mid is slowly going to start recovering its health. This game is, is still very even. However, Giants, they're still increasing the gold lead. It's slow, but they're doing it. And not only that, they're going to get a dragon out of this as well. Yeah, they deny a, possi a possible third dragon later. They get the extra basic movement speed outside of On the Hunt right now, too. So in these fights where you have to two-step, you know, dodge, dip, duck, and dive, and dodge again, I believe Trevor always says. That extra movement speed from that third Baron buff is going to be key. Now Whirlip finally moves into the bottom lane. Giants say, okay, we've hit our mid game. Or our mid to late game. Right now we're going to put, put our uh, foot on the offensive pedal. Let's stop being defensive around the Baron. We've learned that we can deny the Unicorns this. Let's put some pressure force Maokai in the bot lane. Especially without Teleport. This is a favorable situation for Giants. Week 1 we talked about Exodia comps. You know, put them all together and they start working out. Unicorns don't really have one, but it's, it's close. They do better with all their five members combined, I feel, than Giants do. And individually, in the split push, uh, Whirlip does better. He puts that pressure and he can always then peel off floor first, join his teams, while Maokai is still defending that bot lane. If you want to stop a team from comboing, you just got to make sure they're not in the same place. The 1-3-1 one, one definitely accomplishes that. So, a little sideway pressure on the top side. Nobody really there to continue this one, as Giants are going to start looking to group here. Ping's flying, so they know that Godfred and Frederick are hanging around the side, swinging the pixel brush, waiting for the check. Gilius not going to get hooked this time. They will send the boomerang blade flying. Unicorns get a little bit of damage for their trouble, but they find it out. I'm liking Gilius a lot more in his Gragas. Yes, he's died four times, but he's always the first one to face check, and he's pathing left and right, juking quite some hooks. Now, this leaves the mid lane exposed earlier. Whoever baits the Baron leaves their mid lane exposed. That is the name of the game. Unicorns are grouped as five. They have a choke point in front of them. And we'll be able to get away. Nice dodge on the hook. Still have to wait for that next spinning wave to be able to finish off the tower in the middle. And then you push in mid, and then now you can rotate back to Baron. Deny that vision, but set up a potential bait for yourself. In turn, you leave your mid lane exposed. You change places, but at some point, somebody's gonna pull, pull off that face check. Get the control. Mid lane control is very paramount to these baits, otherwise people are gonna step in. QE right combo. Here. He's stunned. They're going to get another stun off on him. He will pull his way in. Godfrey will finally land a hook on a power of evil, but he goes way too far. Gets shut down immediately by power. And Audrey on the hunt with nothing to hunt in a 5v4 situation. Now, Unicorns, will they try to pressure the Baron? Godfrey was listening to Sun41 because it was in too deep. Whirlip gets caught. Yes, he does. And now Whirlip still tanking the line here as Gilius, who takes a little bit too much damage. Giants kiting around, trying to avoid being clumped up in any way, shape, or form, even with the Tibbers down. See if they can get themselves out of danger for now. There's still vision on Baron. This is why the Giants are okay with pacing around. They just want to keep the Unicorns busy because they're playing four against five. They'll not lose their mid lane tower. However, when everybody comes out of the base, Giants could turn this around into a favorable fight again because they're all full HP. Unicorns are still chunked from that engage. Unicorns a little bit low to try and manage this one. Hill saying he's backing, but he's sitting on a ward right now. They have to know this is happening. Frederick. After he void rushed his way in, might be able to find a favorable hit onto somebody. Looks for Chachi, gets the knockup, but Audrey and Whirlip are going to be knocked back. Power of Evil jumped on by the Jacks, counterstruck, and now Power on the run gets the Ignite off, trying to finish him off, but he can't do it. Shut down finally by Whirlib as the Unicorns scatter. Unicorns felt confident, false sense of security after they won that initial fight. They took down the support, but everybody else on Giants' side was pretty healthy. Rex side bases, ulties back in. Whirlip was still full HP, and they bought enough time. And it's, they kept Unicorns from basing, and now Giants are looking to take this Baron. Is El Bandido going to get the Baron stolen away from him? Gilius has Flash available. No Flash available, but Smite available. Gilius could decide to body slam his way in. Bardax and Hilly waiting around the side. They'll take a bit of damage. Gravity Field is on. Bardax has to dash away. Baron is low. Baron is secured. Gilius comes in way too late, and he's got no escape. He's popped by Pepinero. Giants did a good job of making their average DPS very low. So it seemed to Unicorns, Baron is going down at this rate. And then they immediately turn on the fire at 2k. They said, okay, everybody use everything and I will smite. <laughs> Julius comes in, the guy, he wants to be the hero. He's imagining the highlight reel. Oh, Gilius stole that Baron, what a player. Comes in empty-handed. Power mid lane goes down now. Can't get the stars in his eyes too early. There's still plenty of game left to play. 38 minutes on the clock. The base of Unicorns has been cracked with this Baron buff.
What will Giants turn their attention to for now? They are pinging the bottom side. However, they've got a big wave of minions to contend with first. Giants, yeah, they want to get more. They want to get an inhibitor. What do they do with five man or the four man split push? Potential one three one split push. Obviously, Baron gets more efficient the more lanes you push because of that minion buff. So one three one could be a solution for the Giants here. However, then you're very prone to a hard engage in the mid lane. So four one is the the safer nephew of the one three one. Looking at these mid lanes, so much damage. Even though Pepinero itemized defensively initially, he then went out full AP build right after. He skipped the mana region on the Necro uh, Merlinomicon, so he has less mana region. A CDR overhaul, but just a lot of raw damage. Another power of evil. He got that CDR coming in, so he does more damage more often. But full squish, and we saw it right there. If Whirlwind connects to stun, it's over. Allowing them to come to him. Seemingly knew this too. Still sitting on those basic boots. Pepinero has not been troubled by this whatsoever. Whirlip goes in, maybe a little deep himself, gets the counter strike. Buck trying the lantern, to block the lantern. lantern. Keep it away, keep it away, knock him away. He can't deal with four unicorns at once, although he nearly managed at least to take down one. So Giants, they were looking for the 4-1, but they set it up sloppily. Unicorns, good catch. Oh, Chaos Storm onto Chachi. He's able to walk it out though. 25 seconds on this next dragon, that's gonna be big. And they lose Whirlip, he does have teleport available. Get the flash card. He's gonna dash. He's into tower range, but he might be dead already. One more boomerang, that's all they need. And they can shut down this tower as well. Frederick's just gonna tank it up. They can continue doing this one, Crapo. Greed on both sides of the equation right here, but good opening move from Giants. That's the mark that you're a comfortable team. If you can engage 4v5, even when you're a man down, and just make a pick, even it out. Great move there, fantastic. Um, yeah, shot calling right there. Good move. This secures them the dragon, you see on the screen. This puts the unicorns on the back foot. Not only are they slowly getting outscaled this game, they are now facing the fourth dragon in the game at 40 minutes. So at 46 minutes, we could potentially be looking at Aspect. And we say right there, 40 minutes on the, on the game. This is not where unicorns want to be with their composition at this point in time. And only with one dragon in their pockets, we mentioned that one of those win conditions would be to be able to secure that aspect, but it is giants that are getting closer and closer to that. Continuing to expand this goal lead ever so slowly, it's crept up to about 5,000, but giants it's clearly actually, in the lead in those boxes. It's actually quite interesting that Vardex went for the BT, I believe third item, and he's now, only now building his Lost Whisper. He's going for a late spike, so it's it's a mismatch. Power Evil is going full offense because he knows he's going to get outscaled, but then his AD carry is going full defense, like not full defensive, but as defensive as the third item AD carry build can be, apart from perhaps QSS. I would like to see an earlier Lost Whisper on that Graves. Could have turned around these fights, potentially. Round of work. They're just going to grab the red buff away. Fresh hooks come in handy for more than just grabbing enemy team. And now it looks like we might be in for a couple of trades here, Krepo. I believe we might be I getting a picture in picture race. camera coming up soon, because this is a base race. Do you really want to race against a Jax, though? That is the question. Because they can send down Victor, and Victor can immediately clean these waves if he bases. All he needs to do is get rid of the minions. Jax is so much quicker when it comes to these Nexus Towers. Chachi based. They got one sent back. The Inhibitor's taken oh. from the top. One eating out. Unicorns, they're calling the bluff here. Chachi is here. Gilius is here. But there are no Giants to defend their own base. This one Nexus turret. They've got a member lost already. Unicorn's gonna win this? He might be able to pull it off after being so far behind. The bait was taken. Oh my the god! It's unicorns! Unicorns of love! Can they do it? Trampling down the Giants! Yes, they can! Why would you do this? Giants, just send somebody back, please. Just one guy, clear the minions. That's it, Victor. Clear minions, GG. They're backdooring two Nexus Towers right now. I can't believe they just pulled that off. You saw the value, right? If you base trace a one defending member, adds so much more because he's de dealing with those minions, adding an extra two, 3,000 HP that you have to chew ch through, otherwise he's going to repetitively use his abilities. Unicorns get a free way there because they keep their stronger tower pushers at the enemy Nexus. I did not expect to see this. No, not at all. Just send Victor back. Love. They had this better split push with the Jacks. They they kept their heads at the end of this. So this is this is the big thing. We talked about unicorns and how they seem to have had some trouble deciding what plays to fully commit to. But Giants, at the end, don't think of their own base, and they get out raced. So game one, Copenhagen Wolves have to win to stay in there. What did they do? Backdoor split with Shen. Game two, Unicorns seem to be losing. It's Giants. They say, nope. Base race. 
Sheepy must be happy. Like the whole team has got to be now. With that win, they lock themselves up a fourth place spot. That was ahead of everybody. That's some genius shot calling right there. Oh, yeah. Because that, you can, you can talk about how they're not on the same page, but at the end, to you know how many members you send back, and they send back their two tanks. And it's smart when you like, start thinking about it. You know, why would you do that? Maokai is the king disruptor, obviously. And he can even base and then teleport back if he wants to. And you have Gilius coming in with Gragas, another really good disruption champion. And at the other side, yes, Victor does has a lot of AP, so it's all attacks on the team for their 17th straight win of the split as they face SK Gaming. Do you believe him? We never, we don't think about it, the streak. <sighs> yeah. I mean, he said it was the main priority, so they do think about it, just not, you know, not all the right. first thing. Okay, well, here Fnatic is up against SK Gaming. Well, despite the Wolves winning earlier today, SK can lock in the Wolves into auto relegation if they manage to pick up one win here versus uh, Good Fnatic. Luck. Good luck with that. Last week, they did go one and one. They won actually very convincingly versus the Unicorns of Love with a, a poke comp style and Svenskeren going really hard on Nidalee and basically, well, carrying a, a big part of that game. Cyanide, what is, have been your impressions of Svenskeren this split? I think Svenskeren is like a really hit or miss player. Like, he has these times when he's terrible and then when he's really good. And this split, he's been kind of like some games he's really good and some games he's not. Like. But in his defense, he's like one of these junglers in Europe that we don't have a lot that can solo carry a game. Like if he has a good early game with Lee Sin or Nidalee, then he normally will carry that game. Like you. Yeah. Because <laughs> he was obviously known for his Lee Sin. Off I mean, it. that's well, that was your main champion, right? Tell yeah. me about your Lee Sin. <laughs> no, needless to say, I was the best Lee Sin in the world. But <laughs> those times are over yeah. now. Anyway, anyway, anyway. <laughs> so for SK Gaming, you are 100% correct though. Sven is going to often... Uh, well, he is often the main carry, he often needs to be the main carry because one of the problems for, for SK is they run these double carry setups where Freddy's on a big tank, you know, even Svenskan often, while he has a good early game, will have to build tank on like Lee Sin later. So it's about the two carries instead for the team. And I don't feel like they're consistently good enough. But the following day, they faced Origin. We have a replay, we can just show it already, which is highlighting some of the problems for SK Gaming in this split here. It's a great setup from Svenskan. They take down Nils as well in the start. So like, this is basically the perfect start for you. But what we have to notice is how poorly SK Gaming is able to deal damage after that first kill and how hard it is for them to get in proper positions. In the end, Source comes in and he cleans up the fight. Now, the reason we're showing this is because we want to rerun the whole thing. And, and this replay. This time, yeah, we're going to replay the replay to show the damage done by all the champions here from Origin and from SK Gaming. So we can just start rolling the clip. And what we have to notice is also Origin is running this triple threat setup. So even if one of your carries goes down, there are other people who can pick up the slack. And then also Virus is going to be extremely overpowered, which you're going to see later on in terms of damage. Anyway, see it engage again. Beautiful setup from Svenskan. A lot of damage done in the start from your Victor, from your Lee Sin. This is a good start for SK. But then notice how the damage seems to stop outside of the Victor AoE damage. Candy Panda only gets a few hits off. Source is now joining. The reason we're pausing is notice the two top laners joining the fight. Freddy obviously on, on a mini NAR, so he can't do a whole lot. But then this carry top laner in Source on Rumble coming in and just notice his damage and how he can make up for the fact they lost the carry in the early game because they're running triple threat on Origin side. Let's roll the clip and just notice the damage from Soas. This is what turns the fight around. Candy Panda ends up getting out DPS by the Rumble, even though he was in the fight from the start. And this has been such a problem for SK. They're always trying to set up these two Fire, carries here. Yeah, I mean, that's the point. Virus as well is, is doing a lot of damage. But it's so hard for SK with these double tanks to get proper damage in late game team fights. We've seen it again and again and again. Again, because I don't feel like the carries they have on the team are consistent enough. I think they have fantastic highs, but also fairly low lows. Yeah, I feel like uh, they really need Fox to step up in these games. Like a lot of the games SK wins is also because like Fox gets ahead and he does really well, or then Svenskeren just solo carries the game. And I feel like Candy Panda really hasn't been stepping up this uh, split that much. And like losing Forgiven was like a huge strike to them because Forgiven was one of these guys that you could always rely on him to do damage and do good. Yeah, they're all going to have to step up today if they want to beat Fnatic. And looking at Fnatic, just two wins to reach the 18 and 0, the dream. Um, leads us to look at which Fnatic we have been seeing the last couple of weeks. They have been getting behind in some games a little bit more than in the beginning of the split. And I want to wonder how much of that comes down to experimentation per se, because if you look at the record, there haven't been that many super crazy things. I mean, we've seen, no, I'm. 
it's mainly been like Huni picks in the top lane. We've seen Jarvan, we saw the Riven pick coming in. So yes, they're definitely trying out some new things for sure. In terms of playstyle, we don't know how much it's, it's them changing and then maybe, you know, again, as, as you said, relaxing a little bit. I mean, I've never really been on, a, on that massive winning streak, so I don't know what to do. I know you've been yeah. on some. Like, do you start normally just picking up new champions and like maybe fool around a little bit? No, well, I've never been on a 16-0 streak, on, uh, <laughs> unfortunately. But so, not really. Like, yeah, you can try some new stuff if, like, you, it's sure that you like. It's obviously sure that they will end first and then uh, right now. So they can, they have some room to try new stuff, like Huni is, as you mentioned. But I still think they are really, really wanting to get that, get that 18-0 because that's like legendary. Yeah, and you having played with Reckless and Yellow Star, you don't really see them going in that mindset of like, oh, okay, let's try new things. No, I just see them like win, 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 win. Super try hard to get yeah. the same impression as well. Well, we will see in this game. Everything is just about ready on stage. So let's hand it over to Pyrotechnics and Crepo again out to the rift. Thank you, Shox. Where the teams are about to load up for picks and bands. Let's take a look at the starting lineup. For the 5 and 11 SK Gaming, of course, it will be Freddy122 in the top lane. Jungler is Sven Skaren. Mid lane, Fox, AD, Candy Panda, the support, and Raided, and their coach, Lukashenka. Now, we're going to go ahead and take a look at the other side. That's Fnatic. Remember, haven't lost a game just yet. Let's we'll take a look at them. That is going to be Huni in the top lane, Rain over in the jungle, Feb in the mid, Reckless AD carry. Support is Yellowstar, and their coach is Daylor. Yeah, and looking at this game, SK came into this weekend pretty comfortably. Like, all right, guys, the Wolves, they got to win last week, but it was skirmish heavy. They need to win two more games. That is so unlikely to happen. Yes, we play Fnatic, you know, we might, you know, just pack this for the next day. But now they're looking at, on paper, a guaranteed loss. The Wolves just put some pressure on them. So that's in their heads right now because they need to get one win. Or eventually, if the Wolves keep winning, they'll be tied for auto relegation. That's not a spot you want to be in. Whereas Fnatic, they're playing with full freedom as we're heading into champs like pretty soon. Oh, yeah. They they don't really need to do anything. They've guaranteed the first slot in playoffs already. They did that last week. With four games remaining, Fnatic was the first place going into playoffs already. All right, for them, it really doesn't mean too much other than just to play around with what the final standings will be. Rise, Sivir, both banned out as SK on the blue side will also take away the Alistar. What does Fnatic answer with? They can definitely experiment a lot more than we really have been seeing so far. Just been Huni in that top lane with some different stuff. And obviously, we're not looking at <laughs> Unicorns and SK's old team comps. I do believe that was the matchup they played. And that champion there that you see, Lulu, is such a staple for SK Gaming. And they like they really like running that. And last time, they actually did pretty well against Fnatic with that, if I recall correctly. And SK Gaming. They're banning out the Rise, they're banning out the Alistair, so that's one champion away from Yellow Star. One key champion gone from Huni, but you can't ban him out anyways. Looks like SK is gonna try it. It's like we'll just we'll just ease the pain, you know? This is a this is a painkiller right now. What you do when you ban out two champions of Huni, say okay, just give me something. Just give me something for the pain and then please let it stop because Huni has an endless champion pool, so really targeting him too much isn't really gonna help you. To get rid of the Alistar, so Bora or Yellow Star rather. I will have to play something different. Usually goes for Janna. A lot of these scenarios where you can just play defensive peel for his teammates. Fnatic don't want to get cheesed. And by cheese, I mean just an innovative pick in the top lane, obviously. Tom Kench gets removed out of the pool. Freddy, <laughs> he's having a laugh. He's laughing. He's like, yeah, I played, I played this champion in solo queue. You will not draw a band success. All right. Oh wow. He's gonna lock in a quick Corky though. I mean, no, this is with Callista up. With Callista up, transition Corky. Either he's making his pick into number two position, or Candy Panda doesn't feel comfortable carrying with it. Either way, Fnatic. Will they pick up the Callista eventually? Probably not on this rotation. This is usually where Rainover gets his pick of the litter. No jungle bans targeted. I like that. That's what SK did wrong at the start of the split. They kind of dug themselves a hole they couldn't crawl out of jungle pick wise. And Rainover usually. When he has this many options, he kind of doesn't like picking champions. Sometimes he will just go for Olaf. Mm -hmm. Obviously, don't have the Sivir to help that composition run out. So, all of Fnatic members might be saying, hey, I want to wait a minute my pick. I want to pick later. I want to pick later. So, who will lock in here? Traditionally, you might see a support come out and, yeah, maybe a jungler. Yeah, and, and he has really liked this Rek'Sai more than anybody else. I think also the Tristana, perfectly fine. We've been seeing a little bit more of it in play. Uh, so, no Callista this time around. Reckless says, all right, I'll get some practice on somebody else. But for SK's side, this Corky, I mean, technically it's got a better win rate for, for Candy Panda than the Callista does, but it does speak that he doesn't really prefer to play that, or at least he doesn't think it's going to work well with the team. And Reckless with that Tristana pick does set him up for a counter to potential Corky mid, because Corky mid means you will run Callista bot, and Callista bot is very bad into Tristana. 
Not that that's going to happen. I just want to throw that hey, out there. It's always possible. We've I seen Winter's Tough today, that's for sure. I do like Tristan as a champion. I think she's kind of underrated and underplayed right now. She has a lot of potential for raw damage on lane. Mm -hmm. She was probably one of the few kills that I can still see Soul killing or, or 2v2 killing lanes. Really, because you have that offensive jump and then combine that maybe with a Thresh, then you can jump in offensively, Lantern out defensively if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go Janna Tristana, we might see a very turret push heavy approach from Fnatic coming out. That wrecks towers. It just tears right through them. And it's also a safe lane to play into when SK Gaming likely will play. Corky Lu is just AFK shove almost. Just push, 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 poke. No raw all in damage. So playing Janna Tristan to that might facilitate that. Might be something we will see Borap, a uh, yellow star pick up here. <laughs> was calling him by his first name. Everyone's known for now, but yeah. Because we go way back, but yeah. I think that would be a good pick here. Then they have double peel from Janna Rek'Sai, and they can build more poke around that and just play full on meta poke. Mm -hmm. SK definitely going back to a few old favorites. This this Lulu choice, it has been N-rated, I would say signature champion, but he had been moving away from it to go to the Shen, of course, with that band away. Kind of a no-brainer to pick it up at this point. We don't know Fnatic's support, but if they'd wanted to take that away, even seen it in the top lane a few times when Huni had been exorbitantly banned, they sent it on him. Yeah, Although they do have their pick of it. I mean, this time they're really, there hasn't really been anything targeting at them, which is something that is new for this Fnatic squad. And SK, you know, they just don't think they can necessarily take anyone off the board, so they don't try. Yeah. Oh, four out of five right. wins on SK Gaming are with that Lulu pick. There's something a bit different. For SK Gaming, but... As I was saying, Fnatic can beautifully round out this composition with Poke and Peel. They say, no, we're trying something different. This is looking to be a top lane trundle, which is very good into tanks. Obviously, because you can steal their uh, their resistances, make them squishy, and it split pushes pretty well. Doesn't really team fight all, team fight all that great, nor does Fizz. Wondering if any of these champions is just a, a weird support, kind of, because I, I don't see the reason to reveal both. Because the only champion that I can I can see that you really want to play after this might still be that Janna for disengage. However, if you're going to go into a 1-3-1, one, one, they're holding the support position for Yellow Star. Well, let's assume it's not Trundle support. Let's assume it's not Fizz support, which is so unlikely. This means Fizz will go into the mid lane. Blind pick It's kind of like Aurelia. I want to dive in, but you have yeah. no exit strategy. I used to be played in mid lane a lot back in the day when AP Fizz was just a strong tabs, was a big advocate of that. And then SK, they're running their composition full meta. They have a tank in the top lane. They have Lulu to buff up that tank, which they always have. They have two carries, which they always have. One of them is now 80 mid, which is great because Corky is otherwise too AP heavy. So they have a good mix of damage. All in all, a very meta composition. The only risk they run is that they're running two damage threats. And if SK get behind when they do that, they have low damage in fights. Fnatic, on the other hand, are going for a full on split push composition here. They may just be able to do it. I am surprised that SK did decide to opt for that Maokai given what they will be facing in that lane. And we were talking about it all this last week that SK, they are one of these teams that really only is running these two threat compositions and it it can continue to punish them here. Oh, this could be Jarvis support for an all-in lane. Mm -hmm. uh, let's not talk hovers just yet. Right, let's well, talk wait, the remaining wait, wait champions. Fizz top or Trundle top both two. Oh, one of them support. There we go. I'm just his support. Wait, wait, or is it? No, no, I'm just not gonna make any judgments. Yeah, I have Trundle support. All right, so we won't be facing off. Here. So Trundle support, if it ends up being that, let's just theorize why one would play that. The pillar is disengage and peel because people get stuck there. It is also a form of engaged setup. If you pillar near a Jace, after he uses his gate, he gets slowed a bit, then he gets stuck, so he might be getting engaged upon. Fizz does incredibly well into Maokai over in LPL. It was used to be picked a lot. It was Cinderhulk Fizz at first. Mm -hmm. uh, later on, now we're bringing the Ignite back, so it's full on damage Fizz. So you definitely want to see a lane swap from SK come out to keep that Fizz down on the wraps because Ignite on Huni. We passed the 20 seconds mark, so Yellow Star is playing a support that can neutralize tanks into a team, SK Gaming, that usually runs double tank composition. So in that sense, it could offer some uh, potential because Yellow Star as a support, you say Trundle is not tanky. But because he can leech those resistances from people that build pure tank, like that Maokai, you can actually get pretty tanky in fights yourself and also neutralize that threat and then allow your, your skirmishers to get on top. Huni especially, he will also get the help 
from Febin on that Twisted Fate. I will talk about this later. Let's just introduce we'll get it into the, game. the yeah. game first, and then we can go back to these compositions. All right, guys, you know the drill. Hashtag SK win or hashtag FNC win. If you think Fnatic is going to continue this streak 17 games in a row, or if you think SK can shut it down, I just want to know what the surprise Trump support is going to do. So Let's in get under the terms rest, of individual matchups, I don't know how the first few levels go, but later on, level, level four or five, Fizz, as the crowd is cheering for Fnatic. I don't very, think they're going to stop, right? Very peculiar cover stock. I'll give him five seconds. I'll go back to my uh, analysis. Fizz should win against Maokai, so you usually want to swap away from him. However, Corky Lu have the advantage against Trundle Tristana in the bot lane. I don't think they have the best dueling potential because you can just kite the Trundle all the time. And Tristana is not necessarily known for a, a very strong early game either. They're going to want to have a little bit more time to farm up a little bit. If supports are even in, in extended trades, she does very, very well with that new uh, changed E because every single auto attack you add on, then you can jump on top of all, do extra damage from that explosion. Pretty good all in lane. However, with, sure a, get the hit. with a melee support against double range, against double poke, against AFK push, it will be pretty tricky. But Fnatic will obviously not swap themselves unless they're expecting a swap because Huni doesn't have smite. Oh! Nice job, Yellow Star. Replaces with his own ward. He goes back to base for a minute. Yeah. But it looks like we should be in for a lane swap as Reckless has already gone back, gone up to the top side. They it's don't interesting. want to take on the 2v2. Candy Panda showed. Candy Panda showed very long in the bottom lane, so Fnatic is doing this with the full knowledge of the lane. So they prioritize their bot lane over their top laner. They're saying, okay, we're gonna keep our split push skirmisher fizz down in a double jungle. Facilitate that Tristan and Trundle because otherwise it'll just get destroyed 2v2. Mm -hmm. And trade that up for a third push potential. Obviously, they'll keep the one tank Maokai down in the process. Let's see how much experience Huni picks up here. There's different approaches to do this when he comes a little late. Over in Korea, if you watch SKT, very often Bengi will just sacrifice the first camp entirely to his top laner. Um, Harden then, and then they share the second camp very often too. So he comes up with a very big experience lead. This could be a strategy. Um, coming in for Fnatic as well, just get Huni ahead, you know, sacrifice your jungle, get him ahead in the top lane, facilitate your early game with your bot lane right here. Tristana is good in these denial situations. Kind of peculiar that Freddy's setting this up for himself. He likes doing this traditionally, walking into a lane 2v, 2v1, but usually ends up getting the, the worst half of that exchange, honestly. Yeah, he's not going to do very well at all against this swap up. And, you know, once we get to the later levels, if this continues, Yellow Star will certainly be able to put a hurting on him. Let's take a look back when these guys met. It was all the way back in week number one. Fnatic, obviously, would say they won, but, you know, that's not important right now because it happened so long ago. Back to this game. This Freddy is the exchange. So denied. This is the exchange you're looking for. Pillar on to jump. Perhaps no explosion. Yeah, and Reckless is not skilling. I believe his explosion on his E because he wants to keep this lane frozen, wants to keep it pushing back. If Maokai wants to CS, he throws saplings. Pushes the lane back, and then there is an auto attack reset, I believe, on the Q from Trundle. I want to see Bora, a yellow star, use that more. When he's coming in, level two, they're setting up the, the scout into the dive, potentially, on Freddy, just keeping him down. Obviously, Huni could teleport down to soak up that massive experience on the bottom lane, too. However, he's afraid to do that because he has no idea of where the enemy jungle's fence gun is. So, Fnatic, with a detour, ending up in this 3v0 push, they forced Freddy away. In my opinion, it didn't really work out all that great for him. Yeah, he's he's in a whole lot of trouble right now with Fnatic able to push on this tower. Freddy, we've seen what happens to Maokai's in Europe when they can't get farmed. Yeah, they, he did get farmed. That's the thing, though. While it may look that he has 6 CS against 2 and he got maybe even a little more experience, what they lose is momentum on the tower push. This tower goes down while SK is stacking a slow push on the bottom lane. They haven't even touched the tower yet. Now, will Fnatic make it back in time? We don't know, but they have the first move and the momentum in the lane swap. And not only that, they bounce that wave backwards already for Huni, so he will safely farm a lane that pushes back to him. Look at this tower. This tower is not going down anytime soon. Whereas traditionally, SK Gaming in their Lulu plus Corky lane whittles that tower down over time. It now stays at 90% HP, completely outplayed on the map by Fnatic. Big advantage. Big advantage to them as well. And the 80 carries really don't have that much disparity either. Yeah, it's a 5 CS advantage to Candy Panda. That's about to equalize anyways. He's on his way back to base. Meanwhile, Fox will burn a quick flash to get away from the rain over Febiv and Combo. 
And just pressure. Rainover could have flashed off to her, but they had obviously had no idea where Svenska was, so a little bit of respect still there. They say, that's all we have to do. Burn that flash because Fox still had his cleanse available. We're talking about this last game. You don't necessarily have to flash after whoever you're targeting. If you can get them to burn it, you know within the next few minutes you can come back, pressure them again, grab them. It's but it's been time and time again in this mid lane. Now, Reckless gonna check right into N rated, find a oh little bit of damage there. Candy Panda will get a little bit more on him as he turns his attention to the Lulu. Comes off a bit worse for wear in that case, but he's got a few pots to chuck. It looks very rough for Reckless to take that trade longer, but you have to remember, they just used all their spells. This is a very spell-heavy bot lane, Corky and Lulu. So eventually, once they've used that QE combo on the support and the Corky Q, the longer extended trades are in favor for Reckless. However, Narita does the right thing. He says, well, if you want to keep trading, I will just put Ignite on you. You'll have to opt out. So good trade by the SK Gaming bot lane. Our Fnatic is still that one tower ahead, and Huni, he... Yeah, can farm, get the lane back, even teleports back to his own tower. He's Nobody's denying him. That's CS. Nobody can dive him anymore. So he'll be getting ahead. Now they can play the map again. They're waiting for teleport for teleport to be available in, in the form of Destiny on the Twisted Fate, and then they want to make openings on the side lanes. The nice composition does not want to group at all. They want to make picks. So the man to watch is Febivan right now. Destiny is available. Wherever he goes, that will be where we're sure to follow. So Freddy did manage to get a little bit more CS back for himself. Uh, after all that, when he wasn't dealing with Huni, he had a slow... Uh, farm fest for himself, but after he backs away, Huni's going to trade it back. Just goes back and forth. The teleport advantage is in his favor. However, as you mentioned, now level six, Febivin has Destiny available. If SK try to make a play around Dragon, if they try to get a man advantage, the skirmish could easily go Fnatic's way. The longer this one goes on, Svenskaren gets a ward down in the jungle, but can't get out much else for it. And if you see this bottom lane play out, you see why Fnatic initiated that lane swap because they just get out traded so very easily and melee support on the Yellow Star. Just means you have no trade potential because you have to walk into melee range. And it's just not gonna work out. Rainover is coming back for Fox here though. No real follow-up, just a ward war coming out, keeping Fox pressured in. That's the way to play. Hover your jungler like Rainover's doing right now around mid lane, allowing Fevin to push. That frees him up to destiny to the side lanes. SK is notorious for pushing in the bot lane all the time. Pushing leads to the ability of getting flanked, and we might see an interrupt on the Valkyrie here with the knockup or focus on unrated. Rainover's going in. There's the frozen domain. Yes, tries to flash. They stop it. Another one goes down, and Raiden's the one they target. He's got the explosive on him, and he's going to go down. First blood, and down goes the squid. Ah, oh, this is so beautiful from Rainover. He holds his flash in the mid lane early on in the game because he knows he can get more value out of it. One flash to interrupt the Valkyrie forces double flash, and then it plays out very methodical. You know, Fnatic just chases them down. And Kenny Panda should have probably flashed Valkyrie himself. Get away there. Perfect interrupt. Let's take a look back to the top lane as Huni has found Level six. damage onto Freddy. Thanks to Chum the Waters. Does he need... No, he doesn't. The minions are able to finish it off. And Fnatic plays with these minion waves so damn well. They lose on purpose on bot lane because that's the way to play it. Respectively get pushed in. It allows a flank from Rainover to come in behind over that wall. SK is notorious for pushing all the lanes. However, due to minion wave manipulation and early game experience sharing, Huni hits level six before Freddy does. Instant all in with that ignite, aggressive summoner. Now, Fnatic is playing so well to their strengths, even with this experimental composition. I can't just say that I'm a fan of it, but I'm a fan of them trying. They don't need to play meta game anymore. They've locked in first place spot. They don't really care about this 18 0 as much, allegedly. So they say. So they say. Sure, it would be nice. Now, Fox is going to try to finish off Febvin, who's going to flash Ghost his way out of the area as Yellowstar puts up a pillar. Fox will be able to get away, and Raider was waiting the wings, anyways, but still. Narrowly avoided Febivin. It's his lucky day after all. An early sidestone from Yellowstar. So what does he do? He doesn't run back to his lane on bottom immediately because putting wards around your bot lane is being selfish. Putting wards around the mid lane and deeper into the enemy jungle provides vision for the entire team. Fnatic as a team works so well. My vision. We see Febivin. Logs gold card. This is Destiny. There's no cleanse. Look for Fox. He goes to the skies, but he's going to go back to base. It looks like they just need another card on him. And with the help of a pillar, they get it. Freddy, way too late to finish this one off. Tries to find some extra damage and rate it there, but it is going to be a 2v3. As Freddy goes down, Sven Scarin and unrated on the run. Playful Trickster. Huni, does he have the damage? Jump the waters. Not quite enough. Yellowstar still looking for more. Oh, he Stops the escape route from N rated slowly walking away. Finally gets out. Foul for Freddy and Fox. Two red cards. Fevin pulls out to finish them off. What a what a roam. Again, this is what Huni likes to do. This is reminiscent of Lemon Dogs when they played with. What was his name again? Top laner, Ruin to join. 
The old Lemon Dog top laner. I keep forgetting it. He was supposed going, to do an element. You're going but pretty it... far back. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Zara Zero. That's what I was looking oh, for. Yeah, he yeah. used to love doing this. Push up the lane in the top lane, roam through the river, and assist Nuke Duck in the mid lane. Rain over. All right. No more history oh. lesson. We've got no time. Two flashes to follow Rain over, but he might just get away. There's a big rocket, a hammer shot, and finally Fox will polish him off. History pauses for action, but we can go back because this is the style Fnatic wants to play. Win your lanes 1v1, open yourself up to roams, and then assist 1v2, 3v1, skirmishes. Nobody expected who need to come in their destiny. You know, you know it's available, but then you, there's so many variables that you have to keep in check. This is why river vision is so important and fundamental against compositions that Fnatic is running. You want to see when the tele teleport comes out. You want to see when Twisted Fate walks into the river for the destiny. Vision is everything, especially when you play a style like SK Gaming, where you're so reliant on pushing your lanes. Yeah. And even though that much has been very telegraphed to Fnatic. They've, they've done exceptionally well in being able to punish it. Yes, it's only 4-1 to one in kills. Yes, it's only 10 minutes into the game, but they've got a solid gold lead. And with something that is a little bit different, they've continued to throw SK through a loop. Oh, yeah, Star, I can't believe he's actually making this work. 0-0-3 on Trundle support. First one to level 6. Moby Boots Sidestone doing what a support does. Has that ultimate available to neutralize these tanks, which are Gragas and Maokai on Fnatic. Oh, Booty seen this again. will just go 1v1. Widow without the help oh, of Febivin. Maybe he's going to go 2v1. Freddy's finished off. It's Febivin that gets the kill. Rainover, however, will be equalized by Fox once again, who picks up his second kill. And Rainover lost in rotation right there. This opens up the mid lane tower. Get some of that accelerated shots. I believe Booty could have actually solo Freddy in the top lane, so I'm not sure if he needed that. Destiny. Fnatic losing their mid lane tower. We have to remember this composition has only t TF as wave clear. Oh, Do in the bot lane. Reckless. No he heal. No damage to finish Candy. Minions. He doesn't have a heal. Minions. They're there, but they're not enough. Candy Panda makes the outplay. Peculiar. Not used to seeing that from Reckless over playing his hand. Corky is an incredibly good duelist with that sheen. Multiple parks coming in ah. there. Fnatic. A reckless Rada is very straight in his approach. Yellow Star could cancel the back here. He does. We'll be able to finish him off too. Maybe just a minute. There we go. The bravado in that play. Counting down in seconds. He's not. He's fed. Don't flash out right here. He might be gone. Flash pillar into ignite. To keep yeah. the vision in the brushes. Good play by Yellowstar. And this makes it okay. This makes this mistake from that Reckless just made disappear. And that's what Fnatic does. They cover for each other. Yes, they do. So Yellowstar gets himself a kill. Another Puts deep a ward. A little bit of deep ward down. There's still the turret to contend with, and they don't want to dive Sven Skarin at this point. Rainover and Yellowstar are going to roam a bit together. There's that support jungle synergy that when we talk about the best teams, always have a lot of. They will be able to finish off Crab to set themselves up for an eventual dragon. But just keep yeah, keep watching Yellowstar whenever he wards. He, he very rarely ends up warding defensively because he saves some stacks on that side stone. He puts it at gro uh, the Golems right now, or the Crux as they call right now, one behind Dragon. So there's no opportunity for the jungler to come in. Unspotted. He has to either go to River, there's a ward. Behind Dragon, there's a ward. At the Crux, there's a ward. So very offensive. But yes, you could do this cheaper. Put your ward maybe perhaps in Tribush, but then you had, don't get the freedom to push up like they're doing right now. And this manifests in the, into a safest tower ever. Ooh. Reckless can go low, though. Yeah, Candy Panda can go in. Reckless. But they can do this because they have the vision. They can go this low on these pushes because they know well in advance somebody's coming. The only thing that could stop them is teleport from, be from behind. Thanks, so good at timing. They likely know that it's down on Freddy still, so... I love the way they use their vision. They do certainly have the edge on that. However, SK have found a rare window of opportunity. Try and start this dragon. There's no response. There's no teleport from Uni. The Destiny's up, but there's no one else on the map to be able to do anything about it. And that's because Fnatic base in unison. They know if they go for the tower, the follow-up objective that they lose is dragon. But in this meta game, dragons don't matter all too much. Huni based. Topped up his items, his mana, his HP. He's not split pushing. Raynor is full HP. The bot lane will come back and fill resources. Fevim is in the mid lane, and now Fnatic can put the counter pressure up again. 1-3-1. One, one. Don't let SK Gaming group just make your picks. Yes, indeed. And they have been known to give up a couple dragons early on now and then because they're still able to make it count later on in the game. See what SK is doing here, though. They are sending quite a lot towards this bottom side. Yeah, because of that, because of so many people in the bottom side, Yellow Star, no flash, though. 
He's got Febbin, but he might go down here. Gold card is on. It's immediately going to be cleansed. Yellow Star on the run. Can he get away? No, it's Sven Skarin who will finish him off with a barrel, but he himself is stunned up. Rainover looking to halt the advance. Knocked up. Sven Skarin blown up by Reckless. And now Fox is on the run. Another gold card. He doesn't have another cleanse. And Febbin will pick him up. A two for one. A good sequence of events. SK Gaming tries to group on the bottom lane. Fnatic realized this blue steel over on the left side of the map. Huni split pushing on the left side of the map. Fnatic playing to the strong side. Yes, Red. Yellow Star oversteps a little bit, but he stalls long enough with that ultimate, with that regen coming in, to force the Gragas ulti to come out, and then Fnatic zero hesitation, all in. They know Rainover will go for that play. Huni well, goes wide, but Freddy's gonna trigger. walk into it. Yeah, Freddy's still taking a lot of damage though. Ignites on. However, Huni has to play Vol Trickster out of the way, but Candy Panda senses an opportunity and takes him down. Yeah, Febbin saw what was happening on the map due to Destiny. He said, "Well, Huni, you went too early. You're in. You're in alone, your mate. You're on your own." Just push the mid lane, but yeah, it's just so interesting to see how well Fnatic can turn the tides in those fights. Your support gets cut out, you get two kills for it. Yeah. That usually doesn't happen. And they just back out immediately from that bot lane where SK was surrounding them with four people because they see the plays that are coming, they play around that, they react, and they always get something on the other side of the map. Exactly. Fnatic knows how to take if not advantage, at least something out of every single play they make. This is why they're sitting here at 16-0 in the European LCS, looking to make it 17. Huni, Playful Trickster's away. Sven Skarin and Fox are coming for backable. Yellowstar and Reckless are on the bottom side. Destiny is not available. SK should be able to finish this tower off as the rest of Fnatic have backed away. Yeah, Fnatic will always have to yield this four-man group from SK Gaming. SK Gaming's lineup is too strong grouping, however, 2v1, it usually is very hard to push into a Maokai, but because of the ultimate on Trundle support, it could actually be possible for Freddy to get Dove here. And while SK pick up a tier 1 tower in the top lane, Fnatic redistributing their players around the map gets nets them a uh, tower in the bot lane, but this time it's a tier 2 one. Febbin's also farming mid lane, stealing away the Raptors, so minor advantages left and right here for Fnatic, while SK is forced to group. And obviously this manifests in the gold count. Yeah, it definitely adds up over time. Fnatic have themselves about Four and a half thousand ahead. And that's all with the help of a couple extra towers. They may have given up the Dragon SK, but they do not need it at all. And you see how traditionally whoever gets ahead in these type of games, when there's such a, a clear mismatch between compositions, one likes to group and siege, one likes to do one three one split push. If the one three one gets ahead and keeps the pressure up, it's incredibly hard to break out of that. And this was the fall of the team fight meta game from season two, transitioning into season three very often too. People would group, but because they would put so much time with so many members in one lane. Experience, gold, and resources would be gained in the other lanes, all three at once. And then if you overcommit to killing one guy, the other two lanes would just simply punish you across the map. And it was really the first innovation in League of Legends, and it's it's carried on, and Fnatic is playing well. And they were actually traditionally the team in Europe to master that too. I remember playing against them. Season 3, the old lineup with Yellowstar. Carry, I believe it was. At the time, yeah. Now Fnatic. Moving in, they have their sights set on this second tier in the middle. Mistana just shreds through these like a hot knife. Yellowstar, quick flash to predict the big barrel from Sven. So they will be able to get out, no fuss, no muss, but it did cost them a little bit. That's what they want to do, just find that opening. SK Gaming wants to lock them down, stop that from happening. I think so far ahead, they don't even need to split anymore. They just want to consolidate that last tower. In a 1 3 1, once that last tier 2 1 goes down, you can start playing 4 1. Who need the top 4 in the mid lane? You just want to get those out of turrets. That global goal for your team. Now, SK, this is what they like. There's no pressure yet from Huni. They have teleport and they can siege. They can indeed. However, there is a little bit of wave clear to contend with here. Fnatic do step up to the plate. However, SK have managed to find a little bit of damage on that tower. No one's going back to stop the Huni. He's trying to build a wave up against it. Maybe eventually Freddy will teleport in. There it goes. Teleportless Huni forces a teleport on Freddy. Mid lane gets held on by Fnatic. Very important. Only with. Really, wave clear from Fevon, setting up these creeps for explosive shots from Reckless. This in turn leaves Dragon exposed, but it's still a minute for that Dragon, and it's only in a second one. I don't really care about that. They've got the sideway pressure at the moment. They forced Freddy to teleport. SK are running around trying to catch Fnatic with their pants down, but they're too slippery. It's not just Huni, it's his team across the board. Yeah, definitely. Let's take a look at the items now. We're 18, 19 minutes into the game. The strategy has been laid out. Before we move to items, just look at the vision. How well is Huni being protected in the left side of the map? There's a tunnel for Rexide to get there. Two deep wards, two pink wards. <laughs> a semi-circle of the nine more wards. There's eight, so eight. much vision. They lost one, but that's okay. They lost the ward. So much good vision Fnatic coming out of Fnatic. Covered. 
and that's all over the place. That's because they play double side zone every game almost. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've seen Raynover not build side zone because Vision is so valuable to them and they play so well around it. Look, Raynover uses that tunnel immediately, gets into the enemy jungle. Very deep. This buff has been stolen twice in a row now by Fnatic, and that's what they're doing. They're choking out the life out of SK Gaming. Their only counterplay is group and just Hail Mary. Everyone comfortably max range, steal that away, and SK Gaming waiting for the power spike on their Jace. Gonna get that Muramana Lost Whisper finish now too. A lot of armor pin for that poke. Corky's already past his power spike. Triforce is gone. Maokai is getting tanky, but the longer this game goes on, he will still lose those duels to Fizz. At least the pressure. And you can see that manifesting itself across the map. SK are stretched a little thin here. The dragon might be up for grabs in a moment. As Reckless and Feb oh, rated looking for N-rated, preemptively flashing, avoiding not the shot glass as it hits Febivin in the back. Still, they have a chance now to contest this dragon or at least force SK out into the open. And flash on Lulu doesn't really matter all too much. Fnatic do get a good grasp of where SK is with that destiny. They're sending Huni to base. Let's see if he buys home guards for that teleport or not. Looking for a flank. Fnatic has the positional advantage. SK is grouped though. Dragon, they get the gold card, they look for Candy Panda, should be able to take him down, he's gonna flash right into rain over and get knocked up again. The barrel attempts to push them all back, but not before the support and AD carry are down. Spence Garrett going to the wrong base, he's taken down, and Hooney 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 comes up with a couple more. Beautiful vision control flank from, Fnat uh, from Fnatic here, but that gold card or whatever stunned Candy Panda should never happen. Never allow SK to do that. That's what they do. They find those uh -oh. threats on Fnatic and then eliminate, eliminate them, just like they're eliminating Freddy right here. Yeah, he's not got any way to escape. Febivin will finish him off. Fnatic, we see this week after week. Once they turn on the pressure, it's a scary sight. And it's Seek and Destroyer here. Flash gold card on Candy Panda. That's enough. Reckless goes in. Candy Panda is forced to flash into Rainover, who then unborrows. He held that for so long and then no. A lot of explosive cascades are, are gonna work for you. F SK as a team, they want to keep Fnatic in front of them. If they get flying from multiple angles, it's over. Too much assassination power, especially when Febivin reads that beautifully and flash gold guard aggressively. That's what you gotta do. That's, you gotta realize how you play out these fights. If I flash in and stun the AD carry in a double threat composition, it doesn't even matter if I die. It's a good trade because Fnatic is playing triple threat. What, and one of them even has a reset, so... Yeah. Throwing in your life as TF is definitely the right thing to do. Saving grace here for SK is they didn't give up too many... They didn't give up any objectives to Fnatic in the aftermath of that fight. But it was a close thing, and there's still a lot of pressure on the side. SK is going to go back to the Trident Troop, try to finish off this mid tower, but they're in serious danger of losing out in the top and losing out in the bottom. Huni is dueling it out with Freddy right now. Even though he's under tower, he's just going to try to finish this one off before he takes the damage. Throws on the both. fish. He's going to do it both at the same time, and can he slip his way out? Meanwhile, Reckless still uncontested in this bottom. They've given up a second tier, but they can get so much more. Yeah, that, that second tier tower in the bot was already gone. Second tier in the top is gone now. This allows for you to play 1-3-1 again. You need you need to split push 4-1 kind of to usually open up that top lane tower, but now you can push side lanes and then you can pitch. You can go from left side, right side to force SK to back off that mid lane tower. Meanwhile, Fnatic defended so well in the mid lane with only TF as wave clear. The yeah, star was uh, pillaring the creeps to slow them down, but didn't really help. They lost their T2 mid tower, but they don't really care. Longer lanes are always in favor for TF. Because there are multiple more positions that people can get caught out pushing, especially with the quality of vision control that Fnatic has as a team. The man himself in that mid lane, Febivin, he has had a fantastic game, just able to casually stroll up and finish off a target, grab so many blue buffs. They're making it easy for him, but he's certainly doing a lot of work with what he's got. Definitely so. And looking at Yellow Star, Trundle support, first time in the European LCS, building a locket. Bold statement. So he goes, like he goes Moby Boots sidestone into Locket, purely playing for his team. He neutralizes those enemy tanks by stealing their resistances, shares more resistances to his team too. And then yeah, lets them carry. This is what he does usually. He usually does it by peeling. This time he does it by shock calling. SK completely yielding left side of the map. The, yeah, this is as free as a Baron gets. Yeah, Will they trade it for an inhibitor is the question. That is the only question that matters. Improved recalls are only four seconds now. So we're gonna see improved recalls with the home guards from the Baron and maybe additional home guards too. Two towers traded for this Baron. Will they give up the inhibitor? It looks like that's gonna be the case. Fnatic are racing to try and catch them. The inhibitor goes down, but will they lose a few of their oh, lives? Dead. Fox, he's gonna get knocked up to the skies and taken down by Reckless, looking for even more as Freddy has also melted down and raided, looking. He's still at Sonyas. Finish off, it's gonna be a rainover going around the backside. Fedivin gets his gold.
gold card on. That's a double kill for Huni in the meantime. Bebebin trying to make this his lucky day, and he does. Gets the ace. 25 minutes, not even. Fnatic get a lot off of that one. You almost have to try this as SK Gaming right here. Go for the double tower in him. But they're somewhat stall out the game because you're already so far behind. But look at this. Yellowstar with the home guards. This pillar right here. Two people blocked off, two carries. Huni connects with Fox. He's dead. And now Reckless, he can start playing trampoline. He's going to jump on one guy, then the next. And then Febivan, he does his job again. He always knows what to do. Backs out a little bit, puts on Destiny, and just closes the exit path. Red card damage, slow on Candy Panda. And then he, just, he knows he has Zonia, so he can stall even if he dies right here. Doesn't matter. No problem. Clean up crew, because Huni's still there. Reckless has resets, and, and now Fnatic can just push down bottom lane. Just neutralize that inhibitor they just lost and completely take control of this game. So despite losing that first inhibitor, you can just see this map. It's so red all over the place because Fnatic have not only got the vision control, the side wave control, the jungle control. SK don't have a lot going for him in this one. Yeah, Fox is playing Jace, a poke champion with CDR in the mid lane that relies on blue buffs. He hasn't seen blue buff in the last maybe five, uh, 15 minutes, I believe. Three consecutive ones stolen away. And like, remember, we're only 25 minutes into this game. Yeah. The way you see this map being played out, the amount of towers taken, you know, inhibitors down, Baron's traded. Accelerate Last game, nothing happened until 40 minutes, until people decide to base base. <laughs> Completely different game here from Fnatic. And they're doing it on an interesting number of picks as well. It is nice and refreshing to see them do that. Febivin still standing this score, hasn't been killed this game. Yellowstar, however, might be caught, throws the pillar. Freddy follows him in, but there's a teleport coming in for Huni. They might be able to turn this around. Throws the fish and raided. And Rainover gets knocked back, but Candy Panda gets picked up. The Urchin Strike, Reckless knocks Fox out. And now Freddy tries to make something happen, but he goes down. Reckless resets on his jump, and all of a sudden, it's only Spence Garen, and it may not be for long. They don't need to finish him off. They can go mid. Watch the damage from Febivin this fight. He just finished Ravidon's death cap. In addition to having Zonia's Hourglass and that Lich Bane, he was almost reshotting tanks. He collected one gold card on Candy Panda, and then wild cards came out. Only one Q. Which is like from You're still chasing like from Fizz coming out was enough to finish it off. And Fnatic is just has so it's much bad. damage right now. This game is yeah, it's it's bad, almost not your base. Impossible to come. Yeah, it's bad. wrong base. Huni we set the tower with the for Tricksters once the minions come in. Uh, not deciding to take any risks. Second inhibitor goes down. Don't Two of them it. down. Sven Skaren is taking the scenic route of the Summer's Rift. This is a relatively newish upgrade that we've seen. You know, so nice art, color, palette change. Full of many dangers, though. Full of many dangers. Like, uh, Earth Sharks. Now, usually you let these this happen. This is a duel of junglers. You do not interfere. Well, Yellow, Yellow Star. The memo. He's coming in. Steal those resistances. Oh, that's, down that's just on lame. The oh, Sven. A gentleman's duel is not to be interrupted, Missing even when you have 18-0. Uh, well, well, Reckless joined the party. I think it's going to end pretty soon. Down he goes. Reckless will get a long overdue kill. Disappointed five five. Fnatic. Looks like they do want that victory. All is fair on Summoner's Rift. All is fair. Even Trundle Sport? It, yeah. It's working pretty well this game, I think. 1-116. One, one, Yellow Star is a man of many talents. Dragon's up in another minute. However, SK are on the ropes now. 15,000 gold behind two inhibitors to one. Just a warning for people to... Somebody inevitably is watching this game, sees 1116 on Final Support, it's gonna be like, ah, it's gonna Don't be me. do it. Do not try this at home. If you try this at home, be wary of your laning phase. It's gonna suck. You're gonna, you're gonna cry tears. Find that tanky tank, then steal resistances. Don't run into those fights first, because... Do what, uh, what, always ask yourself, what would Yellowstar do? At this right. point, mid game, late game, whatever it's called. Tonight, 22 to 6 right now. Yeah, 16k ahead. ahead. Wait for the destiny. Wait for that final inhibitor. Something will eventually happen here, and that's going to put SK in a coffin. They are so far behind right now in a composition that relies on grouping. Big wave at the top side. They're going to try to corner and grab somebody off of Fnatic, but it's going to be so hard now that they're finally so far ahead, they just feel that they can safely group. Only one inhibitor remains. It's on the bottom side. Fnatic are making a beeline for it. There's only one tower guarding it, and the rest of SK is coming to try and clear out the top, but they have a job of it. Fnatic, right now, they don't even have to split push anymore. They can just let minions do it for them, group and dive. They can set Febivin in with the Hourglass, go full Messiah. Wafler is not even enough. JSQ is down. This tower is going to melt. They don't need to dive. They've got... 
Reckless on this Tristana, shredding through the tower. The fish is on, Svenskeren gets chomped, tower's taken out, Mooney goes in, Rainover's on the backside, steal those resistances, says Yellowstar, looking for even more, and Raided, blown back by Reckless. Now Hooney, a little low, Candy Panda, he's gonna go down as well. Destiny comes out, Svenskeren, that's his fifth under career death, and that is not gonna make him happy. Febivin on the steps of the fountain, and Fnatic on the steps of 17 wins in a row. Freddy is trying to chase him down, but it looks like it might be his lucky day, and he makes it out yet again. Nexus towers are falling, SK cannot hold back the tide, and Fnatic are one win away from the perfect season. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, we asked ourselves, is Fnatic struggling in the early game? You know, are they really that good? Is Europe just bad? And it just shows that they were experimenting. Uh, they were holding back in a lot of these games because to pick Trundle support, Fist top, this is this is such a risky composition, but it's good to learn how to play this. Because inevitably, one team will play this against you. And the only way to really master composition and defending against it is by playing it yourself. And being a master of, of a 1-3-1 one -one composition as a shock caller, whoever it is, it, whether it's a team, whether it's full on yellow star, is so important heading to Worlds because you need to learn how to play team fight. You need to know how to neutralize team fight. You need to know how to play split push, play around your weaknesses and your strengths. The lane swap went perfectly. Even though Huni prefers to be in lane early, they put him in the jungle, get him the necessary experience, bounce the wave, take a full two advantage against the Corky Lulu, which inevitably would make you lose your laning phase and then sacrifice your tower. So a good read about what they need to get through the early game and then once TF hit 6, it was left, right, center, destiny everywhere. Even if they yield yeah. the mid lane tower, it didn't really matter. Now, Fnatic turned on the heat. They just knew how to play this, not this particular composition. They knew how to play against what everyone agrees has been this very meta setup. SK with their two threats, not nearly enough. They got out rotated. They got not just outplayed, but all across the board. Fnatic. See, that's what, you, that's what you see. Reckless is disappointed because he died to Candy Panda. Yeah. That's the face. Yeah. Where it's One like, death. yeah, yeah, we won, but I should never die there. Doesn't matter right now, because yeah. Fnatic is so good at covering each other's mistakes, but that's what they're doing. They are perfecting a product that they're routinely grinding out with that man on your screen, right? Daylor. Obviously, you never know how much impact he has, but based on assumptions and what we've seen in the Life of Legends tour, to, uh, videos from Fnatic, you know, just watching him on stage, talking to him on stage, he is, is really driving that team home as a, a very mature coach, mm -hmm. bringing the stability this, this yeah. young team really needs. Combined with the efforts from Yellowstar, as this you know, old veteran player, just he's been to every Worlds. Just yeah, such a good he's player. He's on track to go to another one. I mean, at this point, Fnatic, uh, there's still things to improve. There's still a lot to learn for this team, but they're clearly leaps and bounds ahead of the competition. And not just here in Europe. I feel like they can make a very solid run, but that's, that's a story for another time. Yep. Did he actually go to all the Worlds? No, I'm doubting myself. No, no, he did. He did. He was on uh, Against All Authority. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then... Then he was on Millennium and then it went back to Kinsale Authority. Right? It? And Origin. OG and H2K, they're fighting for second place. Obviously, that all important buy in the playoffs. 11 and uh, 5 currently for OG, 10 and 6 for H2K. It hasn't been a flawless couple of weeks for them uh, before this. And we actually took a closer look at both teams and compared their goal differentials at 10 and 20 minutes against that of the entire league to get a better idea of their play styles to split. Yeah, we did. So, to give you an idea of exactly what we're trying to highlight here, this is a goal deal at 10 minutes. Uh, and we just wanted to show just how safe Origin's early game seems to be. They have the most even matchups. That's the big 10 block in the middle in yeah. yellow. Uh, and that means that against their opponents, they're drawing even at 10 minutes. On the other side, H2K have some of the fewest. You see the three on the top side, uh, just that small little block compared to the 10. But you go over to 20 minutes and how does things change? Origin seems to kick it into gear at that 20 minute mark, the big blue block on the bottom one, uh, eight large leads, over 3,000 gold at 20. On the other side though, H2K, they've got this all or nothing. They never go even, but they do end up crushing people. Nine large leads on the top line there for H2K. So certainly a, a big disparity in styles, but they end up at roughly the same place when it comes to that 20 minute mark. Yeah, very interesting, especially H2K going all or nothing. They did have one and three in the last two weeks. So that isn't ideal going into the playoffs. A matchup we wanted to keep an eye on is in the jungle, Lulex versus Amazing, because it seems a lot of times for Lulex, it's definitely if he doesn't do well or if the team doesn't do well, he falls pretty far behind. Yeah, I think uh, 
overall, the, comparing this to junglers, amazing is definitely the more solid choice, and he seems to have more early game impact as well. So I'd say it definitely goes to him. What's your vision on just H2K the last couple of weeks not being able to to find their flow completely? I think they're just facing a small slump in the final hours. Let's see if they'll be able to pick it up for the playoffs. We will see OG 2-2 two and two in the last couple of weeks. And then last week they did pick up that loss versus Gambit, which kind of came out of nowhere as well. Yeah, it certainly did come out of nowhere. But Gambit, uh, when it comes to their, their game plan, they've been throwing people off. And I think Origin were caught a little bit unawares. However, I think they realize how important this game is. When it comes to their path that they have to tread to try and get to Wills, they have to either place first, total out of summer, or get the best placement they can for the regional qualifiers. They don't really have an option of points because H2K and Unicorns are way, way far ahead of them. Yeah, very interesting matchup here. H2K versus OG, that battle for second. And with the stage set, it's time to head over to the casters for our game of the week. Thank you, Sharks. It is time to head to the casters. And there's three of us going to do the tri-cast as we start taking a look at the rosters for H2K. They are looking for revenge over Origin after suffering a defeat to them all the way back in week one. Oda one there, Lulex, Ryu, Hyanan, and Kasing with, of course, probably the man we heard from just before the break. Yeah, and of course, lining up on the red side, we have Origin, we have Source in the top lane, we have Amazing in the jungle, Pekka in the mid lane, Nils is the AD carry, Mithy on support, and Lidoc, we just heard from him before as the coach. The Fisher doing a match intro, finally carrying some weight on this cast. <laughs> I was a little bit nervous, a little bit nervous, you know. So I've been practicing all the names here, mm -hmm. and uh, it was pretty it's tough. It's about though. time, we're in yeah. week nine of the LCS, the Fisher. I mean, normally you do it for me, so I don't have to, right? Well, there you go. Picks and Bands is about to start. This is our game of the week. This is the battle for second place. If Origin win it, they secure second, they get their berth into the semi-final, no matter what. If H2K win, and depending on tomorrow's results, there's the possibility for yeah. a tiebreaker. And a lot of tiebreakers also with some of the other games, but obviously for Origin, with the fact that H2K lost to Copenhagen was last week, they now have the chance to secure that spot. And, uh, Picks and bands already started. I wonder if we're going to see H2K look towards this Varus Rumble, which has been so successful for Origin, and just start banning them away. There's one of them at least. I mean, Rumble is definitely almost first pick worthy in this matchup almost. Oh, yeah. Odo, I'm the fantastic Rumble player. Saw us. Needs it as well to enable their physical poke champions for Peck in the mid lane if they want to have him uh, on a champion where he can have an impact in the mid game, something we haven't seen too often when he plays the control mages. I think putting pressure in terms of AD carry bans is good too because you take out the saber, which you really don't want on H2K, and you can leave them Kalista potentially, and then force them to decide what do you want more, Kalista or Rumble. You see her lower in priority these days, but I, yeah. think she's, I don't think she's number four below Tristana and Corky. I still think she's number two in my opinion. Right, it's just about the playstyle we see very yeah. often. Corky coming in as, as that poke champion. On the Origin side here, they need to make up their mind. Do we want to ban the Rumble, or do we risk H2K first picking it? Because there's still so many junglers open and they just ban it away. So, Kalista first pick from H2K. It's the champion that fell off in priority in recent weeks, but it's popped up today. Yeah, and are we going to see Jace in the mid lane? Because Varus is counterpart 80, 80 poke, you know, and then will we see those, those, those counters, you know, yeah. like Aurelia mid coming out later? Uh, we obviously won't see it in first pick. Uh, almost, you know, Entirely unlikely. <laughs> First rotation origin, maybe not, but then then it starts going back and forth. You know, do you really want to pick it late? Are you going to secure it early? Are you going to give up your mid lane counter pick because you value it so highly? You almost have to go Corky here as an early pick if you want the Jace, because now these top lane picks have been taken away in Rise and Rumble, which would again would allow you to mix up some damage. Yep. Both teams, though, oh well, both teams, H2K looking to the support. Well, support locked in for Kissing. Six games played, six games won. Kasing is undefeated in summer on that champion. Yep, making a name for himself here. And HTK can build anything with Thresh. Thresh is one piece fits all. Origin going for that early Corky. Like you said, the fish show you're angrily shaking your fist. Guys, you can't see it <laughs> so a descriptive manner. Imagine a very frustrated middle-aged man just shaking, ah, those kids these days. I just think this is such an important pick for Origin that I'm surprised H2K valued the Thresh over it. Um, of course, they go Kalista Thresh, fantastic 2v2 lane. That's probably what they're aiming for. This is just exactly what Origin wants to play. And as a team, when they didn't get these mid-game compositions, they have shown weaknesses. That's how they've been in this slump. Yeah, but we've seen how H2K counters a long-range poke control mid. 
They put Ryu on TF and let him TP in behind. This is a much stronger opponent than when they pulled it off last time, but there is a possibility for Ryu yeah. to run that. I mean, it's obviously not the end of the world. Again, Kalista is open, so it's not bad for H2K in that sense. This is a pick we have seen from Ryu quite a few times. Also into something like a Jace, or maybe if we're going to see a Twisted Fate pick coming in for Pekke. Can obviously also swap to top lane. We see Odoamna already changed summoners in case. In response to the Rek'Sai pick from Origin, Lulix just goes Gragas. Traditionally on tier 1, tier 1, old school junglers, but I would have actually liked to see a Nidalee. I think she fits very well into Rek'Sai in terms of aggression. I think she fits well into the poke meta game as well. You can even go Nidalee Jace then. Yeah. So Kay going for a more brawler heavy skirmish type of composition. Except that Lulex has not played any Nidalee at all. Seven games Rek'Sai, seven games Gragas. Nor should he prior to the Rune Glyph switch. Right, we that's go. where Nidalee, Nidalee came to the scene, and I, I would have liked to see her here. Here's the thing though. Lulex is a jungler who has honestly not been very good at applying early pressure. Yeah. So do you want to pick him on a jungler where he has to have a great start? Or do you Gotta just... learn someday, Deficio. Sure, sure. Or do you just want to play it safe, give him the Cinder Hulk, you know, just let him scale up to late game, let him grow up to be a beautiful flower. <laughs> a beautiful not quite flower. Sure. October, Oktoberfest Gragas is not quite the <laughs> flower we I think it's beautiful. Lulu picked up in addition to Shen for Origin. Uh, could be support, could be mid lane as well. Uh, if we go SK's style, you know, then it's Lulu Corky pushing in that bot lane. With a Shen on top, Shen can also yeah. be support flexing everywhere. Yeah. We're almost expected to be top lane Lulu for Soas as a matchup into potential defense, and you just turn it into a farm lane. Mm -hmm. And then again, you try and build around this strong uh, mid game for Origin, also because Soas absolutely hates playing Shen, and he's done for like multiple years. That is true, but Origin flexing more than Deficio at the gym right now, and H2K a little, <laughs> a little flustered. The problem with Origin's comp, as far as I can see, is slightly less damage than what H2K is bringing to the table. This is scary. Well, we're missing the mid lane. Scary. Well, Potentially. we are. We are. Well, we are Pekka does like sitting mid and, and, and farming up and providing yeah. that damage later on. And Origin, they don't really need that damage because they have utility. We see H2K go full on Skirmish. Skirmish 2v2 bot lane with the additional support coming in from Destiny. We have top lane Fizz right now locked in. We did a good 2v2 Fizz Gragas pretty strong. So a lot of carry potential. But once you put all those pieces together, doesn't really, you know, work all that well. And that's the first time that we're seeing Odo Wamne on that top lane Fizz as well. We'll see how he can control that lane. For Origin, I really feel like they need a high damage mid laner here. Or a control mage to just group up yeah. and just secure objective after objective after objective. Right, and Azir and Victor would, would add in everything you need then. You have the wave clear, you have high damage of great scaling coming in, and you're already building for team fighting, so you gotta stick to that. Don't try and match H2K in the 1 3 1 setup here, because that's gonna be so difficult for you to deal with, with the picks you already have logged in. And obviously, anybody out there is going to say, but hey guys, what about so much magic damage? Corky so much magic damage, Lulu and Azir, isn't that a little overboard? You have to still look at H2K side, they're only running one tank. Those compositions, it's okay-ish to run full magic damage into, so Origin definitely will have to be careful. They'll need their Void Staffs later in the game to so you'll penetrate that Locket yeah. uh, aura, so to say, but H2K could have some scaling advantages in that regard. Especially, again, split pushing wise, Fizz is going to be a monster. We know the Kalista in terms of one-on-one -on -one potential, the 2v2 with the Thresh. But as you also uh, mentioned before here, with the, with the magic damage, something we've talked about, obviously, before the show started, with how these compositions that want to teamfight in the mid-game anyway, mm -hmm. the goal is not to go 50 minutes into the game yep. where there is enough magic. Which is no, the goal is to get that big advantage through the dragon fights to stack it up. And if you watch LPL, very often you will see these teams fight around red buff, randomly fi <laughs> five man. I mean, why not? Minutes in the game because you want to get those early fights because you don't want to outscale. Let's see if Origin bring this early aggression to the table though. Historically speaking, when they do, they do well if they get ahead. But if they play slowly to the mid game, this composition may fall flat. Yeah. Origin, if they are behind at 20 minutes, have lost every single game so far. Four out of four games where they're behind 20 minutes, done deal. If they fall behind, guys, the draft is done. It's time to load in as H2K and Origin are fighting for second place in the summer split. Last time we played them, they didn't know exactly what kind of team we were and what we played. So that game, we kind of had them in the pick and ban phase. H2K in full retreat as Peke jumps over the wall. Origin, they're doing everything right all across the map. If they stay like this, if they get nervous from this lose because it's something ca that can affect you, we actually have a lot of chances because they didn't play properly. Origin, they're looking to end it right now. I don't know, we're not in a really good spot right now, but we're just gonna look to focus and try hard. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, we are on the rift. I'm going to ask you to jump on Twitter. Who will take second place or challenge for it? Hashtag H2K win, hashtag OG win. As we can see, the team starting off 40 seconds, fanning themselves out. No indications for early warding, which you've seen from both teams a few times. It's very true, but we need to look at these lanes here because for Origin, Top lane wise, Lulu's gonna do more than find into the fist, especially in the early game, just to turn into a farm lane. The problem is more the bottom lane here, the 2v2 for you with the Shen. is so risky for Origin to opt into. Definitely so. At the same time, Onwana is running Ignite, which tilts these matchups into all in potential. Right. Especially that, when Lulu shows up. That's, that is what you have yeah, to look for. Obviously, better than the Smite. So the 2v2 in that case for H2K is fairly strong, but the early damage, early poke from, from, from Source on this Lulu here, he should always be able to have the advantage, at least before the 2v2 starts in that sense. So I believe that's why Origin is okay taking the standard lanes, and we might just see Amazing play around this non, a no flash top laner and see if Origin can bully that out the 2v2 and use that early advantage they could have with the Lulu. Yeah, I want to see one of these waves meet after this double camp uh, taken by both these teams. What approach is Origin's bot lane going to take? Are you going to lose gracefully, which means tanking all attacks and forcing lane push? Or are you going to race for level 2? Because if you land that taunt, it's very easy to land that uh, Corky Q on yeah. top of Kalista and you, you know, win an initial trade. That's really the interesting thing about Shen support. You have great early stats, like, like the, the first oh. few levels as well. So I had to interrupt you there. That was, those were beautiful golems. See how they're spaced out. Now Second you have play. It. Second play finishes off small golem. This is what dreams are made of. And because of that, they are first in the race to level two. And everyone lost one melee minion in the start of this. So Mithy and Nils as well have to just respect the fact they're already losing to double ranged in the early trade. But yeah, Shen, early levels, great base stats for him. The first few ranks he gets in his abilities, he can use, but he needs to all in. In that case, he has to taunt forward with the passive and Q, and that's where it becomes super tricky. One bad trade, and you basically chunk down. And in the mid lane, the first few levels, you don't really expect the jungler, so Ryo is sacrificing some trades for push advantage. So he wants pressure, and this could open up, you know, Ryo for an easier invade and to find maybe amazing. And this is what we see so often with Twisted Fate players. What you do is you trade with the red card in the early game, like level one, because you want to try and push the wave in. Victor, though, once he gets like a few ranks in his E, he's gonna start shoving it back very easily. And then Origin has to do a fantastic job keeping wards around his mid lane to keep track of Ryu, to stop that potential snowball that can happen in the two side lanes with Kalista and Fizz. I'm looking forward to seeing how these side lanes start to impact the rest of the game and consider all of the globals in this game. Rek'Sai and Shen on the side of Origin with the teleport. Obviously for HTK, teleport Fizz and the Twisted Fate. So when a party happens in the next five minutes, everyone is invited. Now looking at the pathing here, Lulek started on the left side of his jungle. So that indicates that he's not going to play around Oduwamna early. So he comes out on the right side for the potential counter ganking in mid lane. But if that didn't really happen, then he... Obviously, Oduwamna would be in a little trouble. Hook goes on Neil's play. Passive from Kalista, good. Good trade. We see the Shadow Dash taunt coming out. Yarnan getting a lot of auto attacks down. And this Kalista into Corky matchup. In favor of Hyanan and Kasing, obviously the level advantage, catching a good hook as well. You will get slapped around in that lane. All that matters is whether you can get the CS or not. And we have to look at how well Niels can CS under tower. So there's some of your stats on the games. Niels Corky, five played. To Fisher, you mentioned in Picks and Bands how important it was for Origin to get that sort of mid-game power champion. But something that yeah. Origin have made mistakes with this champion in the past, they wait for Triforce, and only when Triforce is done do they decide to actually begin playing the game. Right, and the reason that can be bad for Origin is you get that first dragon around 15, 16 minutes, and then suddenly this snowball, we can almost call yep. it, towards five dragons is very delayed for them. It allows HK then to scale up longer. It removes Aspect as a win condition. If you go yep. for that very late dragon, if you wait for your power spikes, Corky has to fight earlier than that if, you really, if that's your approach to the game. And it is a misunderstanding for a lot of people that Trinity Force, that's your power spike only. Get it, don't do anything before it. Sheen Fate as well. Once you hit level six, you have fantastic traits. You can take these early fights. Victor as well is a champion that is so fantastic to itemize on because you have so many items you can go for in the early game. Getting Hex Core is a very gold efficient item, so it makes you fairly strong already early in the mid game if you want to use his zone and all of, his, of course his area damage to take these early fights around objectives. Taking stock of the situations, I think both teams are relatively happy with how this is playing out. Niels is 
CSing okay on the tower. He's now down 10, 13 CS over in the bot lane, but over in the top lane, same time on the Wamne. Even CS against Lulu, you would expect that to be more in Soas's advantage. So Origin kind of trailing behind. Yes, trying to lose gracefully though. or win oh, a little better. Oh no, Wamne is going to have that playful trickster. Amazing, he's not looking for the gank. But the one thing we do notice, Crapper, is every time we look at that middle lane, Peke is trying to chunk out Ryu and built himself up a small CS lead. Amazing. Turns away from the jungle once he gets spotted by the river, uh, the wolf spirit rather. He's gonna get chunked down. Odawamna puts a lot of damage, but no chumma waters. Amazing gets out. And that's a 2v2 advantage we have on the top lane. Ignite Fist plus Gragas will always beat out Lulu and Rek'Sai. However, they have utility to stay safe. But once this guy hits level six, that's the problem. Ryu will join and then he can just straight up dive so well. And HTK just saw the invade coming in from Amazing, and that's why Ryu was moving, and they could jump into that 2v2, didn't have to worry about anything. Bottom lane, though, again, Sword trading. Does oh, he'll have to flash, maybe. The death sentence does. Exhaust comes out. Yannan's holding the trigger on those Ren stacks. Decides not to pull them, and Mithy lucky to get away without taking a big burst of damage. Again, he is fairly tanky in the early game, but yeah, this is what happens over and over. If you don't land that taunt, the Shen simply cannot add a whole lot of value in the laning phase, that is. And Kasing hesitates with his Ignite. Either you pop Ignite, force the Flash on the Shen, but then you, you overextend into a long trade in, in which your AD carry is under, under Siege, under Fire, so that's maybe why he wants to hold that Ignite. Yes, maybe Miffy flashes, but in the end you will lose your lane control. Niels is now out of mana. They're pressured in, and they still have the older offensive tools available, just waiting for the next hook. It's a little wide. Not quite Angelina Jolie. <laughs> Can't really curve that hook. <laughs> It'll happen at some point, Crepo, I believe. What we still need to see, though, from Origin here is where is Amazing going to put his pressure? He's been mid lane once, he invaded into place of deep ward to potentially set up a gang in top lane. Obviously, want to look for Lulex and, and the counter gang coming in. Twist of Fate has hit level 6 now. On the side of Ryu, so it becomes even more difficult for Amazing to find a target. We might just see them say, you know what? We're just going to keep laying like this because we know Pekka can keep shoving mid lane. And as long as we keep the Twist of Fate under his tower, he can really pour it away without losing it. And that's the way you play against these globals here. You pressure them in lane so they're stuck, sitting way too far back. And if they ever TP away, they will lose something. That's what Origin has to be able to do when playing against Ryu here. And obviously this pressure is manifesting in a big lead. Origin trailing behind under side lanes kind of because Fizz is going even slash beating their opponent on Soas. The bot lane's winning, but Peke, he's ahead in CS right now. 78 to 64, so that's like the saving grace. Amazing is still looking for that first opportunity with that pressure. They want to deny this blue buff from Ryu. I really like this play here from Origin. They know in a straight up massive engage with Amazing, with the nuke coming in from, from Victor as well. They can take this and force H2K away. So no blue buff from Ryu. Very important for Twisted Fate in the early game. He gets it because he uses quite a lot of mana. And they use the push advantage from Soas on the top lane too to tr move him around that blue buff, secure that. Now, Origins want to take a double buff advantage that they can use maybe for a dragon fight right after. Remember, Miffy, he just hit level six, I believe, so Stand United will be coming out. Well, gentlemen, we're getting closer and closer to the point that these globals are going to become relevant. And H2K have been playing standard lane, something that they don't do very often in the split. Uh, a lot of their games are in lane swaps. Origin, roughly half their games. Going even, and for H2K, Let's see how they handle themselves because we talked about the graphics uh, and the stats. Win lane, win game is a little bit more of the mantra from H2K. They're not doing it yet. Well, no, they're not doing it yet. However, they were waiting for certain cooldowns like the Stand United from Mithy. That allows them now to play more aggressive on the opposite side of the map. Corky is one of these AD carries who can just sit on his own. Obviously, you're talking about H2K. I'm talking about Origin right here. But it counts for both these it counts teams. Counts for both teams. But. The one saving grace recently, H2K relies on that, you know, win lane, win game type of mentality. But the mantra back in early stages of Summer Split was the 10 to 20 minute mark. This is where it, H2K historically shined through like a bright diamond. And they started winning these macro level plays, you know, mostly involving lane swaps. Let's see if they can open up the map again with Oruamne and Ryu. They have to take down Soas eventually. That will, should be their main approach. Because grouping up for Dragonfight, in my opinion, is playing into Origin's strengths. And it's playing into something Origin have standardized the last few weeks. Waiting for those Corky power spikes. We touched on it 10 minutes ago. And for Origin, they've split their games as of HDK. Both teams 3-3 three three in the last couple of weeks. We can see Amazing. Amazing's been invading multiple times. 
He has stolen away a blue buff. This time around, doesn't get anything. Notice the way Mithy is moving around. Again, Korge is hit level 6, so he can start farming on his own with rockets. And the way you want to use Shen is not by sitting next to your AD carry the entire game long. You're not here to babysit him. You can start roaming with the jungler. You have great ganking pressure with your taunt. And then you have that global ulti in case your AD carry needs it. Or maybe you want to set up a dive on the opposite side of the map in the top lane. So we see Mithy already leave the lane, start invading, placing a few deep wards here and there. This hasn't really used it for anything because we saw fairly early in the game. And obviously, if there's one AD carry you want to do that with, it's Corky because he farms so well on his own due to the merit of the rockets and the phosphorus bomb coming out. You could easily leave a Corky in lane and he will get about 70% of the CS, if not all under tower. Amazing right now. Tremor Sense is live. For the Lux. A little thing here from Ryu. Um, something we see more and more Twisted Fate players do. Obviously cooldown reduction boots. And then you go for these early home guys. They start enabling you to set up some of these gangs. And the first oh, one flash. wow. Soas gets away from the Chumla Waters, That's but he's not, not going to get though. away from the gold card. I think it timed out. Wild Growth comes up. Ryu's in trouble. First blood secured by a they're not done yet. Origin are looking for Oda one there. They taste something fishy. Glitterlance is going to get fired out in a moment and kill secured for Soaz. Massive mistake from H2K. Lulex will flash away and stay alive, but when you're playing against Shen, you cannot make these plays here when it's even numbers at first because you know he's going to join in. The only response now is by trying to take down this bot lane tower. Let's see what Koi can do. I mean, it's still full HP. We go for it. That's a lantern kneel to the early Falk. Complete fake, it's Yonan that's in trouble. Fate's call is gonna lop uh, Kasing back onto Niels. Fox is gonna connect, Niels looking for more. Does have flash, decides to back away. Niels did pay attention in an elementary school math classes. He you know four, three people were involved in that top lane, so there was no potential lantern going anywhere. He knew it was a fake, so he could just turn on Hyun right there, but just overall origin. Using these teleports and their globals to counter HCK's aggression is fantastic to see. Relax, the cost. Good flash. And the knockback at a safety. So they use the teleports, but also they've been pushing the top and mid lane almost all game long. They've been gonna take a bot lane tower for themselves. So basically what happened, that pushed in the mid lane before the gank even arrived. Top lane was pushed in, and Amazing was already sitting ready on the top side, expecting the gank. So instantly, four members ready, and at the same time, you're denying minions from H2K while they're leaving the lanes, and their towers clear up the rest. And honestly, that play was all most due to Soas's pathing. Instead of pathing up and trying to escape towards his tower, he realized all I need to do is buy time, meet up with my jungler eventually, because I have Stan United to my uh, disposal, and then you just go into the enemy tower, you juke Ryu, because Ryu was stuck, had to flash over all the way. Gold card timed out, and then yeah. suddenly, Shen Tan comes into the double dive, beautiful pathing by Soas, and as a team, Origin are looking strong. And even if, if he just got stunned, you have Lulu ulti. Yeah, he Lula will survive. Shield. Shen ulti, I mean, you have so many things to buy enough time. And h 2 had full vision of where Amazing were, how Peki was moving, and yet they committed to it. I was just about to praise Ryu for home guards very early on. I like it because it allows you to very quickly, you know, go for a gank, use up all your mana, go back to base and go back and fast push and, and so on. Top lane now. Lulex is hiding, he wants to find Niels. Oh, he's almost up. Support. Destiny's coming out. Niels is gonna Valk away from Chum the Waters. Mid lane going down now. H2K, the... throw everything top and get nothing for it. That's the worst execution of that play I've seen. Just let Lulex come out of the brush with Body Slam. Don't cast your ulti because it's so telegraphed. The animation is dodgeable. But if Lulex dashes out first, you knock somebody up, then you can connect the fish. Then Ryu can land. So what a misplay from H2K. H2K made a play up top that didn't work out. It cost H2K control in this game. Amazing and so as. Oh, Looking to run down Hyun and the wild growth has been used. No to one is teleported in. There's no chum the waters. Amazing has decided to chance. turn it back around. Stand United from Mithy. Going to connect with the taunt. Well done, Kasing. You've got a death sentence, but it may not matter. Flash forward. Mithy gets the kill credit. Yon is hopping, skipping, and jumping away as Kasing's going to chase down Soaz on the back. A double taunt into a kill for Hyanin. Now Origin overcommits. Well, it's two kills, but they get a mid tower, so it's still worth it for Origin again. They keep pushing every single lane and they have this Shen to always Sing? turn to find Kissing. Oh, okay. Kissing, Kaching, this time for Peke. And Amazing is doing the same. And Amazing's gone. So um, a little bit of lack of focus, maybe, from some of these players. Safe to say, both Kissing and Amazing definitely shouldn't have stayed around or, or Kissing just walk. 
carelessly into this mid lane where Victor is already sitting. The difference right now is for Origin, every play is tied to an objective. If it works, we get pushed on towers. If it doesn't, you know, we, we still have pressure somewhere along the map. H2K are merely reacting to these plays, and we have a big deja vu there. Shen Ultimate coming in again, almost, you know, taking down Oduana. Because he managed to escape on 1 HP, he forced Miffy Flash, and then the chaos that ensued. H2K picked up a couple of kills, but they sacrificed yet another tower. Three towers to zero is something you would have never really said against H2K at the start of the split. Origin mid game, though, this time around, they're doing really, really well. We saw their gold graphs before here, how H2K have only been even at 10 minutes in three games, and at 20 minutes, they've never been even. The entire split long, they've only been either very far ahead of you or very far behind. This game, with the way it's going right now, it's gonna be the worst. With the current gold lead that Origin have, statistically speaking, if they keep this up to 25 minutes, uh, to 20 minutes, it'll equal a 95% win rate. It's gonna get hurt as Death Sentence will be going down. Niels gets caught out. That was man gang. two flashes and a ghost used to get an AD carry. Let's see if HCK can carry this momentum into an objective, because otherwise they're expending a lot of summoners. Should be able to knock on that bottom right. lane tower, but Peke is moving over to defend bot lane, and they might send, so send somebody over to hold mid lane, potentially. Still a big and unnecessary mistake from Mills. He was the only lane pushing, standing way too far, but this time around, Origin didn't have map pressure. You might see another fight, though. Lulex getting caught. He's the one that's been caught, invading for a blue buff. Kill goes to Mithy. I like what Mithy did there. He blocked the body slam, then taunted. Even though he got knocked back, he basically dragged Lulex farther away, and then it was an easy setup to finish him off. He still has flash available, but couldn't get out there in time. Good pickoff by Origin. We're seeing quite some misplays, though, uh, from the players here in terms of the positioning, which fights they want to engage on. Origin might even look for more. But the thing we have seen again is why having these fast wave clear champions is so important in this current meta here. Because Origin has three lanes that can push really quickly at once. And that allows you to rotate a lot faster because you can instant clear the wave, start moving into the jungle, start setting up a potential dive or, or a counter gank. And that's what they've been using so effectively to always punish H2K whenever they try to go for, for something and also deny the minions. Wave clear and tempo are just making the game easier to play. If you're a struggling new team, getting more wave clear in there just makes everything just go a lot quicker. H2K have to play near perfect with this composition in terms of skirmishes, getting the Ryu to land in the right position. But so far, I don't think we've seen a good destiny from Ryu where he lands, instantly stuns somebody. Always somebody on Origin's side managed to flash out, force Ryu flash, buy enough time for either Shen ulti or cross map pressure to come out. And Krepa, because of the fact that Ryu has tried multiple destinies and failed, he's actually down 50 CS to pick it. There's big CS uh, deficits. The gold is around 600. Um, luckily for Ryu, he has secured a few kills from some positional errors in Origin, but those destinies not paying off. And what is Peke building right now? It seems like he's going straight for the death cap, just to snowball on top of those upgrades with CDR yeah. boots. Did he get a third upgrade already? He did for himself. So basically, what we see on Victor players now is instead of going for, you know, upgrade your first hex score, then you build on real Normicon, so you start delaying your late game items, and real Normicon is often seen as more of a lane item, and because you're already getting the hex score, you're spending a lot of gold there, you just go for the cooldown reduction boots, and you instantly start rushing into death cap void stuff, and you just maximize your scaling and late game damage as fast as possible. And I really like that, because you get enough cooldown reduction from your boots. And we look at Ryo, he's posturing for a teleport up top. Lulex was hovering around all the while, and we talked about this 2v2 being strong, and that they need to use it to their advantage. Our amazing is just shadowing this lane. He's defending his weak side, so Origin can thrive on the stronger side. Ryu obviously is getting pushed in the mid, so he can he can no longer stay in his destiny position. He has to go back to the mid lane, and Origin hanging on where they're weak, and then exploiting that to their advantage. Remember, Shenalty is still available. That's why H2K is not going for any of these dives. And I feel, looking at Champ's like, perhaps it would have been wiser to, to ban out the Shen somewhere if you're really gonna go for this global push one, because if a support pick can counter your mid lane pick this hard, you will lose map control and in turn give up a lot of dragons. Until this game, and so as Normithy had played that Shen, so maybe even H2K forgetting about it a little. Dragon number two secured as we continue to see Origin accelerate small leads in gold and map pressure. There are two towers up, two dragons up, they're heading kills. Everything's looking good for the current number two. Yeah, we're gonna get a 25 minute third dragon for Origin, so we'll be slightly delayed as in one of the win conditions for them. But if you look at the minimap, we're gonna notice H2K 
have put so much focus on defensive pink wards to enable these roams between them and of course enable Ryu to start teleporting. I would like to see Origin try and contest it because you are so far ahead in the mid lane with Pekka always shoving in that lane. Try and go in here, get a few wards around the lane in the mid so you can see Ryu when he's moving to the side. It's easier for you than to counter play it. Yeah, but the safety of those pink wards allowed it to K2 kind of close the gold gap right now. If you see, it's only 1.7k. It was a lot bigger earlier. Origin's obsession, I wouldn't call it, but just prioritization of the dragon allowed H2K to come back a little bit. So they still have that skirmish and duel potential right now. So the Origin will have to play a tight mid game. Yeah, especially also because Amazing has gone for Warrior Enchant on this Rexa here. So he wants that early mid game pressure. They got to use it now to contest some of this defensive vision if they want to start really taking over the map. The further you shove a TF down into his own base, the less he can do and the more obvious, obvious it is when he's ganking. Talking about ganking, you can see Lulek setting himself up for a potential dive, decides against it. I really want to just mention how much CS Peck has accrued. Nearly 240 at 21 minutes. That's 10 to 11 CS per, per uh, uh, averaging, 10 to CS 11 a minute. Damn it, words are hard. Usually, it's a lot of CS. usually 10 CS a minute Thank is you, nice, Trevor. but uh, 21 minutes to be at 244. <laughs> Let me do the math for you, Trevor. That's about 34 more CS than one would be expecting. So he's well on his way to break a record. However, at the start of this game, we saw Invade coming out from Amazing on those buffs. We saw Deep Vision. This was pushing H2K back into uncomfortable position, basically guaranteeing un like forced errors. Right now, H2K's vision control is forward. Origin haven't really crossed that river yep. all too much. Niels' quirky power spike completely negated. So H2K are putting a band-aid on their problems right now. I almost feel like Origin is saying, okay, we got the two early dragons. Let's wait for Pekka to complete one of these big items he's building towards. We both have components for Loon and Zeko and then the Death Cap. As well, Loon and Zeko build is, is something we also see more and more in Victus because it gives you 10% movement speed, extra wave clear, and it allows you to roam very effectively between the lanes and have more impact before these big 5 on 5 team fights. But Arden got to start using it. They got, had the good advantage. Your mid laner can one-shot basically everyone on the side of H2K at this point, or at least once you complete the fight. And you got that core here. Yeah. Deny some of this vision. Don't just allow H2K to take over the map. I think they should take a page out of, honestly, H2K's book and put the core key in the middle lane. But the problem is Victor is so such an immobile champion, if you want to call that low mobility. Call it what you want. He gets caught up pretty easily. So you kind of want him in the mid lane too. So you're wanting two champions that thrive in mid lane in the mid game. As Pekka speeds out and clears that wave instantly. Manages to get Ryu's ghost as well. The one thing that does play into Pekka and maybe even Niels' favor, whichever lane they decide to hang about in, there is a teleport from Soas available. Amazing can get there on Rek'Sai and Mithy as well with Sand United, but Oduwamne has gone unchecked for a long time. He's also farming up a storm. Yeah, the problem for Origin is Oduwamne can 1v1 anyone. The problem for Oduwamne is they'll never be a 1v1. There's either a Stand United or a teleport coming out. However, he still has that pressure and you see Nobody really wants to deal with it. We saw Soaz leave the lane as like, guys, somebody else would like to 1v1 Fizz right now? Nope. Okay, I'll go back. What we might see, though, is as long as Odomna gets the one-on-one -on -one against Soaz, he nullifies the teleport. And then if you have Ryu, because he's been having, honestly, a fine time the last few minutes in the mid lane, just shoving out the wave and joining, then it's a 2v2 where it's against the support on the side of Origin. And that's where... I where Origin might not be able to punish him because they haven't been pushing the lanes ever yep. since that mid-game lead, and it's such a big problem for them. And you hit the nail on the head right there. Not pushing their lanes eventually manifests into losing those Tier 1 towers. They had a lead in terms of towers, 3-0. to zero. It's now 3-2. to two. And Origin aren't looking to be setting up any plays. I think the next one minute will be crucial, indicative of whether Origin want to expand their vision control around Dragon if they're really going for that 5 Dragons as win condition, or what their approach actually is to the game, if they actually have one. Gentlemen, the approach that H2K had for the first 15 minutes has stalled. They opted to try some Destiny ganks with Twisted Fate. It didn't work. H2K have not tried that again. They're content farming. They're content slowly getting those towers. And with Ryu completing his Hourglass, the option to jump into a fight and set something up is slightly more likely. I have a pattern here. Ryu uses Destiny. H2K fall behind. Ryu hasn't used Destiny <laughs> in the last... Yeah, nine minutes. It's HK science. goes back. Ryu, unbind the R key. <laughs> this is your key to victory. Somebody who doesn't need to unbind his R key, just returning to this middle lane. 290 CS at 24 minutes. Xpec is still doing phenomenal. Picking up a lot of that defense. And I guess the longer that mid tower stands, the happier Origin will be to prevent some of H2K invading their jungle. Right, obviously, taking down the mid tower is important. 
for H2K, but again, it's not even the main objective right now. It's the fact that you get Odo Army to just continue sitting and scaling up on this fist in the split pushing role. Ryu as well for himself has not been pressured, and you were so far behind at some point. And now, you are just apparently getting allowed to farm back into the game. Yeah, I know you can go five dragons for Origin, but we are still talking 18 minutes before they hit that point. We had this comparison in the office earlier this week where we compared playstyle stats and similarities in terms of CS at 10, you know, gold leads. And we came to the conclusion that Speke is Froggen. And this is uh, another confirmation of that statement because it's so, it's so Froggen esque to just completely annihilate your opponent in the mid lane and just eventually translate that pressure into the mid game. However, can Origin use Expect it better than Elements can use Frog, and that is the question right now. Origin seems to have control of the Dragon Pit Crepo. They've at least got some control. Zero contest from H2K. That is number three. That 12 means minutes. 12 minutes. Aspect. And there's a banner of command here for Mithy Shen. We'll need to see if that can help control some of these side lanes. Reuse Destiny in. Niels has Valked away. Teleport on the top side of the top right of the corner. Somebody's gonna flank. Peke, Chaos Storm's gonna need to come down, and it will, but it's not gonna be enough. Yarnan's got himself a kill. H2K, what can they do with the numbers advantage? Wild Growth is on Niels. Yarnan gets a double. Now Soez is in trouble. Forced to flash over the wall. H2K may be able to crack open the tower or look for something juicier. What is their call? Well, we see this again, though, from Origin. After the taken objective, they kind of reset the map, and some of them is just standing in the middle of lanes. They're not really doing a whole lot. Instant reaction for H2K. Peckett didn't even manage to use his ulti. He's so strong at the moment, but he didn't get to do a whole lot of damage. H2K instantly wins the fight. Two towers down. They don't care about your three dragons. They're ready to fight for the next one anyway. Because H2K just sat, farmed their lanes for so long, it looks like Origin just completely forgot about the, the flying potential. Let's watch this again. Ryu had already used Destiny at this point. He's coming in top right of your screen. Just keep that watching your minimap. Stun goes down on Xpeka. Here's Oduwamne. He got Miss Cleanse is very, very big, even though afterwards Oduwamne couldn't. Sorry, gentlemen. Cap. Amazing is now in trouble. Wild Growth comes up, but the rend will be enough with another pierce. Kianan gets another kill. You were saying, Krepo. Yeah, a lot of action. Not done just yet, so they decide to AFK farm for 10 minutes. <laughs> then right when I'm making a single point, <laughs> keep on fighting. Damn you, H2K. But they're doing the right thing. They, they, do, they hit I their spike, they got a beautiful opening, and now they keep the aggression on. They don't want to get Origin into position where they can start pushing those lanes back again. And honestly, it's going well. And Oduam is getting bigger and bigger right now. On that Triforce Banshee spike, with the Ignite available, Big split push there. And I would like to just uh, update our Ryu uses R. It's not effective. It now was effective. What? Okay. Oh, come on, why not? Debatable. <laughs> well, he the was, team part got two to towers. I mean, part of it. Yeah, of course he was. I think yeah. Oluwami's teleport was bigger in that fight, but yes. It was a good zoning. <laughs> it was a zoning, zoning destiny. For, for a Ryu, zoning yeah. destiny. Nils had to walk down, and then suddenly he was caught out a little bit, and that was fine. But again, for H2K, they've been allowed to do whatever they wanted for the last few minutes. We get a locket as well now on the side of Lulex, something we mentioned champs like, how important it is versus basically yep. almost pure a AP on the side of Origin. We you look at the carries, and then half half of the Corky. So, very important items in that case. For them, obviously amazing is trying to build up some of the physical damage with the warrior enchant. Oduwamne. Not going to connect with Chum the Waters once more. Destiny from Ryu. Okay, we're back to uh, the status quo. Is that a Skull Crab? Yes, that's the only thing preventing from complete dominance over vision control, or was more. rather. Skull Crab goes down. Crying Orb, Crying Orb gets used. Finds only one. So OG knows that H2K is baiting, they just bought themselves 30 seconds. Now very quickly, when H2K were down at 20 minutes, they've only come back in one of the three games where they were down. So statistics are not on their side, they've currently got the gold lead. They didn't go for the Baron play, but they were threatening it. Origin had to respond. And, and this is why you buy a Scrying Orb on your AD carry in the mid game. No Trinket could have done what Niels just did there. He bought 30 seconds, enough to push the mid lane. Mm. Then enough in turn to force H2K to go mid. Oh, I'm the flanking now. Gonna get the uh, playful trickster, applies the slow. Methy gets knocked backwards into a death sentence and Ryu secures the kill. That's the support down. Just a little bit too much. Origin stopped the Baron, doing some vision, but then just overextended and just... They're not respecting the pick potential of H2K right now. No, not respecting the flank from Odo Amne. First the teleport in mid lane, then just moving down from the top lane. You had full vision of him because he just cleared a wave. H2K again now. With the goal lead for themselves, getting more, getting more and more items completed. Yarnan is getting fairly fed in this Callista. 
Yeah, we talked about it. Is Corky worth prioritizing over Kalista? Obviously, it's easy to talk in hindsight, but right now for H2K, no, you know, well, take Kalista first. Ooh, yo, oh, never mind. Corky is the best champion. Yeah, Takes down kill. Kalista. There we go. A single all rocket nils. is all he all needed. Nils. All nils, by the way. He set that one up. So Peke shows what can be done with the 350 CS. We have some caster curse right here. Uh, let's just say there's no way H2K can steal this. Crepo, what have you done? Peke is gonna try zone away Lulex. He's chunked below half. Baron's being secured. Ryu, Destiny's available, but he will not use it. I was Origin, right. get the Baron. So Good smart, call. Clever. Call it. Super analysis. About the Corky pick though, if we go back to like the first 10, 15 minutes of the game, it worked really well yep. in the setup for Origin. We knew they wanted to contest these dragons in the mid game. And also they had that AD carry who could solo farm with the Shen TPing away. So it really made a lot of sense for them. Now obviously because Origin as a team then didn't push the lead, HK came back and then suddenly Pekka decides, okay, I've been farming for about what? 30 yeah, minutes. The problem the problem with this pick is usually you can use Corky as a tool to put pressure in the mid lane and put your mid laner bot. This is what HTK usually likes to do, but because you have Victor and Corky that both like being in the mid lane, it, Origin should have probably grouped them in the mid lane earlier, and this is what they're doing right now. Obviously, they have the help of Baron minions. It's easier and the buffed up caster minion. But that's exactly what they should have done with the Victor, with the Corky, with the with the, what's it called, amazing as well on Rek'Sai. You had such a strong team. Niels is caught, but he's going to be able to flash away. Sorry to cut you off, the Fisher. We saw the destiny from Ryu. Origin up, healing top. That was a good flash, by the way, because Mith, uh, not Mithy, because Singh was ready with the flay on the Valkyrie, but because Mithy, uh, Niels flashed sideways, that flay couldn't come out. Then he Valks out. If you Valk first and then flash, you will get interrupted and get picked off. So that was a good move by Niels flashing to the side and then Valkyrie upwards. Still got that Baron buff. Dragon is alive. You've been working towards it for such a long time in this game. Amazing, though. He's gonna get hooked up. TP as well behind. backwards. That's a two-man play. I think that's an Ignite burning as well. Oduwam is looking for a target. Playful Trickster does not get over the wall. That is a giant Niels. He's gonna Valk in defense. We do see the fight continuing to break out. Oduwam is forced to back away. Nobody's down yet. Cleanse comes out from Peke. And we see Hyanen clearing out that minion wave. Amazing. The only victim of the fight. Honestly, Poor target prior from H2K. Oduamne goes back downwards to chase the top laner when he just completely ignores the AD carry that's in the middle. Eventually, Niels gets bounced in, but that only facilitates Soas's wild growth right there. And Origin can be a little lucky getting out of there, but this is the one big engage tool. Destiny combined with teleports is what H2K need to open up this map. However, they pick up the first dragon now. Oh, Yarnan. Super worth it, though. Dragon I should've went into one. The, should've went into the pit. And it delays Aspect of the Dragon from Origin for an additional 12 minutes. How much can Origin take, though, from this? 35 seconds on Yarn, they're already down here with four members. Amazing. Already sits with ulti ready. There's a tunnel at the Raptor camp, so the Wolf camp can always join in. So if Origin can take a mid tower away from this, even though they lost the potential five Dragons, that's obviously super annoying for them, they might be able to at least push into the base. Huh. So okay. Your wild cards mean nothing to me, says the kind of minion. Nils, so. Shumna Waters this time connects when Niels is in melee range on his Corky. Odawamde is going and that's a decent explosive cast from Lulex, but he dies for the trouble. Death Sentence connects on Niels and he will be going down as well. Chaos Storm is hurting, but Origin back away one for one. Niels is eating every single hook from Kissing lately and every time he lands it, H2K sees an opening to engage. I think Ryu as well. Could almost have picked up a triple kill there if he didn't miss his wild cards in the very end of the fight, so H2K. Defend the tower, they got the dragon. Both teams keep going back and forth here against each other. And Luex, while well, we gave him some flack in the early game for not really getting anything done, even in a 2v2 in a top lane, he has had some, some really impressive and explosive cast loss fights. Knocked Niels forward at least two or three times to my uh, straight up memory. So he's definitely doing better in these mid game fights. That's what he needs to do, just isolate the team fight. So these skirmishers can take down one target at a time and then tear their way through them. And then just Tjarden, he wants to get the reset on the E. So he can keep chunking out people with that renowns. And of course, we did see Pekka picking up his own blue buff. So much AP to play with on that Victor. 730. Luden's completed. Death cap. I think that's a max out Hex 4 as well. Perfect Sing. indeed. Ooh. This time, Death Sentence does not connect. Origin, though, really needs Nils. 
to watch out in these fights here. The fact he's getting singled out so many times by Kissing is a massive problem because you need these two carries to stay together. Pekka and Mills with the backup from Soas, and then kite back a little bit when H2K is teleporting in, engaging, because the all-in from H2K is fairly strong in that sense, but if you can kite back, avoid the all-in potential, you have more damage. So Niels just spent some money on an elixir. I would have liked to see that become a null magic mantle, just straight up QSS. I think if he finishes that item, then he can negate those hooks. And if you land a hook, your entire team is, is inclined to move forward. If then QSS comes out, you get baited in, you lose the fight. It could definitely be a crucial item. Hopefully he picks it up, because obviously t support Chen is not going to build Mikhail's Crucible. Complete waste of stats. You see that as Mithy has his sitting on that Kindle gem. A lot of damage picked up, but we've not really seen Odo Wamnet split pushing for the last 10 or so minutes. Been a lot more focused on sticking with his team, teleporting in for a couple of those fights. Yeah, that's the key thing. He's been teleporting for the fights. That means he don't really want to go on split push because he's obviously afraid of Origin then for a quick group. We see what they can do. Buffing a mid. <gasps> that was so close. Might get someone else on the side. He just finished Frozen Heart. Lulex, why would you build Frozen Heart against this lineup? This is purely just again. I mean, are you that afraid more? of the Corky plus Pixie auto attacks coming out? I mean, so there's a lot of stats in the Frozen Heart he likes. Obviously. Yes, but it's full armor against it's the full, full armor. magic. It is. It is. I'm trying to see with Odo Amna here. So obviously, is always half full, right? For sure. The, the Corky pick is very built around being able to auto attack to deal the necessary physical damage for Origin. That is somewhat going to get shut down. Obviously, also with, with the Rexa with the Warrior enchant. So that is, should be basically the reason for what I'm building here. Obviously, he wants more MR at this point. I will wait for another legal learning on Jat. Perhaps he can prove why this item built is good. Because I don't see it. I don't see the frozen heart really working out here. Yes, it's good to shut down the physical aspect of the enemy team if you're done shutting down the magical aspect. You know, if you have it, if you stack, everybody's on 200 MR. Love it. Nice frozen heart, but not quite yet there. But I see a locket. That's enough. <laughs> this is why we're color casters and you play by play. <laughs> Gentlemen, Baron is up in 30 seconds. A dragon is a minute and a half. And with the exception of players being a little caught out under objectives, that's where we've seen most of the battles. Origin have got decent vision around Baron this time around, some deep wards as well. So that should help them out. HDK is good at split pushing and flanking, but face checking straight in into the Origin lineup gets punished very quickly. Whimsy speeds anybody up, control mage on Victor. They really, really can punish these choke points. However, we obviously have Destiny on the side of H2K, so no face, face check should be made before Scrying Orb and Destiny are both expended. But just taking out that ulti from Ryu could be very important for Origin. Yep. That has been one of the problems that Ryu could teleport in with Odo Amna, and you could get to that backline of Origin so quick. We keep mentioning how Origin wants to cut it first. There's the first ulti from Ryu. Odo Amna is nearby, but now ulti is gone. And so was he. He went from bot to mid because he saw Odo Amna in the mid lane, so that puts him as mid lane pressure here. Amazing. It's fished out. So Amazing's in a little bit of trouble, but H2K decide not to fully engage. Chum the waters was not enough. Mithy's looking for somebody to taunt. He does have flash available, and Ryu has been left somewhat alone. Where's the ghost? He's trying to look for more. So, summon spell used. Always gotta respect that torn flash. He could have pulled off. So, yeah, got one summoner. I was like seeing mind games here. Miffy just taunt forward and then have a preemptive flash come out. The enemy, let's see if he lands it. Taunt. No! Oh, misses. Between the goalposts! How do you miss the fat man? Evidently like that. He's a beautiful flower. <laughs> you don't want to taunt that, Trevor. No flower trampled in this exchange. That All right, was... Origin back to Scare One. They're baiting right now. Usually, HCK face sex slowly, but they use the Scrying Orb immediately. Baron's going down quickly, though. Again, still no ulti for Rio here, so HCK has to just engage head on if they want to fight. Amazing, though, going in. Origin are going to be turning this fight around. Fate's call is up. Yannan's on the back line, throwing out those spears. Ren will secure the first kill of the fight. The Chaos Storm trying to reply for Origin. So far, it's a one for zero in favor of H2K. Ryu goes golden, he's got no support. The Lantern is there, he gets the Lantern! No, nope. but the Pixie follows through. One for one, mid for jungle. Look how hard it is though for H2K suddenly to get onto the carries because they didn't have the ulti from Ryu, didn't have anywhere to TP forward or Amnes, so they only got Amazing down. They're back though to try and stop this one. Kasing and Lulex are in trouble. It's a flash forward from Pekka. He's got himself another kill onto Kasing. Oduwamna is in and amongst everybody. Hyana gets turned into a munchkin and he gets munched by Origin. Oduwamna, one more playful trickster. It is not enough. 
two more kills to Origin. Really like how quickly Origin realizes, oh, Callista's standing over there. Let's all ignore Odan and just instantly switch it over. Yannin goes down. This is what Origin were looking for. Bait out some of these globals here so there's no threat to your back line. And then you are, what, 10,000 AP expecter? He'll take care of the rest. Yeah, in late game in these team fights, yes, Lulu doesn't provide that much damage, but she has the utility and she can negate so much damage, whether it comes to the knock-up shields, but more importantly, using that Polymorph on top of Hyarnan here. And the initial fight is just how these fights play out. Lulex, watch his explosive cast. This is good peel. Body time flash was bad, though. Then he peeled. Yeah. He's taking three carries out, but he's trading his life, so HK trade frontline. But I want you to keep your eyes on Niels, what he does after this with the flash board proc. Gets on to Rio and forces obviously the hourglass, but big mistake from Lulix not getting one of these squishy targets. Look down here, left corner as well. We can see how Origin has just picked up the fourth dragon. In the end, Sora says, Nope, you're not getting away from this one. And this is just such a big difference for Origin in how they want to play these fights. H2K not able to execute it. So, as you mentioned to Fisher in the little picture in picture clip, Origin secured their fourth dragon. They're six minutes away from Aspect. And thanks to the Baron and team fights. Origin are once again a sizable lead. As we're about to hit 41 minutes. During that replay as well, the observers poked me and mentioned that all three of Neil's deaths have resulted because of Kasing's death sentences. It's something that Tafisio and Crepo you mentioned earlier in the game. And Crepo, QSS is secured for Neil's now. But Neil's is one step ahead. He realizes he gets caught so often that not even, he can't even flash out anymore. So now he's just flashing it forward, making the plays. <laughs> That's what he did. He got real. He was like, no, 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 guys, I'm one step ahead. Now I got my QSS too. Offense very often is the best defense. But he's Origin. I mean, it's all about picking anyway, in terms of the damage. You're luring the fish. Yeah. There's the beautiful metaphor, metaphor here. And somewhere, all in there between, is a flower. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, buff that minion. I think these uh, metaphors need a little bit of work, Jess. Yep. But Origin, they got pushed away the last time they tried the siege because of a death sentence. This time, Niels was wise enough to back away, and Hyanen gets chunked up by that death ray. Look at the minions down bottom. I think that uh, banter of command-empowered minion will be shoving Origin, crack open the base, and get the first inhibitor at 42 minutes. Wonder where they're going to rotate next. Oh, uh, right. look, that's Bob's ah. nephew, Frank Tank. <laughs> I love buffed up Karen. Two of them! Wait. Dos! Now, this, this is what dreams for support are made of. You're like, usually I don't help turret pushes. No, no, no. These are two minions, so many that have actually ran out of the names, so people online can name them whatever they want. And of course, Let's see how much damage they do with these towers. No wild cards. These minions are magic immune. The only a person lot. that can take yeah. these down is Yarn with Renounce, but he has to walk into so much poke. This is disgusting. Amazing. Disgustingly beautiful. Elixir as well for himself. Is that three? That's a tower. <laughs> is that three? Where's that third one come from? It might just be two sieges and two yeah, banners. Yeah, two. I think yeah, the last okay. one here yeah. is just that. It's he's an trying. imposter. He's trying. Wow. It's not as cool, though. Yeah, These those barrels minions, don't help. You can smite them. These yeah, cannon minions have done almost more damage to structures than H2K have as a team. Great play from Origin. Gonna secure themselves another inhibitor <laughs> in a moment or two. Hey, man. All, ca all cannons must die and serve and all. Here we go. Team fight. Soaz is thrown down. The Hourglass, Odo Wamne is hopped in, he's hopped out. The Explosive Cast has knocked the Mazing in. The Chaos Storm is wreaking havoc across H2K's backline. Yonan gets one, but it is simply not enough. Frank the Tank and Bob's cousin doing all the help for Origin. They're on to the Nexus turrets. They're taking it down. Ryu's trying to go for one last play. It will not be enough. With Origin taking out the Nexus, they are qualified for the semi-finals and have booked their tickets to Stockholm. With two Banner of Command cannon creeps. Let's not forget the important part of this victory. Yes, sure, they may have locked in for second place. Who cares? Who cares? <laughs> Shen support. Turnaround ganks. Strategically, it's like. Origin stopped shot calling in the mid game. So, like, guys, let's practice our early game. Good. So, usually, like, dismantled uh, H2K. All right, let's take our foot of the pedal. Pekka, you're still farming in the middle. It's okay. We lose mid game. That's fine. Late game, go back again and just dismantle them again. Yeah, due to that very, very well or great executed early game from them, they could make a few mistakes and obviously still keep it fairly even. Not the, the way you want to play it if you are Origin, but we got to see the late game, just the, the difference. When Ryu and Odami were not able to TP in a flank, to get that back line, Pekka got to be the big carry, just like Frog, and funny enough, yeah. back in the day as well. What worries me the most 
is not that HDK lost there, but some of the the plays they set up as a team before they were working so well in unison. Remember those dives from HDK coming out, those map wide plays. Everybody was on the same page, but multiple ganks this game. Destiny kind of off, you know, body slam or fizz ulti giving away the intent of the play, having people Valkyrie or flash out prematurely, and then just losing all that momentum. Immediately, and Origin used that to cross map, you know, tower left side, tower right side, eventually mid lane tower. Expect it, found up a storm. Yeah, from the Chaos storm, that's for sure. For Origin, uh, just to remind everybody, they are now guaranteed second place. They cannot drop. They're into the semifinals. Regardless of how that match plays out, they will be in Stockholm either for the final yep. or for the third, fourth playoff. It's very important to note that they are only one game apart in the standings and with just two spots left in the summer playoffs, Elements are looking likely to pick up a spot if they can pick up wins. If they can pick up the wins, SK Gaming tomorrow as well. Yes, they lost earlier today, but obviously they want to make sure the key balls behind them in the standings. Definitely the case. Let's start with Elements, who are on the left-hand side. The blue team today, they can equal Gambit score in the standings with a victory. JWoww, Dexter, Frog and Tabs, Nif, and their coach Martin Munson, I believe it's pronounced. As we've said, they play Gambit, they play SK tomorrow. They have the potential to make it into playoffs if they can get 8 and 10, if they can win those games. And really the story's been about Dexter and Frog, and it's been them yeah. versus the world in most of their games. Dexter for the early game, and then Frog and taking over the game once we go late. He's honestly been performing really well, Frog and himself in the mid lane. Uh, I think the Varus pick he's been uh, getting lately is very important. It gives him more mid game impact, which is what Elements needed. Otherwise they rely on Dexter for the early pressure. And if these two guys can perform, Elements can look okay in the early game, and then transition that into the late game. Because really, Taps and JWoww, like on these side lanes here, not been performing well enough, honestly. They really have not. But one thing that is uh, seeing improvement for Elements is their drop, their pick and ban phase. At the beginning of the split, we criticized them heavily for their late game scaling, for their limited wave clear, for their lack of mid game pressure. And that is getting better and better. They seem to be putting together champions that can do <laughs> multiple things. Yeah, again, for me, it, it goes back to, to the likes of the virus pick for, for Frog, and it offers wave clear. It gives him mid game impact. It gives poke, which is something elements have played okay with, except for the game against Fnatic. Uh, where they honestly had this great comp, or they at least had the possibility to play a fantastic siege comp, but they were honestly too passive. They lost a few dragons in the early game they could have contested, and that was a problem for them in the end. Fnatic ran with it against Copenhagen Wolves as well. They were in control, but it took a long time, and it's been a problem for Elements. They are not proactive enough yeah. on the map. They wait for you to make a move, and then they react, but if you play these poke compositions that spike in the mid game, you have to be able to then group up, start landing the poke, start sieging towers. If you just sit back and wait, you just allow your team to take map control and outscale you. Well, there's a reason elements are 6 and 10. Uh, it took a long time for them to realize that. Their opponents today on the red side will be Gambit Gaming. Now, of course, they do have a substitute. Kabashar, Diamond, Betsy, Gosu, and their coach, Shawns, in the 80 carry role, replacing Forgiven for this week, will be Moops, former mid laner for Super Hot Crew, and he will be filling in pretty big shoes today. Yeah, former mid laner for Subar Crew. He's been uh, playing support a lot in solo queue, and now he has to step in as the AD carry. Obviously, a super tough situation for them. If you want to know more about the, the Forgiven situation, go to LoL Esports to compare the ruling. You can read it there. Gambit, though, as a team, they got to try and make the best out of Copper Shot and Bitsy. Honestly, Copper Shot last week played the Gangplank, Smite, uh, Smite and TP top lane. That's not gonna work. You need something that can snowball from the early game. Gangplank, he takes 30 minutes to farm. I mean... But he got he got 30 minutes. He got to 30 minutes and then already lost the game. They gave her like three mid towers, uh, sorry, three towers in the mid lane. I guess he was aiming to maybe find a new AP top laner so you can open up, because Betsy likes to play Jace a lot in the mid lane, but too slow scaling for competitive play. You just get punished too hard. Okay, so let's not focus on the GP. Talk a little but bit more a pick. about Diamond Prox and about Cabochard because despite the substitution, Gambit were a team that won when Cabo got ahead. Yeah. Very rarely was it directly for Given's fault. It is because of picks, because of meta, because of yada, yada, yada. But as it stands, a lot of it rests on this man's shoulders. Almost everything. And they're going to have to do that again. Gambit are still very close to playoffs. Their current record of seven wins, nine losses. If they pick up a win today and they push elements down, that's one less threat to worry yeah. about. And Rocket obviously lost today as well. Which as is as the Giants as well. Giants as well. So the teams around Gambit yes. have lost. 
Obviously, that's also benefiting Elements, who's trying to catch up to these teams here. So this game is just super important for playoffs, and also for us to see how can Gamba play now yeah. without, obviously, forgiven as the AD carry. Because going to pick and ban phase, if you are on the side of Elements, you will expect them to try and get a carry for Capo Shot. And maybe you can try and ban it out. We know his fist has been fantastic in that top lane. Yep. Aim for that one if you are elements, and then just try and play around him with Dexter and Jay Wow to maybe try and shut him down. So, what decision will these teams make? We'll talk more about the playoff prospects as we get into game. But one thing I want to highlight with regards to the AD carry matchup is Tabs statistically has been one of the worst at CSing all split long. Traditionally down. 9 CS at 10 minutes and 15 at 20. We'll see if Moops will be able to get a little bit of freedom in that lane. The Fizz is removed from Cabochot, as you mentioned, as is Nidalee from Diamond, yeah. TF and Rise from Elements. And this Nidalee is such a key ban because Diamond is very good at getting this pressure towards the top lane for Cabochot, and Nidalee is one of the greatest early junglers at applying that pressure here. Her dual potential is insane with the Rune Glaive buffs, so it's a very smart and needed ban Elements. The first two bands are straight towards what was going to be a 2v2 in top lane between Capo Diamond and, of course, J1 Dexter. Rek'Sai is still open if he wants that one on the side of Elements here to shut down some of that pressure. But also Rumble is there, which has been such a key pick in this meta. Whenever he's not banned, we often see him take in first rotation. And, of course, with a different, too. With a different AD carry, maybe Moops plays Callista. Forgiven didn't. And it wasn't something we saw out of him. Moops, of course, is playing support at the moment in solo queue as his main. We're to believe he also plays Annie mid. It's irrelevant to say now, but it is a fact. And of course, with that Sivir locked in for Tabs, the team utility is there. So even if Tabs falls behind in lane, he will bring power to team fights in mid game later. Here's the Varus to deny that from Froggen. Yeah, I think the Varus pick is needed, even though you don't always want to show it in the, in, in the first rotation. You don't want to give people a chance to build comps around it. He's very safe in lane. He can farm against almost everything because these assassins are not in the meta. So I feel like Gambit had to take it away seeing as they didn't ban it. But obviously giving away Sivir is just such a problem in Europe. I mean, we value that champion so high. Didn't even talk about it because you're expecting it to be banned. And also Elements will be able to take that Rumble pick we mentioned if they want to keep going for what is considered right now some of the strongest picks in the European meta. Rek'Sai, we mentioned that one as well for the early game. Here's the Rumble. Elements can be very happy with the first few picks. Not too bad. JWoww's Rumble stats, 1-1. One and 76% one, kill participation. We'll get his hands on the champion for the third time in summer. We'll see what work he can do. Gambit, where do they respond? We know that virus is most likely middle. Safe pick, Corky, something yeah. that Forgiven's played an exceptional amount of. And I think this is smart for Moobs. Give him a safe AD carry, an AD carry where he relies on poke as well. Got to be able to use skill shots as a former mid laner for himself. This should be a pick that fits him. Also, these poke compositions, as long as you know how to use your power spikes in the mid games and you can ward properly on the flanks, you can play around that fairly effectively, even without, you know, a star AD carry. So I like the pick and ban phase in that case for Gambit. Gragas, not really able to match the Rek'Sai early game, but we're talking small changes here for them. Overall, both teams getting very strong compositions. So a lot of very powerful mana picks, as you mentioned, Officio. And for Gambit, despite a different player, putting a champion that fulfills the same role. We'll see what carry Cabochard decides to lock in once elements have rounded out their team composition. What are we anticipating from Cabo? Most played as Hecarim. He's played Shen quite a lot recently yeah. as well. I mean, he could. Even his Yasuo was yeah. terrifying. I believe that was comboed with Gragas, if memory serves correctly. It was. There are different carry picks for him. Question is, does he want a bit of magic damage now that he'll have the virus in the mid lane? Don't think necessarily it's 100% needed. Because again, they're aiming to have this massive mid game power spike with the poke. Shen obviously being banned away from him as we saw him play last week. Very, very strong pick for him, so we... I mean, look at the side of Elements. I love this pick here for them in the mid lane as well. The long-range poke is great to try and even it out with the virus. And then you're trying to match the power spike in that sense. Obviously, for Elements, also the wave clear is going to be needed when we see Gambit start grouping with Cork with virus. And overall, I mean, great conversation from Elements. And this is, of course, a champion that Froggen has played before. Only one game. It was a very convincing victory. 
He ended up going 5-1 and 6. No. I'm not believing it. Yeah. That looks a little better. So it is a magic damage top laner. And it is something that Kabashad has also run before in the past. If memory serves in Spring Split, there was a highlight reel of how well he was playing on this cannon. And Riv lost his mind when we saw it in NA LCS last week too. It has been a strong bit for Kabashad in the past, and yet it adds some of the magic damage for Gambit. It gives him... Oh, now you're going to tell me why you don't like it. A fairly strong... No, no, no. Because the thing is, Kennen's problem was the... <laughs> I knew you No, 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 no. Kennen's problem before was that, like, Janna was here and we'd been like, oh, you're going to ult my team? No, I'm just going to ult you and shoot you away, and you did nothing in the team fight. Element doesn't have any hard disengage on their side. They can try and run away with the severe ulti. That's about it when it comes to disengaging from a cannon who's going to TP in. So I quite like it in that case. Also because it will give a fairly strong, at least a level 6 for Gambit, if they want to try and 2v2 top lane and snowball him. Also, Rylice, wow, I... great item at the moment. Leandris been buffed, so you can go haunting guys into Sorcerer Boots, get the early magic penetration, then get the Leandris later. I think there's a lot of things to like about Kennen in the current meta. As long as Janna <laughs> is not being picked, I, I think it's I fine. I totally misread that. I really thought the uh, disappointed Deficio was about to start uh, dishing out the damage for Kennen, but he did not. Instead, a lot of praise, assuming Cabo can get to the back line. Hashtag EL win or hashtag GMB win. Will Gambit with the substitute keep their playoff hopes alive or will Element put the first brick in the foundations of building their playoff dreams? This is the first European cannon of the split. And there's none other than Cabo Shard. Well, of course, Cabo Shard has been playing or trying to play as many carries as possible in the top lane for himself. We're going to have this fun mid game, though, where Froggen is standing on one side trying to spit a gambit, just like shoot over a gambit and land a poke. Then on the other side, you have Moops and you have Betsy trying to do exactly the same. So there's going to be quite a poke war being built up. Great wave play from both mid laners. And then it's more about how can teams set up the fights. Elements, if they want to be the one to engage, you have to save the ulti. You have to, the rumble ulti as well. But it's going to be fairly difficult for you to reach the back line of Gambit. With Gambit side, you can have flash body slams. You can have the Alistar engage and then follow up with the cannon. Cannon's obviously not the main engage, always follow. So I feel like Gambit in that case has a bit more options of starting the fight. But then Elements can kite super effectively. You have the slows from the rumble, from Frogger in the mid lane, tap speeding them up. So it's going to be a lot of back and forth in this game. And it's Extended poke wars is what you're telling me. Yeah, it can also just snowball though super heavily. Like when, when some comps kind of have the same goal in how they want to play out, at least in terms of poke. If one team starts falling behind and they just cannot return damage, that's it. So, Deficio, the last time these teams played was an eternity ago. It was week one. Element showed up and really showed up big. This was, of course, before Sean's had even joined the roster for Gambit. Mm -hmm. Had a lot more problems to deal with in the opening weeks. And much like Spring, got themselves a coach after a couple of weeks, started to increase their strategy, their picks and bans. Gambit have been steadily increasing and now they're going to have the biggest challenge of all. Playing with a substitute and still being close to playoffs. So we do see the upside down lanes. Moops and Gosu doing the Krugs. We caught a glimpse of Tabs and Nif just a second ago finishing off the Krug. Really like their, the swap here from Elements to counter and get that 2v2 in the top lane. You have double range with their Thresh. Sivir does well into Corky as well. We've seen that matchup time and time again, blocking that damage to the Spell Shield. They gave full XP to Niftos. He's level 2 already. Betsy, he has no flash. No, oh, he he's in flash, so but. much trouble. Death Sentence connects. Ignite is down. Betsy's going down. Kill credit to Nif. So, I was sitting earlier today, looking at, you know, China, Korea. We saw, or we see very, very little virus in the mid lane for them. He's a champion, obviously, that lacks a lot of mobility. And one of the reasons is supports in China and Korea, they roam a lot more. They gank the early game, or they gank the mid lane a lot more, trying to shut down this virus pick. Before we even get to talk about it, Nif gets level two from the Grump, walks straight in, ganks Petty and takes uh, himself or gets himself the first block. That's how you try and shut down the virus in the mid lane. You can do it to save the frog and go. We'll find out whether or not anybody does. Gosu's presently defending Moops. Substitution for carry in the mid lane. We also caught, while Betsy was being ganked, his ghost had already been used. I did not actually see when or why or how, but uh, that is on cooldown. 
And teleports used from both JY and Cabochard to get themselves to that bottom lane. Riff does not follow up with a second death sentence. Dexter does have a pushing wave to punish if he so desires. Dexter's a jungler that's had such a great impact in the first 15 minutes. Constantly finding ways to yeah. help his team out. High skill participation in the early game for junglers. It also helps, seeing as your team can never get any kills on their own. So whenever he does show up and get a kill, <laughs> you get high numbers. But uh, he's been great, honestly, for, for elements in terms of early game. JWoww. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. He's going to ward. <laughs> I see you, you bud. Like, you're caught between a mountain, a fat man, and a yordle. JWoww's going to flash over the fat man and get himself out. So JWoww escapes. Problem for him, Flash is down. Diamond can always return, and you should never be surprised that Diamond is ganking that lane. Ghost Pepper, though, getting hooked in. All right, we did talk about it. Dexter had the option. He's going to get headbutted away. Gosu's just saying, come on, man, I'm trying to farm. Lantern clicked. Defensive Flash. So, Flash is traded. JWoww for Element's side versus top lane Gosu. Funny with both junglers. Almost all split long. Dexter put a lot of focus on ganking for his bottom lane. That's his first gank right here. Diamond is always camping for Copper Shot. His first gank as well, so predictable pathing in that case. But they do manage to force flashes in both lanes. Should hurt JWoww a little bit more in the bottom lane, especially because whenever he's trying to trade with the cannon who's ranged, he has to use Flame Splitter and start pushing the wave, which means he's gonna overextend and Diamond should just return down to this lane. He saw the ward being placed. You just time it being, okay, he placed the ward here, I know it's a trinket ward, I know when it's gonna run out. I'm just gonna walk down. JWoww's already sh pushed up. In this wave here, Diamond could just go down and get a, such an easy kill. Yeah, you can see JWoww's wave is starting to cost him some CS. 16 to 35 on the side of Cabochard. And it's at this point that Nif has decided, hey buddy, I'm gonna come try and help you out. I'm gonna bring Dexter as well. So, Lantern Gank is a possibility if Diamond were to show, but Diamond is not on the bottom half of the map. So I know that Elements are trying to save JWoww, allow him to farm by sending back up, but AD carry-wise, you want the Cork to solo farm, not the save it. Wave is pushing back down, so they're reading the minion wave, saying Kabashad is going to overextend. Hooked in. Kabashad is overextending. There is still a flash available. Flame Splitter is out. There comes Dexter. Dexter tunnels forward. He gets the knockup. The Flame Splitter and the Furious Bite get the kill for Elements. So instead of Diamond returning to the bottom lane, Elements said, okay, now the wave is pushing back towards JWoww. Just play passive. We're going to set up an easy gank. Taps on the Civic and just try and farm in the top lane as well. Ghost of Paper, not level six, to set up an easy dive. So, Elements, good little response to saying we're losing in that one on one. What can we do to help JWoww at this point? And it works very importantly. Elements, proactive in the early game, is not a sentence we've said particularly often. No. And Dexter held on to his flash and secured Cabos as well. So, and support, very good play. Support roaming from Nif. What, what is happening? I mean, what's going on? It feels like the team is learning, Deficio. Gank in the mid lane, roams down bottom lane, reach the minion wave to help, hooks in moves as well. Well, escape. But Nif with some very good moves in the early game. Also why we see teams really like Sivir so much. I mean, you can just leave it on your own, she can wave clear, even in the early levels. It's a great play from Nif, getting the early kills for, for Elements. And elements will need all the kills they can get. With the fact that Giants lost earlier today, with the fact that Rocket lost earlier today, Element's hopes of making playoffs are getting better and better. For Elements, their destiny is a little bit in their own hands if they can pick up some victories. They've got themselves a thousand gold lead. Nif is conti continually roaming, clearing out vision now. Has those Moby boots, has for a little while. May look for even more. So I get he's getting the Moby boots because, again, he has been roaming for ganks. I do really prefer early Sidestone though, because I think the deep vision you can set up is so much more valuable. But obviously because he's been making these Moby Boots work with the roam to the bottom lane, there's obviously a reason behind it for Nif. I also really want to see what Frog in this mid lane is going to build now that... I'm, I'm glad you say that to Fisher, because we've not looked at mid lane at all. It's, well, uh, this wave clank. it's a fantastic farm fest, you can see the practical side. But it's a farm fest that Froggen is winning. That's something that is happening a lot. Mm. Froggen always farms well and always has a big impact. Last week his Varus Rogues are good. Slightly more difficult to do with the Cogmore. Sure. But you can still roam and still pick up some poke kills with yeah. the, the amount of damage your side lanes have. And that's the thing now with the new API items, it's still hit level 11, get the rank to ulti. 
Yeah, it's still loot and echo. The 10% movement speed is very, very important for you when it comes to keep continuing landing this ulti here. Moving around, obviously, the early spike you get from it. And then I just wonder if we're going to see the Leandre's Rylai's build for him, because you don't really need death cap. You don't have that insane AP scalings. And the Leandre's death cap together, sorry, the Leandre's and uh, Rylai's, when you proc that double damage from the passive of Leandre's with the slow, it's just insane amount of poke. And when you play poke, people have to remember it's not necessarily about the kills. It's about poking someone down, forcing them back into base, and then you can then start taking objectives. You don't really need to kill people necessarily. Sending a message with the damage to Fischio. Elements continue to hold on to their lead. They are ahead in CS for their AD carry and mid laner. Slightly behind for JWoww's Rumble. Because of that very early flash and the fact that JWoww lost so much CS to the push and wave. He does have an assist, of course, thanks to the gank. There's been no indication that these lanes want to move or no early dragon pressure. So aspect is not something that they're looking for, but with the amount of poke, it's not really a primary concern. Not at the moment. Since both teams are happy saying we're going to wait for our poke champions here to so reach the power spikes, but Diamond had opportunities to go back to the bottom lane. I know I keep talking about it, but like they forced that early flash. We know Rumble is going to push the lane if he wants to trade with Copper Shot. And it's not been a lane he's returned to before now. He's sitting on that pink ward, but Flash is ready again for JWoww, and he's reading the situation where he should be at least expecting. Dexter showing himself mid lane. Betsy is using Ghost. He's been knocked up. Chain of Corruption misses. Froggen's looking for those living artilleries. Prey Seeker connects, but Betsy gets out alive. So Diamond was down bottom lane. He saw Dexter in the mid lane, meaning that JWoww know, okay, my jungler has shown himself on the map, so he's now zero pressure, which means I have to be careful because Diamond was not in mid to counter gank, so he can either be in top lane or bot lane. Now he's standing on the ward, though. Yeah, but so is Dexter. What? You no, know they're spotted. Dexter's not sure. Oh, Diamond doesn't. And then you punish the Red Scotler. Here comes Nip. That's. Okay, so it's just a play. Um, he's gonna at least get caught by one of those living artilleries before he decides to back. And of course, this is the point where you'll hear every caster say it's a stacking tier champion who's in a power spot. But it's not double tier, true. Oh, not double tier. Well, no, 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 no lockage yet either. No, no lockage. Uh, I think a lockage would benefit uh, Gambit. Actually, it would benefit both teams because of the magic damage. Uh, we'll get more serious in a moment. His elements are now onto the first dragon. With Gambit backing, they saw Cabo leave lane. They saw Betsy leave lane. And elements pick up an uncontested dragon. Easy piece. I really like elements focus around this mid lane from the early roam. Nif had to Dexter now ganking, forcing both summoners from Betsy. It allows them to push him back to base and then take this dragon. JWoww though, my friend, he's a level six cow. He's not afraid of that tower. And Equalizer had been used despite the overheating JWoww. Kabashard's coming in with a slicing Maelstrom and he gets the kill credit. Gambit secure a very easy kill. Should be able to get this tower at the cost of their own down bottom. So net gain with the kill, still with Gambit. So with Gambit, so trading towers, Kabashot very importantly got the kill for them. He needs to be a big part of these team fights. We have to watch how he plays in this game. We talked about this early magic penetration, obviously, on the cannon. Mm -hmm. So if you still want that hourglass fairly early. And the fact it's cheaper is another little benefit for, for the cannon. You don't really build the hourglass for the AP, you build it for the active. So uh, yeah, still a lot of things to like about it. We need to see how Kabashot can play the team fights. No hard engage or hard disengage from elements. Just a whole lot of mobility because of the Sivir to dance around. And that's important because of the fact that Kabashad's team is down in gold. Yes, they've secured a tower, which is great, but as it stands, elements have been more proactive on the map, secured themselves a couple extra kills. And one of that is because of Nip. He has picked up that sight stone, but we've not seen deep vision yet. Still some shallow warding. Nif and Tabs making their way up top. And JWoww's the first one there as well. And the deep vision is going to be the next move for Elements. You have Rek'Sai in the jungle, you have pressure in the mid lane, and now your support is roaming as a thresh. You have Lantern to save someone. Deep vision allows you just to pre-plan so much better. If you see suddenly two or three guys from Gambit on top side, you know your top lane is about to get killed. He can either back away or you can set up a counter play to it because of deep vision already being set up. Dexter is going to find Goes to Pepper at least. So Elements trying to just shove the lanes. Boops is freezing down the bottom lane, or at least farming it for now, so he's not going to be able to join. Very easy move. Look at the respect from Elements. They backed away despite the minions. Respecting the engage potential from Gragas and Cannon, as well as the fact that 
Betsy had gone missing, so no yeah. tower secure. Key move from Betsy, just moving out the lane. There was no vision, so Elements had to respect the fact he could be on his way to top lane. Frogman was back in base himself. So a bit of a missed timing for Elements. You mid laner recalls when you set up a four-man push top lane. That should never happen. You need to time it so your mid lane is putting pressure mid, and then you make that four-man push because the AD carry was freezing in the bottom side for Gambit. And Deficio, a little bit of wards placed all the way up to the red buff. It's not necessarily mega deep, but it's I think good enough if you want to push that top tower. And despite the fact that Froggen's back didn't necessarily coincide with the uh, hmm. dive top, it did allow Froggen to pick up a first item, okay. Rylai's. No loot in Zeko then, so he's not going to be as impactful in terms of damage. But obviously Rylai's allows you to disengage more effective and land the first ulti, follow with the next and the next and the next. 40% yeah. slow, it is painful to play against. And Froggen, nobody's gonna stop him from, from farming here because Gambit is losing the side lanes at the moment. Deep vision has been established, oh, so they can spot the it. There's the first there's slow. Hitting the slow. Void who's connects as well. Hitting the slow. One, One more. more. One no, more. No. That one's not gonna connect. Corsic Spittle does not. Nor does the living artillery. The ghost from Betsy keeps him alive. Right, Elements got the top tower and put a lot of damage on Inner, and Gambit did not respond with one of their own. Remember what we talked about earlier? You don't have to kill people. With Poke, you just force them back to base. Betsy's now recalling. Froggen goes in, gets a few more hits on the mid tower. You slowly chip it away. And it's just always in advantage of Elements. Gets at least a minion damage on this time. And denies Betsy even more farm. Yeah, that advantage is growing to 2,000. Dexter, I think, stole that Raptor with a Prey Seeker. You can see the animation flying. But it's officially a pretty big CS advantage for Froggen. He's now backed and picked up those Sorcerer Shoes as well. They're gonna add some penetration to those living artillery. Gambit, they've grouped themselves mid, and it'll be on tabs to wave clear as best he can. Great wave clear though from Elements. Froggen is on his way back. Look at this severe. Wave is gone. Gambit not able to set up anything. And now Elements just need to swap it around. Put JWO back on that top lane to catch the big wave with his teleport. Have Nif and Dexter together. Walk into the bot side jungle of Gambit. Set up these wards while you have Froggen already pushing the wave with Obviously, the bot lane already, already being built up. That gives you vision of every lane. Makes it very safe for you to move in and get up the vision. And then you set up a second dragon. And you just play it slow and steady with your elements at this point. No reason to take any risk. Don't have to go for any crazy tower dives. Just play the map. Doing exactly that. Elements now going to donate this blue buff over to Froggen. One more shot. We'll get in the end. Almost an awkward moment. Diamond is invading with the support of the rest of Gambit. So, buff steal. Take a look in the middle, though, because Betsy is in a little bit of trouble. When the hunt comes out, Chain of the, the Crown will start spreading. Dexter's going to find Diamond and moves. So, Elements are in the mid lane. Dexter's forced to tunnel to safety. He finds a second tunnel. Teleport comes in from JWoww onto that tunnel. Equalizer waiting for it. Connects! Death enters into Equalizer. Moops is slowed by the box as well. Ghost is trying to peel them away. Tabs, as well as Froggen, is going to be able to pick up a kill there onto Moops. Now, Gosu, he's been connected. The Death Sentence flashes over the wall, over to the Troll Tunnel. Traded one back. Betsy's got himself a kill. Onto the retreating Dexter, one for one. Gambit get out. Looked very risky for Gambit at first. I quite like the setup. They knew elements were going to take the blue buff. So they invaded and stole a red buff, placed a few wards to try and counter what the play elements were about to make. See if they could create a pick. One, but Betsy just keeps two. taking so much damage. He's no flash. one's dodged. He used it before, by the way. We didn't see it because Froggen just kept landing. His ulti is onto him. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be playing a mini game. Once Froggen starts soloing people one on one with those living artilleries. We will be playing Count But tower secured for elements. So there's that poke and the damage you keep talking about, Tafishio. Force Betsy away, secure the objective, get the numbers advantage for the next one. Elements got the first dragon. Doesn't look like they're gonna start this yet. Uh, just for the crap. Oh, with Cabochard recalling in the bottom lane. This should be yeah, yeah. super easy for elements. 100% safe. Gambit tried to set up a counter play to the grouping around this dragon from elements. They did manage to create, oh, they got one kill for it, traded one for one in the bottom lane tower, so it was something. Still not able to contest the dragon. Elements two to zero on that one, so they can't stop playing towards the fight. And I wanna see Frog get that Leandris now, seeing as he's getting the early Rylai. You just see how annoying it is. Betsy can never charge up his own poke and try and trade it, because he's just taking so many ulties to the face, and once he gets hit by one, you notice the second one, 
He's gonna connect as well with the slow and he's just dancing around all the time. Here's the mid-game group though from Gambit. Diamond's looking for Frog in. Actually, Gambit decided to back away. They saw JWoww coming from the river. Equalizer is out. Goes to start him burned down by that Leandris that he's picked up. Betsy gonna connect with the chain of corruption. That's gonna spread elements up. They picked up a kill onto Frog in, but the captain surprise will do a little more. Now JWoww's forced to run away. Cabashot takes a chunk from Tabs, and that's two members of Elements down at the cost of only Gosu Pepper. Gambit now looking for another tower. Elements chase towards Gosu Pepper, had very few wards. If you look here at the side of the mid lane near the river, there was no ward to spot the flank. Gambit came in with Diamond Brox and Couple Shot. They got to the back line, one shot Froggen. That's Ooh. how Gambit wants to try and reach them every time. Poor warding from Elements, and then you cannot overextend like that. Because the only way you're gonna die is if the flank happens from Gambit. You're gonna have this insane poke machine in Froggen. And with the fact that Gambit secured that mid outer turret and got themselves the kills, the gold is now even. Elements getting a little undone for being a little over eager in that particular team fight. Big, big items have been picked up in the last few minutes. Cabo's got his hands on that Giant's Belt, so most likely going to go towards the Andrews and uh, Rylai's. JWoww, of course, picked himself up. Blasting Wand. Needlessly large for Frog, and so everybody's getting more powerful. <laughs> Betsy with Lost Whisper and Brutalizer. That is a lot of armor penetration, considering there's very limited armor on the side of Elements. Those piercing arrows are going to hurt. Yeah, if he gets to sit with moves and start landing that poke. Problem is, again, Froggen is constantly returning damage, and he's gonna slow you down, and he's probably gonna out-DPS you when it comes to just landing ulti after ulti after ulti with the low cooldown for Froggen, and then the great wave there from Elements. So once again, for Gambit, it's so much about pushing in lanes, and then try and sneak Diamond and Cabo Shot around Elements and get these flanks in here. Get down, Froggen. Again, he mentioned it. There's no hard disengage for Elements. There's no Janet to be like, boo, Cabo Shot, you're gone. No. He's gonna get in there. Is that a Janna sound effect? That is boom. That's <laughs> our sound, man. I'd love to hear that on a monsoon. Boo! Oh, you Knock heard it. everyone away. If we ever, if we ever change Janna... You, you'll be the first one? I will be the one to voice her. To be show, like, boom! I think that is probably the worst idea you've ever had. I think it's a great idea. I can, I can hear chuckles in the audience. Because they know how smart it would be. And they would play Janna because of it. Ooh, I, I like it. Everyone's getting on board with this idea. So, guys, we did see Froggen's back. He's got himself that Seraph's, uh, Archangel's rather. It's 100 mana away from <laughs> Seraph's embrace. Man, why do we have a Janna in this game? Yeah, it's so disappointing. You get everyone hyped up. But in the game, we've seen buffs secured. Elements have got the crab up top. We've seen Gambit pushing out the waves down bottom. And the vision around Baron is being contested. Both Gambit and Elements. Starting that little jiggle and dance. Yeah, if you can push on the towers, you start playing around the objectives in the river <laughs> instead. So, obviously, when you have these procoms as well, you never want to be in a situation where you have to face check in towards the Baron because you just get collapsed on and you die so fast with these squishy targets. Yeah, but you can't face check with poke because you're going to throw That's living true. artilleries and piercing arrows. There's That's a lot true. of tools. So, in my opinion, whenever you see poke, be poke. I find it slow. I remember having a discussion with Shox about two weeks ago. She quite enjoys Poke. I just find it frustrating because it feels like the team that gets out of position by making a mistake then loses to the Poke. Because it's very difficult to <laughs> force an advantage. Yeah, the problem is if you take that one hit to the face and you get Poke down, so you have to suddenly be careful and you like to have to start backing away, you can't really return it. And then it very quickly can snowball in one way. But again, with Froggen being the only Poke but enough on the side of Elements. It's up to him to be the big carry in the late game. He gets even better scaling. Seraph has been changed, buffed a little bit here in terms of the damage, obviously, late game. Tap right now is on a solo mission to split push. And right now, Gambit is not responding before now. Tower secure. With a Gambit recall. Stop to stop the play. They're, they're, only, they're still not recalling, and Elements going to be able to get back. So Kavashot is going to make it to clear the minion wave out while that's ongoing. JWoww is shoving out the bottom lane. And there is some of that poke connecting onto Dexter. And we have this situation where Gambit is like, okay, we wait for teleport so we can set up a potential flank. 
We wait for elements maybe to overextend. Elements are saying, you know what, guys? We got two dragons to zero. We got frog and scaling. We don't really need to do a whole lot. We can just wait for third dragon. We wait for number four. We need to wait for number five. Again, there's no Janna in the game. Righteous Glory picked up by Nef. The engage Ooh, power it. is there. Lock it. Uh, Tia fully stacked for Froggen. How far is Betsy? He is 120 mana away. Stop slacking, Betsy. Come on, we've got a race. Got to auto take the man. Deficio, we've said nothing for the last four minutes because Elements and Gambit are just clearing waves, clearing waves. Dragon is up in a few seconds time. All right, all right. And it's two to zero in favor of elements, but Gambit right. at position. And when nothing happens, you start putting all your anger towards the poor wards. Or Ooh. if you're Frog and you do it against Betsy, because Betsy is always getting hit by the first one, then the second one. But yeah, when you have these uh, situations where nothing really goes on, it's it's a fight for vision. It's not very exciting because you get clear, it's clear wards, then you place your teleport. Ward, and then you wait for teleport Cap against Frog. Slicing Maelstrom, he's gonna connect with Froggen. So does oh. the body slam, but the Lantern! Nif is going huge this game. The box is down, that's gonna slow Gosu. Froggen is still alive. Nif does not connect with the death sentence, but the living artillery does. Tabs has come running in with on the hunt. Wild Dexter secured the dragon. So Elements get the objective. So Elements got the dragon, and because Nif had already moved back to save Froggen, he gets something. Three dragons to zero. Not a Janet, it's a Thresh, but it's fine. It works. <laughs> and now, Gambit is like... They only poked down one guy, so they can't really go for the Baron, and we can just reset the whole map again. Because like, now, Telwar was used, and Dragon was taken, so Elements, once again, have no reason to do anything. And Gambit... Except, except they have teleport advantage. They do. So the, the potential to push and make a play is I, slightly with Elements. I think we've seen enough of Elements this split. You know, they're gonna say, oh, we can go for five Dragons. Okay, that's the safe play. That's what we're aiming for. Let Froggen do all the work, and then wait for another Dragon to respawn. Gambit have to find a way to stop either that Dragon, or create something beforehand, but there's been so little focus on deep warding for both teams. We've just been standing in the river, killing each other's wards, and being like, ha ha, I hit you with poke, I hit you with poke. Oh, and there's more poke. Diamond gets caught by one, body slams away from the second. Diamond also picked up one of those uh, HSs, the Fischio. Mm, smart plan. And we do see the Rylai's completed for Cabo Shard. So, itemization synergy that's going to work fantastically with slicing Maelstrom. We did see an Abyssal Scepter from JWoww, so a slight variation on the Rumble builds that we see, but it makes a lot of sense considering his lane opponent. Still though, Kabuja delaying and also J1 in this case delaying. The Hourglass is quite a lot. Obviously against Poke, you might not need the Axe that much, but for Kabuja, because he will be diving that back line, and there's a lot of damage on the side of Elements, I think he could have delayed the Rylice for the Hourglass and get it after. Obviously for him, he wants a bit more sticking potential in this fight. Let's see if it pays off, or if he just goes in, gets basically one-shotted. Well, I guess against the Siva and the Thresh, that slow will be very powerful. Yeah, but it's all or nothing when you're cannon. You pop your ulti, you try and one-shot a target. But you're isn't not, that you're not aiming to chase toward... Isn't that the definition of Cabochard? Is his playstyle and character not all or nothing? It is. His Hecarim, his Fizz... His hair card. Everything. Next is going to avoid that piercing arrow from Gambit. They now have vision control around Baron. So, Elements now need to face check. They need to use that Living Artillery. Try to figure out where their opponents are. Instead, Elements are going to put some pressure on the mid lane. Gambit did back away. So, when you play Poke and you want to set up Baron, it's not just like a one step process. Not, oh, here's Baron, let's go Baron. No, it's like four or five steps, one, you start pushing out your lanes, especially the mid lane is key, then the top lane. So you have the wave pushing down to the tier two towers and you get the full vision. It makes it harder for him to walk in a face check. Then you clear wards, then you go back and push out waves, then you clear wards again, and you force them to face check. Gambit now has a situation where they have at least cleared all the vision, but you can see our elements are always in the mid lane. So they're putting this pressure of saying, okay, we're just gonna push up mid. And if you don't commit fully to the Baron and like have to just start walking back, we can land some poke and we might get an opening. So we need teams to fully commit. Gambit could have walked into the jungle of Elements. We talked two minutes ago here before this, because Elements cannot face check against a Cannon, against an Alistar, Gragas, whatever, and set up that full deep vision and start playing around it more effectively. 
And that allows you to push waves, because Froggen is the only guy you need to fear. And of course, because Gambit did not get the deep vision, did not fully commit, they are 2,000 gold down. We see Gambit now grouping themselves towards this middle lane. And the poke from Froggen is doing a lot of work. Exceptional wave clear, so... Elements maintain control of the game. Dragon will be up in two minutes, which is just after 30. And that will be the fourth of the match. Gambit, they've not contested previous Dragons. And they simply cannot afford to give up the fourth for free. Only if they take a Baron for it. But even then, it's so risky, because then the number five is going to be so important. So either Gambit has to start giving up the vision on, 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 on the Baron and start moving it down to the bottom side of the map. You have a massive wave pushing as well on the bottom side, so that's an opening for you. Because you want to start setting up at least a minute in advance. If you want to fight again against Poke, you got to have that vision so you know when you can engage onto them. You never want to start the Dragon and then dance around the Dragon and try and dance around the Poke as well for Froggen. And you're like, do, 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 do. oh, I got hit by that one, that one, that one. Now we got to back away. I'm doing some weird dance with the <laughs> I'm not sure why. Well, we'll have to take a look at the vision stats after this game because there's been a lot of wards killed, I feel. We'll only be able to investigate that once we get the advanced post-game statistics. Void Staff was collected for Froggen just a minute ago. And the Mirror Mana was completed for Betsy as well. So this, this arms race is building more and more and more. I'd really prefer the Leandris though first. The damage is insane with the Rhylais. And again, it's about just poking people down and forcing them back to base. That would have been a lot more effective for him. Now, Copper Shot, he has TP again, remember, guys, so he can make a play. 20 seconds before Dragon, he's going to get in, but he's only going to find Nip. The support is now down, but it's Froggen that they need. Diamond, forced to retreat. Living Artillery misses, but it's Tab that's going to get the kill uh, secure. Now they're going to turn their attention to Roast Gosu Pepper. He's down. Elements is going crazy. They found themselves two kills at the cost of one, and they sound like an Ewoks village. Gambit. <laughs> Committed everything to kill poor Nif because Froggen flashed away. That is not the guy you want. You need to be able to get Froggen down. It was only Cabajot going in at first. That means another dragon for Elements. And another few minutes for Gambit before they have another teleport. Never shot. Unfortunate to not find Froggen. He had flash. The angle just wasn't worth it. Here's their replay. Yeah, so basically he goes in, frog and flash, and now in this choke point here, Dexter and Nip were standing in the front for elements, and Gambit is not able to commit to it. Damage way too much, and then you don't get down frog and Gotta go for him, man. Gotta get the Dane. Or he will take the game. That rhyme was insane. Elements have extended their gold lead. They're one dragon away from Aspect. And JWoww is a couple hundred gold away from grabbing Zonya's Hourglass. Going to be very important if a dragon fight is to break out. And we've just gone full ARAM the last like 15 minutes. We've just been stuck in the mid lane, shooting at each other. Silence has been more about just the minions. Goes to Pepper. You're misusing my Man sound. <laughs> Manages to get away. I think we're going to have to repurpose it for a Cogmore Ultimate. Elements do not have control of the Scuttle Crab. But of course, Froggen did get that flash from Gosu Pepper. So slightly less uh, engage or disengage from the big cow. Gambit are just falling further and further behind. It's small losses, very small. But it is still in favor of Elements. Yeah. Need Talisman of Righteous Glory on the side of Gambit to, again, enable engages without teleport from Cabo Shard. You need to find ways to get onto that back line of Elements that they have not done a good enough job. So we can wait for five dragons. I told you, by the way, Elements are happy saying, oh, we <laughs> got, we got a few dragons to zero, let's just wait for another one, and another one. This is the I told you so from Deficio. The strategy man. Well, it works out. The additional true damage for the Living Artillery is plus double the movement speed, plus double the wave clear. I mean, why not? Elements are slightly out of, actually very out of position. Gambit put themselves a gentle love tap, grab the tower, and moves. We'll be able to dodge the pew pew to stay alive. But tower secured. Have a shot. 
He's gonna get caught by Death Sentence Gambit. They're committing for this. They're gonna get another kill onto Nip, but look at the Equalizer splitting Gambit up completely. A defensive explosive cast from Diamond Prox and Gosu will once again be the sacrificial cow. He's gonna go back in for one head, but pulverize. Buy some time for the rest of Gambit. Then seeing Gosu alone. Oh, living broken. artillery. Off the living artillery. Off the living artillery. Cabo Sean forced to flash away. Oh! oh down! Reese nice. gets the kill. The captain surprise will not be in range. One for two. Gambit win the fight. Revenge for Betsy, but there's no objective to take for Gambit. They got the mid tower first. No dragon alive. They're not healthy enough to start the Baron. So we're just gonna return back to another five versus five, and we saw how hard it is to take down Frog and this guy. He's just going crazy. And his range is insane. Gambit is lacking ways of getting to him. TP is soon ready for cover shot. Every time he goes up, he's been TPing in, trying to flank. Not every time. Every time. It's been twice. Three times. Come on. It's May 36 minutes in. You have more, like, if you were to use it every time. Okay, not a level one. Okay. <laughs> The problem for Cabochard, I feel that his positioning's not been fantastic when using it. He it managed may... to catch Froggen, but not kill him once. Yeah. And then the two other times it's been to catch out now. You have to commit your flash with him. Yeah. The problem was he had to use it because he had to survive the poke from Froggen beforehand. So that's going to be heavily in favor of Elements. If you cannot follow him, so you're going to see like Froggen should change to distortion, by the way. In this case, just to have less cooldown because it's all about catching him over and over. Get that reduced, reduced cooldown. Capture could honestly do the same, but ah, uh, no, you want the home card. You want the home card. Set your clocks, ladies and gentlemen. One minute and 45 seconds until dragon number five will be spawning. Elements very clearly want to secure that objective. And Gambit. Good call, Trevor. I don't think they can afford to give it up. <laughs> We've got a lot to work with here, Deficient. <laughs> Four Dragon. However, do they want number five? Let's step sure. back. Let's step back again. Remind everybody because we've not done it yet. Uh, in game. Elements, of course, playing for playoffs. That's that's the, the big picture here. Yeah, if right Elements now. win this game, they will equal the score with Gambit, as well as uh, Giants, as well as Rocket at seven and nine. And there's only two spots left for playoffs. And the key thing to remember. When you look at the standings, one of the teams you just mentioned have to go down to promotion tournament as well. Right now it's Elements sitting in that spot. That's one one you want to get out of. Now Gambit has set up one minute in advance. Very few wards, but at least they got control of one of the bushes. So Elements knows, okay, they're standing here trying to land some poke. TP is ready for cover shot. He needs to go back in base. He's doing it now to have that rig. Is there wards behind? There's one ward here where Nif is warding. Uh, walking, sorry. Froggen. Might be the one he goes for. Froggen and JWoww are there. Home guard is powered up for Cabo One in the lane too, right at Froggen. Not been pulled yet. Cabo Shot's waiting. 25 seconds until Dragon is up. The gold has been evened out. Gambit have done a good job of farming and they got themselves a tower since the last time this fight has happened. Look at those wards. Look at those wards. Cabo could start channeling. First one cleared out, there's only one left. It's gonna disappear in just a few seconds. So he's running out of wards behind Elements. And that is a massive problem. Gambit, and look very at the few, Gambit, very few pink wards as well. So they're not really denying that much vision away from Elements. Engage coming. So Equalizer is down, Betsy's in trouble. Chain of Corruption Frog out. Diamond has flashed in. Dexter's jumped in as well. Cabo Shots gonna get the slicing Maelstrom. Froggen is down. Nip follows as well. That electrical surge is doing work. Cabo Shot will lose his life for this engage. He's still alive. Shot survives! Two members of Elements are down, but they might be too low to get the dragon. Such a big mistake from Elements. You're not the one looking to try and chase Gambit. Froggen was standing in the front instantly. Get punished for it. Gambit get the TP in from the side. This time, Shot didn't even need the flash to hit multiple members. They get the dragon, so all the work Elements put into four dragons so far. The call that was made. 25 minutes ago, boys, five dragons, that's the goal. Don't do anything, five dragons. He's now gone, or at least for Delayed. six minutes. Delayed. Look at this here from Elements. They think because it's in a choke point, they can use the rumble team. It's going to be a great setup. But look at Froggen in the front. Gambit, they know he's the guy. He's the main damage dealer. And then the TP coming from Kappa Shot. You don't need a flash now. Three guys, four guys, even if you count in taps. And Gambit wins the fight. They get the perfect opening. 
stop the dragons. Now they gotta go back to baiting around this Baron here, but they need deep vision. They need to sell for... Uh, sell your potions. We're 38 minutes in. What is 150 HP hey, going to do? That potion saved Cabochard's life, I think. I think it was the heal for... It was from, from <laughs> Let's Let's agree on that. I bet you didn't even have a potion. I'm gonna go Did back you? and check. Oh. Yeah, he had a ward. Good guy, Damn Cabochard. It. Damn it. Point is, you need pink wards. Because <laughs> you need elements to face check. And if you're just trading vision, you're never gonna get them to face check because they can see you starting that Baron. Four sweepers though on the side of Gambit. Fish here. That first dragon secured for Gambit. So vital because now it's actually worth something. 6% and 40 minutes into the game. Gonna help them out. Ghost has also picked up a banner of command. This could help because Gambit's side lanes have actually been pretty good. Whenever these objectives begin to be contested, there's almost always Gambit minions pushing towards Elements base. And one of those banner-empowered siege minions could do a lot of work. So you just push down the mid lane, you have taps as well in the, in the, in the top wave, the top lane taking that, and you just start the Baron instantly, but elements are nearby, they're just gonna walk in. That's a flash forward, Cabo Shot's found three, explosive cask is gonna split elements up. Dexter's gonna be the first victim here, no he's not, he's tunneled away. Betsy a little to late poke. to the party, and the poke of living artillery is coming out. Diamond will be going down, it's Tabs that kills Diamond Prox, and all of a sudden, Gambit are now in trouble. Oh! Living Artillery, oh, Living Artillery. Wow well gets the kill. Deficio, I think you're wrong. The crowd has spoken, and the pew pew sound effect is for a Living Artillery. If you think Fine. that's definitely the case, tweet at LLE Sports at home. And there we go, Living Artillery. Following suit, Betsy forced away. Baron will be secured by Elements. After Gambit started the play, started the fight, but lose the objective. But that's the thing. Elements had full vision around it. So walking in, they could see Gambit started. They saw the engage coming in, managed to disengage away at first, and then start landing the poke on Froggen. And just a very simple response. Look at the amount of blue wards around. It doesn't look like it was just Gambit setting up for the Baron, if you consider the fact that there is, what, 10 wards on the side of Elements already. A lot of vision allows them to turn around the plate and then get the objective. So now, again, elements are in the lead. Frogan, why do you hate Leandris? <laughs> it's such a good item. Why do you hate it? You'll have to ask him in the post game. If we manage to get that chance for elements with their 4,000 gold lead. They're playing aggressive on the side of the map with no vision. Next is going in. He's going to smite that away from Diamond. And Lantern out to safety from Nif. So Elements now putting their attention onto the bottom half of the map where there is an inner turret to take down. And you start setting up with that dragon coming in two or three minutes. Worst case, if you are Elements, but you now have the ability to start sieging. It becomes a lot more difficult for these poke compositions to clear the waves when you got the Baron buff. And obviously, if Gambit is stuck under that tower trying to clear waves, it's a lot easier for Froggen to keep landing his damage. So Elements finally have a chance to really Siege. As long as they have the wards on the flanks and they know where the wards are behind them so they can see if Kabushad is TPing in because his TP is ready in just a few seconds. No, we talked about that TP like 10 times, but it really has been it's game changing the for opening Gambit. for Gambit, the only opening. The scary thing is, one strong teleport from Kabushad can once again turn this game around. Elements on the hunt is down, they want the tower. Yeah, tower. Teleports coming out from Cabochard behind. Tower's not secured yet. Diamond forced to defend. Chain of Corruption doesn't connect, but Cabochard finds Froggen. The Pew Machine is down. Nif is going to escape, and Gambit defend their base. Well, we talked about the teleport. We talked about the cannon, what he can do with the flanks. Elements didn't manage to see what was behind them in terms of the wards. Might just get a death cab as well now for Cabo Shot. Honestly, he's probably realizing he's doing his job just by going in and trying to blow up one target. So he doesn't want the hourglass very clear. He just want to try and stack as much AP as possible for himself. It's been working okay. Six and one. It is the Cabo Shot show in many ways, but... It normally is with Gambit. He needs the rest of the team, though, to help. JWoww might be caught out. He has he been, but out. he may be able to turn the tide. Starts to overheat. Gonna flash into Gosu Pepper, who gets the pulverize and the headbutt. 
Jaywa is trying to make the best of a bad situation and look for moops. I do not believe he will find him. Goes golden, moop walks into the flame spitter. This Kaba shot has arrived, secures the kill with the electrical surge. So Jaywa is down for over a minute. Froggen has only just respawned from the previous team fight. Gambit have a little bit of time, may be able to get the dragon if they rush it. They might have to just dive onto Froggen. He has an insane amount of wave play. It's only two guys from Element on the bottom side. Also need to respect the fact that Taps is pushing top lane, so they gotta react fast. Either you go all in for this tower and try and get the two kills, or you just recall and you send at least one guy back to stop this one, and then you take the dragon instead. So that seems to be the option. It is number two, Gafishio. Kabashot is up top. He has to deal with Dexter in the middle lane. He has to deal with Tabs in the top lane. The rest of Gambit are on the dragon. Dexter secured a tower already. Dragon number two picked up for Gambit. Kabashot's defended top, uh, at least for a moment. May need to use that slicing Maelstrom. If anything further, look, here comes Gosu as well. Have elements stuck around. Tabs still has on the hunt. It looks like Dexter's gonna find the support of the rest of Elements. Gosu is way out of dodge, despite the fact that he's found Dexter forced to use Unbreakable Will. He will be able to make it out. So, cooldown blown, two exposed inhibitors. And just such a problem for Gambit that they have to trade a Dragon for some of the inner turrets because, again, they know Elements can get number five. So once they got the first kill on Jaywow, he basically took such a long time dying and Force moves really low. Gambit should honestly just have instantly said, okay, we just take that dragon and go back to base. They started trying to push, realized they couldn't against Froggen, and then they were stuck in this bad situation where there was no real great call to make. And in the end, two towers for elements. But once again, you stop the five dragons. I get the ban up command from Ghost of Pepper to stop some of the wave clear. However, I feel like Righteous Glory is still the best item for you to get at this point, or the Talisman, because if you cannot get the right team fight and get onto the back line of elements, you're never really gonna get to use that ban of command. Every time Gambit tries to group and poke, Froggen returns, returns twice the damage back to the carries of Gambit, and they have to just back away and wait for team fight. So build for that. Don't build for the push just, right now. Uh, very quickly, Froggen has just finished his death cap. Currently sitting on 767 ability power. Each living artillery is hitting for around 400 damage. And a 0.8 second cooldown. Could have been more with That's, Leandris. Could have been more with Leandris. Maybe it's his final item, Deficio. Elements have grouped up in this middle lane. Again, there's no tower. It was secured and Betsy's being focused. One, two. Third one gets dodged. Betsy always dodges the third one. Yeah, Froggen has enough damage now. He needs just one defensive item because he's the target every time. Nobody's helping. Ghost of Pepper is behind. Kabushat stands around the front, though. No time. Oh! The flash for flash! Gosu doesn't get the pulverize. The Where's ignite is Betsy? now burning. Betsy did not fire Chain of Corruption. Gosu, insta-unbreakable will. Just react instant. Just flash ult him and get him with the Q and he would die. Did not do that and it means Froggen gets away. Dexter. And Elements will secure the blue buff that was picked up by Froggen. Baron is up in 35 seconds. Inhibitors still standing. And the poke war continues. <laughs> Man, Betsy could have pulled the trigger there. Froggen has used everything. He was caught out of position. Baron is respawning, guys. No team has been able to really set up proper vision around it and then get a perfect Baron. Taking down something we heard in the feature earlier today. Teams were talking about how you need to deny all division first and then you can start taking the Baron. Never risk the 50-50 smite. Sufficio. Tell me, Drew. Being chunked down. Again. See? Third one misses. Fourth one misses. Fifth one misses. Gold Sixth plate. one misses. I love this crowd. You guys are awesome. <laughs> Elements. Trying to keep their playoff hopes alive. Take a look down the bottom. Frog, it's gone! Cabochot teleported in, we didn't even see it. Observers were looking for the pew pew. And it's Frog and that's down. Gambit's uh, hey. banner empowered minions have taken a yeah. tower. And Baron is up. And Frog is down for a minute. Okay, so that's why it's very smart for Ghost of Paper. Because Elements have been stuck as a team for the last 40 minutes. Ban of Command is going to start their split push on its own. And it's gunned them a tower, forcing Jiro to take it. But the important thing is. Froggen had no summoners, he used them in that last fight where he was caught out. And of course the teleport guys, I mean, come on, yeah, for teleport shots. 
after that. Boom. Kill. One shot him. Boom. Froggen goes down. Gambit get a tower. That is their fifth of the game. And their first Baron. The timer has started for the next dragon. Deficio, the game that's had the most dragons in summer has been seven. The next one will be the seventh. We might be equaling that record. Close to at least. Unless Gamma decides we want to finish right now. Uh, Frogan's still there for 15 seconds. Now you can use your amazing poke because Frogan is not there. This tower should be very easy to take down. Especially oh. with that banner empowered. Value. Banner minion. But man, Frogan, the fact he has no defensive item at this point means that every time he gets locked down from by, by Kabuto, he just gets one shot complete. There's no outlaws or anything to help him. And the fact he has a death cap, which is just so unnecessary. And let's also remind everybody, Gambit are playing with a substitute. Gambit now have Baron. They have super minions to play with in the middle lane. And they are keeping themselves in a great position. We said Gambit play around Cabochard. It is about Cabochard. Cabochard, 8, 1, and 1 with 370 CS and has found Froggen. When he's found Froggen, Gambit's hopes have been rebuffed. Also just with Elements as a team, again and again and again, it's been a talking point all split long, are just not great at being the proactive team. They're so weak when it comes to pushing your advantage. And even with Gambit, giving them four dragons, not setting up the Baron, giving, giving a Baron as well over to Elements. It's not been enough because every time Elements push up, they don't respect the potential flank coming, and that just bites them in the behind. And now Dexter... Gonna get knocked backwards. Chain of Corruption will give Betsy the kill. Gambit, they say, screw the dragon. We can get more. Move their ways down to the bottom. They've got to deal with that poke from Froggen. There we go. Living Artillery's connecting. They're in sync now, actually. Gambit will get their seventh tower of the game. 50 minutes has gone by. Death sentence on Diamond, but that's not the target you're looking for. Gambit have super minions in two lanes. And the longest, oh, it would be Elements. The longest game of the split was 55 minutes, and it was SK versus Elements. We're four and a half minutes away from their record. Elements won that game, by the way. Late game call, 55 minutes in. Got the Baron, won the team fight because Freddy TP'd in with the Shen. Didn't finish off the Nexus, if people remember that game. That should not be the case, though, for Gambit, as we have seen every time we have that 5 and 5 team fight with the proper TP and engage, they are winning it. Even though there's only one or two kills at a time, I don't think we've seen multiple people dying on the side of Elements in these fights. Maybe I'm completely wrong. It's been. I think we've seen two. It's been at like most. 51 minute yes. long game. We've seen two at most. I can't remember a fight where. Nif plus Froggen or Nif plus Dex that went down. But Gambit's Baron buff has now timed out. Got the Righteous Glory as well for Ghost of Pepper now. So I wanted that a little while ago, but better late than never. And I believe Death Care... No, Voidstar picked up yeah. for Cabo Shard. So no Hourglass up top. No Leandries in the mid for Froggen. No Hourglass Gambit either doing, for Froggen. Gambit doing the right thing. Sieging top lane. Letting the Supers do the work elsewhere. So... How good can Froggen wave clear? Or how good is Froggen's wave clear? That would be the correct answer. He just has to be so careful because Gambit can try and just instantly dive him. You have to... <laughs> Somebody ask Crepo. Somebody ask Crepo what this guy's name is. But Gambit can secure their eighth tower of the game. Almost uncontested. Froggen, your poke is good, but it is not that good. Uh, uh, take that back. <laughs> Instantly clears the wave with the Voidus. Still, he's taking a bit of damage every time, and someone has to go back and clear the super minion soon. Jero's in the middle, and Gambit, continue the siege. You have lifesteal. Even it out between moves and Betsy, they're doing it right here. Notice how nobody else is hitting the minions. It's high level strategy. Gets to lifesteal. And you go back. Super minions is down in the bottom here at the next turret. Wait for someone to move down and take it, and then maybe you can just look for a dive. Or are we gonna wait for another Baron? Super minions uh, pushing yeah, into the this. base. Baron, banner empowered minion, gonna help secure the Nexus turret. Elements have peeled away, actually gonna leave their own minions to push back. Elements still trying to defend. And it's just this poke be poke. It doesn't look like anybody wants to tower dive, Deficio. Although, Diamond is in the base. Playing it safe for now, because you got the super minions anyway. 
start a gambit. Still behind in goal. Been probably in entire game long, honestly. Yeah, evened it up a little bit, but every time they do, Elements seem to make a play that gets them ahead. It's going to be much more difficult now. Look, Cabochard's pushing the wave. Diamond's pushing the wave. The rest of Gambit sieging top. Just waiting for that one opening. Problem is, Elements are not going to move away from this tower. And now, GY is still positioned down here, frogging with the wave clear. Taps with the wave clear. We might just wait for this Baron here. Gambit will go back and Big. set up, hopefully, vision around it and just take that team fight where Elements is walking blindly in. Big to note that Nif did use that uh, banner of command. Uh, righteous Glory. Minutes and a half before it'll be available again. 513, remember. Some of the changes reverted. Inhibitors spawned middle. Bottom inhibitor will be spawning soon. Living artilleries are connecting. Forces a flash from Betsy. Okay. Baron's up in a minute, as is the longest game of the summer split record. We're gonna break it. Let's see if his life's going back again. Froggen still no distortion for himself. We talked about it earlier, how important it can be because of these summoners here, because he is the target every single time. So he's just going all in offensive. And because Betsy got poked down, Gambit is saying, you know what, we're not going to risk it. And Dexter is instantly, okay, set up a few, set up a bit of vision. Might be caught out though. Dexter's in a little bit of trouble. Actually, Dexter's in a whole lot of trouble. He's gonna try to get away from the explosive cast. Moves, flashes, uh, Belk's in aggressively. Cabochard will find him. It's gonna be a minute long death timer. Gambit now have a man advantage, and they should be able to secure a Baron unless it gets stolen away. Well, you still got super minutes coming in the bottom lane. The jungler is dead. Nothing is gonna stop you from taking this Baron. And then the wave different frog and suddenly isn't that effective. And that's what you need, 55 minutes. New record, longest game of the summer split. As Gambit will secure the third Baron of the game. If we are lucky enough to see one more dragon, it will also be the most dragons of any game in the summer split. We can only hope. Breaking records today, man. I'm gonna go back to a little thing I mentioned earlier about how a few weeks ago, Shox and I talked about Poke. This is why I find Poke interesting. <laughs> because properly played Poke is not the most exciting. Well, it's not hard engage. It's not. But at the same time, properly played Poke can push that advantage you get in the mid game very often and snowball it. And we don't go 55 minutes. Even though it's Poke was Poke, I get what you're saying. Gambit are so close to reclaiming the gold lead. It'll be a long time since they've had that. Inhibitor secured in the middle lane. It's been long enough that Dexter has respawned. The problem for Elements, waves seem to be pushing away from them. Uh, the Gambit, rather, in the top and bottom lane. So Gambit will be happy to get Baron, plus an Inhibitor, and they want the record. They are going for Dragon number eight. Get it, moves the substitute alone. Even building more of Mamortius here, you know? You got, wasn't it a Corky that also built more of Mamortius last time we saw it? We'll Can have you? to verify that. No, we saw the split, I think. We did. We'll double I mean, check that in a minute. Against heavy AP Pope. 80 minutes, the dream. As dragon number eight is secured. The next one is Aspect. Elements get four dragons on the bounce. Only for Gambit to say, no, 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 no. We can play that game too. And they secure four of their own. Again, Elements made that call an hour ago. We're gonna go five dragons. When they lost number five, they're like, okay, what's next? And nobody really seemed to have a plan there from Elements. And Gambit been able to get all the dragons, been able to win some of the fights. Deficio, now, high five. Look at... It was Audrey that built more Mamortius on Corky. Uh, Knew I'd seen it somewhere. Go super for something. Teleport! Cabochon's found tabs in JWoww. Electrical surge is up. Cabochon also bought an hourglass. Diamond, you threw the explosive cask too early. Betsy's found a kill on Froggen before Nip takes him down. That's a double kill for Nip. Death sentence is sprung wide. Moops, you are going to get called into question now. Three versus four, but the poke machines are down. Elements are looking for an inhibitor, but will they go for more? They didn't get Froggen this time around. It was taps. 
The cover shot managed to deal all his damage to and that is not the guy he wanted to take down early. Froggen did die in the very end, but Elmas dealt enough damage. They're backing away though, you, you have four members right here versus three. I guess you have no minions, but look at this big wave coming. Just grab that wave. The fish here. And get back in towards that Nexus. You're four guys versus three. 80 minutes, the dream. Dexter, jungler on jungler. He manages to smite Diamond and then run away. Gonna grab that minion wave up top. Four versus three for another 20 seconds. Elements decide to just escort the minion line into the base and then say, sorry, buddies, your problem now. Elements will not win this game before they get dragon number five. That is the goal for Elements. They give you hey, four dragons, the they give you false hope. They're like, that's our dragon, get number five. Bottom lane though, ban off command minion. <laughs> They'll do it work for Ghost Baby. I gotta give him credit for that no, one. He's been buddy, setting no. up some Actually, good spy pushes. Is it possible to see how much gold that thing is in? Oh, that would have been so cool. I wonder how much gold he's earned from those minions. Probably a lot. I'm gonna say so. Well, you got a talisman now as well. So. Of both the items you wanted. 60 minutes the dream, eight dragons, three barons, countless inhibitors. How are we one hour into the game and a 450 mid laner still doesn't have six items? That doesn't add up in my book. Are you calling Froggen out? No, no, no. I'm just saying that seems weird. I didn't see if he sold any items or anything. I mean, obviously he has the same four core items as before. He's been earning 19,000 gold so far. He must be very, very close then to getting that hourglass in the end. Just if you consider we've been here for an hour, so much farm. Two kills, eight assists, seven towers. Everyone else, if you look at the carries, at least they've been maxing out. So I'm not sure if I missed something here. This game will live on forever as Cogmore's ultimate has a new sound effect. It has been made so, Diamond and Gosu waiting in the bush, waiting to find a target. Dragon's not up yet, no one's gonna win. Oh, I've been proven wrong. Elements, they're moving through the lane. Diamond, looking, waiting for an opportunity. Not gonna find it. Deficio Cabochard's teleport is about a third of the way off cooldown. Will Diamond cancel his recall? No, it doesn't look like it. Super Minion's pushing. Super Minion's getting very close to the top half of the base. So Gambit cannot afford to be outside of the base. And it's Kabashar that's been appointed to deal with it. They still also can't afford to just sit in the base because if Elements can walk up and see all five members in front of them, the Frank, the Frank, the flank potential, no Frank here, the flank potential is then not there for Gambit and then need it. Froggen though is still a squishy target. No Hourglass yet for him. He's gonna be the... <laughs> no Hourglass, 61 minutes in. Elements are pushing the bottom lane. We're gonna have that big five on five team fight, but first. But first? Have you heard about Baron? I do. What's what is the word of Baron? The word of Baron is we need how many of this game? This will be the fourth. Four? No, this will be the fourth. Four. Okay, and someone needs to get five dragon as well, by the way. We're not stopping before someone has five dragon. So That's the, how it is. The best thing that would happen would be a team to get five dragons and baron, then like, lose the game on a bad team fight. Again, this is like back, you know, in school when you were young. And if a long were, time for me. It, I'm sure, fair enough. <laughs> if you know, if there were unfair teams, you know, it was, it was in one team's advantage, they got a great start, but then you had to even it out because all the kids had to be happy. So with the four dragons first for elements, they uh -oh. said, you know what? Gamma gets four as well, uh -oh. but now it gets serious. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Shoot the rocket in, shoot uh -oh. the rocket in. Uh-oh. That's it, it's connect. Diamonds down! Diamonds down! Elements! They are patient enough to find the kill. Cabochon is looking for an engage. Where is he? Teleport's not available. Gosu Pepper's being roasted and he gets burned alive. Elements have a five versus three, but they have all of the damage from Gambit to deal with. Well, how is that damage gonna take down Elements? They got the wave pushing in, they got super minions. Cabochon. What can you do now? It's the final countdown, Deficio. Elements are onto another inhibitor. Gambit's engage tools 
from Gosu and from Diamond are not there, but Cabochon, he's got a flash and a slicing maelstrom. He's going to throw down the hourglass, as does Jaywell. Cabochon will go down. It's Niff that gets the kill. 4 3 and 7. Betsy is alone. Betsy has to defend. And Nexus Turret is down. And at 63 minutes, Elements are taking down the Nexus Turret. Elements are taking down the Nexus. And Elements are keeping their playoff dreams alive, but napping. Nobody got five dragons. We waved so long and nobody got five dragons. Elements very happy with the win. I sincerely hope PTL does a mic check on those sound effects, guys, because these guys are going to have no idea what you were doing. For 45 minutes, they thought a bunch of Ewoks invaded the studio. <laughs> and you could see the, the distraught faces on Gambit. Gambit and Elements now share the same score. Seven wins, nine losses. Seven and ten, sorry. Seven and ten. Seven and ten, of course. Elements. Playing SK tomorrow, Gambit facing H2K. We lost today to uh, to Origin, but I mean, almost what what a simple game almost. We were waiting for the same thing every time. Oh, it's Dragon spawning. Okay, now we can get a fight. Oh, it's TP ready for Copper Child. Okay, now we can get a fight. Over and over and over. And in the end, the trap from Elements. The trap card.